Section Zero of The Fortune of the Rougeon, Book One of Rougeon Macas Cycle by Emile Zola, translated by Henri Visitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Mark Leader. Section Zero Introduction. The Fortune of the Rougeon is the initial volume of the rougeon Macca series. Though it was by no means M. Zola's first essay in fiction, it was undoubtedly his first great bid for genuine literary fame, and the foundation of what must necessarily be regarded as his life work. The idea of writing the natural and social history of a family under the Second Empire extending to a score of volumes, was doubtless suggested to M. Zola by Balzac's immortal Comédie Humaine. He was twenty-eight years of age when this idea first occurred to him. He was fifty-three when he at last sent the manuscript of his concluding volume, Dr. Pascal, to the press. He had spent five and twenty years in working out his scheme, persevering with it doggedly and stubbornly, whatever rebuffs he might encounter, whatever jeers and whatever insults might be directed against him by the ignorant, the prejudiced, and the hypocritical. Truth was on the march and nothing could stay it, even as, at the present hour, its march, if slow, nonetheless continues athwart another and a different crisis of the illustrious novelist's career. It was in the early summer of 1869 that Monsieur Zola first began the actual writing of The Fortune of the Rougeon. It was only in the following year, however, that the serial publication of the work commenced in the columns of Le Siècle, the Republican journal of most influence in Paris in those days of the Second Empire. The Franco-German War interrupted this issue of the story, and publication in book form did not take place until the latter half of 1871, a time when both the war and the Commune had left Paris exhausted, supine, with little or no interest in anything. No more unfavorable moment for the issue of an ambitious work of fiction could have been found. Some two or three years went by, as I well remember, before anything like a revival of literature and of public interest in literature took place. Thus M. Zola launched his gigantic scheme under auspices which would have made many another man recoil. The Fortune of the Rougeon and two or three subsequent volumes of his series attracted but a moderate degree of attention, and it was only on the morrow of the publication of La Samoire that he awoke like Byron to find himself famous. As previously mentioned, the rougeon macquart series forms 20 volumes. The last of these, Dr. Pascal, appeared in 1893. Since then, M. Zola has written Lourdes, Rome, and Paris. Critics have repeated ad nauseum that these last works constitute a new departure on M. Zola's part, and so far as they formed a new series... This is true, but the suggestion that he has in any way repented of the Rougeon Macquart novels is ridiculous. As he has often told me of recent years, it is, as far as possible, his plan to subordinate his style and methods to his subject. To have written a book like Rome, so largely devoted to the ambitions of the Papal See, in the same way as he had written books dealing with the drunkenness or other vices of Paris, would have been the climax of absurdity. Yet, the publication of Rome was the signal for a general outcry on the part of English and American reviewers that Zolaism, as typified by the rougeon macquart series, was altogether a thing of the past. To my thinking, this is a profound error. M. Zola has always remained faithful to himself. The only difference that I perceive between his latest work Paris, and certain rougeon macquart volumes, is that with time, experience, and assiduity, his genius has expanded and ripened, and that the hesitation, the groping for truth, so to say, which may be found in some of his earlier writings, has disappeared. At the time when The Fortune of the Rougeon was first published, 
None but the author himself can have imagined that the foundation stone of one of the great literary monuments of the century had just been laid. From the story point of view, the book is one of M. Zola's very best, although its construction, particularly as regards the long interlude of the idyll of Miette and Silver, is far from being perfect. Such a work, when first issued, might well bring its author a measure of popularity, but it could hardly confer fame. Nowadays, however, looking backward and bearing in mind that one here has the genius of Monsieur Zola's life work, the fortune of the Rougeon becomes a book of exceptional interest and importance. This has been so well understood by French readers that during the last six or seven years, the annual sales of the work have increased threefold. Where, over a course of 20 years, 1,000 copies were sold, 2,500 and 3,000 are sold today. How many living English novelists can say the same of their early essays in fiction, issued more than a quarter of a century ago? I may here mention that at the last date to which I have authentic figures, that is, midsummer 1897, prior, of course, to what is called l'affaire Dreyfus, there had been sold of the entire Rougeon Macquart series, which had begun in 1871, 1,421,000 copies. These were of the ordinary Charpentier editions of the French originals. By adding thereto several editions de luxe and the widely circulated popular illustrated editions of certain volumes, the total amounts roundly to 21 million, Rome, Lourdes, Paris, and all Monsieur Zola's other works, apart from the Rougeau Macquart series, together with the translations into a dozen different languages, English, German, Italian, Spanish, Dutch, Danish, Portuguese, Bohemian, Hungarian, and others, are not included in the above figures. Otherwise, the latter might well be doubled. Nor is account taken of the many serial issues which have brought M. Zola's views to the knowledge of the masses of all Europe. It is, of course, the celebrity attaching to certain of M. Zola's literary efforts that has stimulated the demand for his other writings. Among those which are well worthy of being read for their own sakes, I would assign a prominent place to the present volume. Much of the story element in it is admirable, and further it shows M. Zola as a genuine satirist and humorist. The Rougeon yellow drawing room and its habitués, and many of the scenes between Pierre Rougeon and his wife Félicité, are worthy of the pen of Douglas Gerald. The whole account indeed of the town of Plassans, its customs and its notabilities, is satire of the most effective kind because it is satire true to life, and never degenerates into mere caricature. It is rather curious coincidence that, at the time when M. Zola was thus portraying the life of Provence, his great contemporary, bosom friend, and rival for literary fame, the late Alphonse Daudet, should have been producing under the title of the Provençal Don Quixote, that unrivaled presentment of the foibles of the French southerner with everyone nowadays knows as Tatarin of Tarascon. It is possible that Monsieur Zola, while writing his book, may have read the installments of Le Don Quichotte Provençal, published in the Paris Figaro, and it may be that this perusal imparted that Philip to his pen to which we owe the many amusing particulars that he gives us of the town of Plassans. Plassans, I may mention, is really the Provençal Aïe, which M. Zola's father provided with water by means of a canal still bearing his name. M. Zola himself, though born in Paris, spent the greater part of his childhood there. Tarascon, as is well known, never forgave Alphonse Daudet for his Tartarin, and in a like way M. Zola, who doubtless counts more enemies than any other literary man of the period, has none bitterer than the worthy citizens of Aïe. They cannot forget or forgive the rascally Rougeon Macquart. The name Rougeon Macquart has to me always suggested that splendid and amusing type of the cynical rogue, Robert Macquart. But of course, both Rougeon and Macquart 
are genuine French names and not inventions. Indeed, several years ago I came by chance upon them both in an old French deed which I was examining at the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. I there found mention of a Rougeon family and a Macaw family dwelling virtually side by side in the same village. This, however, was in Champagne, not in Provence. Both families farmed vineyards for a once famous abbey in the vicinity of Epernay, early in the 17th century. To me, personally, this trivial discovery meant a great deal. It somehow aroused my interest in Monsieur Zola and his works. Of the latter, I had then only glanced through two or three volumes. With Monsieur Zola himself, I was absolutely unacquainted. However, I took the liberty to inform him of my little discovery, and afterwards I read all the books that he had published. Now, as it is fairly well known, I have given the greater part of my time for several years past to the task of familiarizing English readers with his writings. An old deed, a chance glance, followed by the great friendship of my life and years of patient labor. If I mention this matter, it is solely with the object of endorsing the truth of a saying that the most insignificant incidents frequently influence and even shape our careers. But I must come back to the fortune of the Rougeon. It has, as I have said, its satirical and humorous side, but it also contains a strong element of pathos. The idyll of Miette and Silver is a very touching one and quite in accord with the conditions of life prevailing in Provence at the period Monsieur Zola selects for his narrative. Miette is a frank child of nature. Silver, her lover, in certain respects foreshadows a quarter of a century in advance the Abbé Pierre Fromont of Lourdes, Rome, and Paris. The environment differs, of course but germs of the same nature may readily be detected in both characters. As for the other personages of Monsieur Zola's book, on the one hand, Aunt Didi, Pierre Rougeon, his wife Félicité, and their sons Eugène, Aristide, and Pascal, and on the other, Macaw, his daughter Gervaise of La Samoire, and his son Jean of La Terre and La Débâcle, together with the members of the Mouret branch of the ravenous neurotic duplex family. These are analyzed or sketched in a way which renders their subsequent careers, as related in other volumes of the series, thoroughly consistent with their origin and their upbringing. I venture to assert that although it is possible to read individual volumes of the rougeon macquart series while neglecting others, Nobody can really understand any one of these books unless he makes himself acquainted with the Alpha and the Omega of the edifice, that is, the fortune of the Rougeon and Dr. Pascal. With regard to the present English translation, it is based on one made for my father several years ago. But to convey M. Zola's meaning more accurately, I have found it necessary to alter on an average at least one sentence out of every three. Thus, though I only claim to edit the volume, it is to all intents and purposes quite a new English version of Monsieur Zola's work. E. A. V. Merton, Surrey, August 1898. This ends section zero. Section 1 of The Fortune of the Rougeon, Book 1 of Rougeon Maca Cycle, by Emile Zola, translated by Henry Bizzitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Mark Leder. Section 1 Author's Preface. I wish to explain how a family, a small group of human beings, conducts itself in a given social system after blossoming forth and giving birth to ten or twenty members, who, though they may appear at the first glance profoundly dissimilar one from the other, are, as analysts demonstrate, most closely linked together from the point of view of affinity. Heredity, like gravity, has its laws. 
By resolving the duplex question of temperament and environment, I shall endeavor to discover and follow the thread of connection which leads mathematically from one man to another. And when I have possession of every thread and hold a complete social group in my hands, I shall show this group at work, participating in an historical period. I shall depict it in action, with all its varied energies, and I shall analyze both the will power of each member and the general tendency of the whole. The great characteristic of the Rougeon Maca, the group or family which I propose to study, is their ravenous appetite, the great outburst of our age which rushes upon enjoyment. Physiologically, the Rougeau Maca represent the slow succession of accidents pertaining to the nerves or the blood, which befall a race after the first organic lesion, and according to environment, determine in each individual member of the race those feelings, desires, and passions. Briefly, all the natural and instinctive manifestations peculiar to humanity, whose outcome assumes the conventional name of virtue or vice. Historically, the Rougeau Macar proceed from the masses, radiate throughout the whole of contemporary society, and ascend to all sorts of positions by the force of that impulsion of essentially modern origin, which sets the lower classes marching through the social system. And thus, the dramas of their individual lives recount the story of the Second Empire, from the ambuscade of the coup d'etat to the treachery of Sedan. For three years, I had been collecting the necessary documents for this long work, and the present volume was even written when the fall of the Bonaparte, which I needed artistically, and with, as if by fate, I ever found at the end of a drama, without daring to hope that it would prove so near at hand, suddenly occurred and furnished me with a terrible but necessary denouement for my work. My scheme is at this date completed. The circle in which my characters will revolve is perfected, and my work becomes a picture of a departed reign, of a strange period of human madness and shame. This work, which will comprise several episodes, is therefore, in my mind, the natural and social history of a family under the Second Empire. And the first episode, here called The Fortune of the Rougeon, should scientifically be entitled The Origin. Emile Zola, Paris, July 1, 1871. This ends Section 1. Section 2 of The Fortune of the Rougeon, Book 1 of Rougeon Maca Cycle, by Emile Zola, translated by Henry Bizzitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Mark Leader. Section 2, Chapter 1, Part 1 On quitting Plasson by the Rome Gate, on the southern side of the town, you will find on the right side of the road to Nice, and a little way past the first suburban houses, a plot of land locally known as the Air Saint-Mitre. This Air Saint-Mitre is of oblong shape and on a level with the footpath of the adjacent road, from which it is separated by a strip of trodden grass. A narrow, blind alley fringed with a row of hovels borders it on the right, while on the left and at the further end it is closed in by bits of wall overgrown with moss, above which can be seen the top branches of the mulberry trees of the Jasme Frein, an extensive property with an entrance lower down the road. Enclosed upon three sides, the Air Saint-Mitre leads nowhere and is only crossed by people out for a stroll. In former times, it was a cemetery under the patronage of Saint-Mitre, a greatly honored Provençal saint. And in 1851, the old people of Plassans could still remember having seen the wall of the cemetery standing although the place itself had been closed for years. The soil had been so glutted with corpses that it had been found necessary to open a new burial ground at the other end of town. 
Then the old abandoned cemetery had been gradually purified by the dark, thick-set vegetation which had sprouted over it every spring. The rich soil, in which the gravediggers could no longer delve without turning up some human remains, was possessed of wondrous fertility. The tall weeds overtopped the walls after the May rains and the June sunshine, so as to be visible from the high road, while inside the place presented the appearance of a deep, dark green sea studded with large blossoms of singular brilliancy. Beneath one's feet, amidst the close-set stalks, one could feel that the damp soil reeked and bubbled with sap. Among the curiosities of the place at that time were some large pear trees, with twisted and knotty boughs, but none of the housewives of Plassans cared to pluck the large fruit which grew upon them. Indeed, the townspeople spoke of this fruit with grimaces of disgust. No such delicacy, however, restrained the suburban urchins who assembled in bands at twilight and climbed the walls to steal the pears, even before they were ripe. The trees and the weeds with their vigorous growth had rapidly assimilated all but decomposing matter in the old cemetery of saint mitre The malaria rising from the human remains interred there had been greedily absorbed by the flowers and the fruit, so that eventually the only odor one could detect in passing by was the strong perfume of wild gillyflowers. flowers This had merely been a question of a few summers. At last, the townspeople determined to utilize this common property, which had long served no purpose. The walls bordering the roadway and the blind alley were pulled down, the weeds and the pear trees uprooted, the sepulchral remains were removed, the ground was dug deep and such bones as the earth was willing to surrender were heaped up in a corner. For nearly a month, the youngsters, who lamented the loss of the pear trees, played at bowls with the skulls, and one night some practical jokers even suspended femurs and tibias to all the bell handles of the town. This scandal, which is still remembered at Plassans, did not cease until the authorities decided to have the bones shot into a hole which had been dug for the purpose in the new cemetery. Wall work, however, is usually carried out with discreet dilatoriness in country towns. And so, during an entire week, the inhabitants saw a solitary cart removing these human remains as if they'd been mere rubbish. The vehicle had to cross Plasson from end to end, and owing to the bad condition of the roads, fragments of bones and handfuls of rich mold were scattered at every jolt. There was not the briefest religious ceremony, nothing but slow and brutish cartage. Never before had a town felt so disgusted. For several years, the old cemetery remained an object of terror. Although it adjoined the main thoroughfare and was open to all comers, it was left quite deserted, a prey to fresh vegetable growth. The local authorities, who had doubtless counted on selling it and seeing houses built upon it, were evidently unable to find a purchaser. The recollection of the heaps of bones and the cart persistently jolting through the streets may have made people recoil from the spot, or perhaps the indifference that was shown was due to the indolence, the repugnance to pulling down and setting up again, which is characteristic of country people. At all events, the authorities still retained possession of the ground, and at last forgot their desire to dispose of it. They did not even erect a fence round it, but left it open to all comers. Then, as time rolled on, people gradually grew accustomed to this barren spot. They would sit on the grass at the edges, walk about, or gather in groups. When the grass had been worn away, and the trodden soil had become gray and hard, the old cemetery resembled a badly leveled public square. As if the more effectually to efface the memory of all objectionable associations, the inhabitants slowly changed the very appellation of the place, retaining but the name of the saint, which was likewise applied to the blind alley dipping down at one corner of the field. Thus, there was the Air Saint-Mitre and the Impasse Saint-Mitre. 
All this dates, however, from some considerable time back. For more than 30 years now, the Air Saint Mitre has presented a different appearance. One day, the townspeople, far too inert and indifferent to derive any advantage from it, led it for a trifling consideration to some suburban wheelwrights who turned it into a wood yard. At the present day, it is still littered with huge pieces of timber 30 or 40 feet long, lying here and there in piles and looking like lofty, overturned columns. These piles of timber, disposed at intervals from one end of the yard to the other, are a continual source of delight to the local urchins. In some places, the ground is covered with fallen wood, forming a kind of uneven flooring over which it is impossible to walk unless one balance oneself with marvelous dexterity. Troops of children amuse themselves with this exercise all day long. You'll see them jumping over the big beams, walking in Indian file along the narrow ends, or else crawling astride them. Various games which generally terminate in blows and bellowings. Sometimes, too, a dozen of them will sit, closely packed one against the other, on the thin end of a pole raised a few feet from the ground, and will seesaw there for hours together. The Air Saint Mitre thus serves as a recreation ground, where for more than a quarter of a century all the little suburban ragamuffins have been in the habit of wearing out the seats of their breeches. The strangeness of the place is increased by the circumstance that wandering gypsies, by a sort of traditional custom, always select the vacant portions of it for their encampments. Whenever any caravan arrives at Plassans, it takes up its quarters on the Air Saint Mitre. The place is consequently never empty. There's always some strange band there, some troop of wild men and withered women, among whom groups of healthy-looking children roll about on the grass. These people live in the open air, regardless of everybody, setting their pots boiling, eating nameless things, freely displaying their tattered garments, and sleeping, fighting, kissing, and reeking with mingled filth and misery. The field, formerly so still and deserted, save for the buzzing of hornets around the rich blossoms in the heavy sunshine, has thus become a very rowdy spot, resounding with the noisy quarrels of the gypsies and the shrill cries of the urchins of the suburb. In one corner there is a primitive sawmill for cutting the timber, the noise from which serves as a dull, continuous bass accompaniment to the sharp voices. The wood is placed on two high trestles, and a couple of sawyers, one of whom stands aloft on the timber itself, while the other underneath is half blinded by the falling sawdust, work a large saw to and fro for hours together, with rigid machine-like regularity, as if they were wire-pulled puppets. The wood they saw is stacked, plank by plank, along the wall at the end, in carefully arranged piles six or eight feet high, which often remain there several seasons and constitute one of the charms of the Air Saint Mitre. Between these stacks are mysterious, retired little alleys leading to a broader path between the timber and the wall, a deserted strip of verdure whence only small patches of sky can be seen. The vigorous vegetation and the quivering, death-like stillness of the old cemetery still reign in this path. In all the country round Plassans there is no spot more instinct with languor, solitude, and love. It is a most delightful place for love-making. When the cemetery was being cleared, the bones must have been heaped up in this corner, for even today it frequently happens that one's foot comes across some fragment of a skull lying concealed in the damp turf. Nobody, however, now thinks of the bodies that once slept under that turf. In the daytime, only the children go behind the piles of wood when playing at hide-and-seek. The green path remains virginal, unknown to others who see naught but the woodyard crowded with timber and grey with dust. In the morning and afternoon, when the sun is warm, the whole place swarms with life. Above all the turmoil, 
above the ragamuffins playing among the timber and the gypsies kindling fires under their cauldrons. The sharp silhouette of a sawyer mounted on his beam stands out against the sky, moving to and fro with the precision of clockwork, as if to regulate the busy activity that has sprung up in this spot once set apart for eternal slumber. Only the old people who sit on the planks, basking in the setting sun, speak occasionally among themselves of the bones which they once saw carted through the streets of Plassans by the legendary Tumbrel. Where night falls, the air Saint-Mitre loses its animation and looks like some great black hole. At the far end, one may just espy the dying embers of a gypsy's fires, and at times shadows slink noiselessly into the dense darkness. The place becomes quite sinister, particularly in winter time. One Sunday evening, at about seven o'clock, a young man stepped lightly from the impasse Saint-Mitre and, closely skirting the walls, took his way among the timber in the woodyard. It was in the early part of December, 1851. The weather was dry and cold. The full moon shone with that sharp brilliancy peculiar to winter moons. The woodyard did not have the forbidding appearance which it wears on rainy nights. Illumined by stretches of white light and wrapped in deep and chilly silence, it spread around with a soft, melancholy aspect. For a few seconds the young man paused on the edge of the yard and gazed mistrustfully in front of him. He carried a long gun, the butt end of which was hidden under his jacket, while the barrel, pointed towards the ground, glittered in the moonlight. Pressing the weapon to his side, he attentively examined the square shadows cast by the piles of timber. The ground looked like a chessboard with black, and white squares clearly defined by alternate patches of light and shade. The sawyer's trestles in the center of the plot threw long, narrow, fantastic shadows, suggesting some huge geometrical figure upon a strip of bare gray ground. The rest of the yard, the flooring of beams, formed a great couch on which the light reposed, streaked here and there with the slender black shadows which edged the different pieces of timber. In the frigid silence under the wintry moon, the motionless recumbent poles, stiffened, as it were, with sleep and cold, recalled the corpses of the old cemetery. The young man cast but a rapid glance round the empty space. There was not a creature, not a sound, no danger of being seen or heard. The black patches at the further end caused him more anxiety, but after a brief examination, he plucked up courage and hurriedly crossed the wood yard. As soon as he felt himself under cover, he slackened his pace. He was now in the green pathway skirting the wall behind the piles of planks. Here his very footsteps became inaudible. The frozen grass scarcely crackled under his tread. He must have loved the spot, have feared no danger, sought nothing but what was pleasant there. He no longer concealed his gun. The path stretched away like a dark trench, except that the moon rays, gliding ever and anon between the piles of timber, then streaked the grass with patches of light. All slept, both darkness and light, with the same deep, soft, sad slumber. No words can describe the calm peacefulness of the place. The young man went right down the path and stopped at the end where the walls of a jas mefrain form an angle. Here he listened as if to ascertain whether any sound might be coming from the adjoining estate. At last, hearing nothing, he stooped down, thrust the plank aside, and hid his gun in a timber stack. An old tombstone, which had been overlooked in the clearing of the burial ground, lay in the corner, resting on its side and forming a high and slightly sloping seat. The rain had worn its edges, and moss was slowly eating into it. Nevertheless, the following fragment of an inscription, cut on the side which was sinking into the ground, 
might still have been distinguished in the moonlight. Here lieth Marie died. The finger of time had effaced the rest. When the young man had concealed his gun, he again listened attentively, and still hearing nothing, resolved to climb upon the stone. The wall being low, he was able to rest his elbows on the coping. He could, however, perceive nothing except a flood of light beyond the row of mulberry trees skirting the wall. The flat ground of Ajas Mefrin spread out under the moon like an immense sheet of unbleached linen. A hundred yards away, the farmhouse and its outbuildings formed a still wider patch. The young man was still gazing anxiously in that direction when, suddenly, one of a town clock slowly and solemnly struck seven. He counted the strokes and then jumped down, apparently surprised and relieved. He seated himself on the tombstone, like one who was prepared to wait some considerable time. And for about half an hour he remained motionless and deep in thought, apparently quite unconscious of the cold, while his eyes gazed fixedly at a mass of shadow. He had placed himself in a dark corner, but the beams of the rising moon had gradually reached him, and at last his head was in the full light. He was a strong, sturdy-looking lad, with a fine mouth and soft, delicate skin that bespoke youthfulness. He looked about seventeen years of age and was handsome in a characteristic way. His thin, long face looked like the work of some master sculptor. His high forehead, overhanging brows, aquiline nose, broad, flat chin, and protruding cheekbones gave singularly bold relief to his countenance. Such a face would, with advancing age, become too bony, as fleshless as that of a knight errant. But at this stage of youth, with chin and cheek lightly covered with soft down, its latent harshness was attenuated by the charming softness of certain contours which had remained vague and childlike. His soft black eyes, still full of youth, also lent delicacy to his otherwise vigorous countenance. The young fellow would probably not have fascinated all women, as he was not what one calls a handsome man. But his features, as a whole, expressed such ardent and sympathetic life, such enthusiasm and energy, that they doubtless engaged the thoughts of the girls of his own part, those sunburnt girls of the South, as he passed their doors on sultry July evenings. He remained seated upon the tombstone, wrapped in thought, and apparently quite unconscious of the moonlight which now fell upon his chest and legs. He was of middle stature, rather thick-set, with overdeveloped arms and a laborer's hands, already hardened by toil. His feet, shod with heavy-laced boots, looked large and square-toed. His general appearance, more particularly the heaviness of his limbs, bespoke lowly origin. There was, however, something in him, in the upright bearing of his neck and the thoughtful gleams of his eyes, which seemed to indicate an inner revolt against the brutifying manual labor which was beginning to bend him to the ground. He was, no doubt, an intelligent nature buried beneath the oppressive burden of race and class, one of those delicate, refined minds embedded in a rough envelope, from which they in vain struggle to free themselves. Thus, in spite of his vigor, he seemed timid and restless, feeling a kind of unconscious shame at his imperfection. An honest lad he doubtless was, whose very ignorance had generated enthusiasm, whose manly heart was impelled by childish intellect, and who could show alike the submissiveness of a woman and the courage of a hero. On the evening in question, he was dressed in a coat and trousers of greenish corduroy. A soft felt hat, placed lightly on the back of his head, cast a streak of shadow over his brow. As the neighboring clock struck the half hour, he suddenly started from his reverie. Perceiving that the white moonlight was shining full upon him, he gazed anxiously ahead. 
Then he abruptly dived back into the shade, but was unable to recover the thread of his thoughts. He now realized that his hands and feet were becoming very cold, and impatience seized hold of him. So he jumped upon the stone again and once more glanced over the Jasse Mefrain, which was still empty and silent. Finally, at a loss how to employ his time, he jumped down, fetched his gun from the pile of planks where he had concealed it, and amused himself by working the trigger. The weapon was a long, heavy carbine, which had doubtless belonged to some smuggler. The thickness of the butt and the breech of the barrel showed it to be an old flintlock which had been altered into a percussion gun by some local gunsmith. Such firearms are to be found in farmhouses, hanging against the wall over the chimney piece. The young man caressed his weapon with affection. Twenty times or more he pulled the trigger, thrust his little finger into the barrel, and examined the butt attentively. By degrees he grew full of youth enthusiasm, combined with childish frolicsomeness, and ended by leveling his weapon and aiming at space, like a recruit going through his drill. It was now very nearly eight o'clock, and he'd been holding his gun leveled for over a minute, when all at once a low, panting call, light as a breath, came from the direction of the Jache Mefrain. "'Are you there, Silver?' the voice asked. Silver dropped his gun and bounded onto the tombstone. "'Yes, yes,' he replied, also in a hushed voice. "'Wait, I'll help you.' Before he could stretch out his arms, however, a girl's head appeared above the wall. With singular agility, the damsel had availed herself of the trunk of a mulberry tree and climbed aloft like a kitten. The ease and certainty with which she moved showed that she was familiar with this strange spot. In another moment she was seated on the coping of the wall. Then Silver, taking her in his arms, carried her, though not without a struggle, to the seat. "'Let go!' she laughingly cried. "'Let go! I can get down alone very well!' and when she was seated on the stone slab, she added, "'Have you been waiting for me long? "'I've been running, and am quite out of breath.' Silver made no reply. He seemed in no laughing humor, but gazed sorrowfully into the girl's face. "'I wanted to see you, Miette,' he said, as he seated himself beside her. "'I should have waited all night for you. "'I'm going away at daybreak tomorrow morning.' Miette had just caught sight of the gun lying on the grass, and with a thoughtful air she murmured, "'Ah, so it's decided, then? There's your gun.' "'Yes,' replied Silver, after a brief pause, his voice still faltering. "'It's my gun. I thought it best to remove it from the house tonight. Tomorrow morning, Aunt Did might have seen me take it, and it felt uneasy about it. I'm going to hide it, and she'll fetch it just before starting. Then, as Miette could not remove her eyes from the weapon, which he had so foolishly left on the grass, he jumped up and again hid it among the wood stacks. We learned this morning, he said, as he resumed his seat, that the insurgents of La Palure and Saint-Martin-de-Vaux were on the march and spent last night at Alboise. We've decided to join them. Some of the workmen of Plassan have already left the town this afternoon. Those who still remain will join their brothers tomorrow. He spoke the word brothers with youthful emphasis. A contest is becoming inevitable, he added, but at any rate, we've right on our side and we shall triumph. Miette listened to Silver, her eyes meantime gazing in front of her without observing anything. "'Tis well,' she said, when he'd finished speaking. And after a fresh pause, she continued, "'You warned me, yet I still hoped. "'However, it is decided.' Neither of them knew what else to say. The green path in the deserted corner of the woodyard relapsed into melancholy stillness. Only the moon chased the shadows of the piles of timber over the grass." The two young people on the tombstone remained silent and motionless in the pale light. Silver had passed his arm round Miette's waist, 
and she was leaning against his shoulder. They exchanged no kisses, naught but an embrace in which love showed the innocent tenderness of fraternal affection. Miet was enveloped in a long brown hooded cloak reaching to her feet and leaving only her head and hands visible. The women of the lower classes in Provence, the peasantry and work people, still wear these ample cloaks, which are called pelisse. It is a fashion which must have lasted for ages. Miet had thrown back her hood on arriving. Living in the open air and born of a hot-blooded race, she never wore a cap. Her bare head showed in bold relief against the wall, which the moonlight widened. She was still a child, no doubt, but a child ripening into womanhood. She'd reached that adorable, uncertain hour when the frolicsome girl changes to a young woman. At that stage of life, a bud-like delicacy, a hesitancy of contour that is exquisitely charming, distinguishes young girls. The outlines of womanhood appear amidst girlhood's innocent slimness, and woman shoots forth at first all embarrassment, still retaining much of a child, and ever and unconsciously betraying her sex. This period is very unpropitious for some girls who suddenly shoot up, become ugly, sallow, and frail, like plants before their due season. For those, however, who, like Miette, are healthy and live in the open air, it is a time of delightful gracefulness which once passed can never be recalled. Miette was thirteen years of age, and although strong and sturdy did not look any older, so bright and childish was the smile which lit up her countenance. However, she was nearly as tall as Silver, plump and full of life. Like her lover, she had no common beauty. She would not have been considered ugly, but she might have appeared peculiar to many young ex exquisites. Her rich black hair rose roughly erect above her forehead, streamed back like a rushing wave and flowed over her head and neck like an inky sea, tossing and bubbling capriciously. It was very thick and inconvenient to arrange. However, she twisted it as tightly as possible into coils as thick as a child's fist, which she wound together at the back of her head. She had little time to devote to her toilet, but this huge chignon, hastily contrived without the aid of any mirror, was often instinct with vigorous grace. On seeing her thus naturally helmeted with a mass of frizzy hair which hung about her neck and temples like a mane, one could readily understand why she always went bareheaded, heedless alike of rain and frost. Under her dark locks appeared her low forehead, curved and golden like a crescent moon. Her large prominent eyes, her short tip-tilted nose with dilated nostrils, and her thick ruddy lips when regarded apart from one another, would have looked ugly. Viewed, however, all together, amidst the delightful roundness and vivacious mobility of her countenance, they formed an ensemble of strange, surprising beauty. When Miette laughed, throwing back her head and gently resting it on her right shoulder, she resembled an old-time bacchant, her throat distending with sonorous gaiety, her cheeks round like those of a child her teeth large and white, her twists of woolly hair tossed by every outburst of merriment and waving like a crown of vine leaves. To realize that she was only a child of thirteen, one had to notice the innocence underlying her full womanly laughter, and especially the childlike delicacy of her chin and soft transparency of her temples. In certain lights, Miette's sun-tanned face showed yellow like amber, a little soft black down already shaded her upper lip. Toil, too, was beginning to disfigure her small hands, which, if left idle, would have become charmingly plump and delicate. Miette and Silver long remained silent. They were reading their own anxious thoughts, and as they pondered upon the unknown terrors of the morrow, they tightened their mutual embrace. Their hearts communed with each other, they understood how useless and cruel would be any verbal plaint. The girl, however, 
could at last no longer contain herself, and choking with emotion, she gave expression in one phrase to their mutual misgivings. "'You will come back again, won't you?' she whispered, as she hung on Silver's neck. Silver made no reply, but half-stifling and fearing lest he should give way to tears like herself, he kissed her in brotherly fashion on the cheek, at a loss for any other consolation. Then, disengaging themselves, they again lapsed into silence. After a moment, Miette shuddered. Now that she no longer leant against Silver's shoulder, she was becoming icy cold. Yet she would not have shuddered thus had she been in this deserted path the previous evening, seated on this tombstone where for several seasons they had tasted so much happiness. I'm very cold, she said, as she pulled her hood over her head. Shall we walk about a little? the young man asked her. It's not yet nine o'clock. We can take a stroll along the road. Miette reflected that for a long time she would probably not have the pleasure of another meeting, another of those evening chats, the joy of which served to sustain her all day long. Yes, let us walk a little, she eagerly replied. Let us go as far as the mill. I could pass the whole night like this if you wanted to. They rose from the tombstone and were soon hidden in the shadow of a pile of planks. Here Miette opened her cloak, which had a quilted lining of red twill, and threw half of it over Silver's shoulders, thus enveloping him as he stood there close beside her. The same garment cloaked them both, and they passed their arms round each other's waist and became, as it were, but one being. When they were thus shrouded in the police, they walked slowly towards the high road, fearlessly crossing the vacant parts of the wood yard which looked white in the moonlight. Miette had thrown the cloak over Silver, and he had submitted to it quite naturally, as though indeed the garment rendered them a similar service every evening. The road to Nice, on either side of which the suburban houses are built, was, in the year 1851, lined with ancient elm trees, grand and gigantic ruins, still full of vigor, which the fastidious town council has replaced some years since by some little plane trees. When Silver and Miette found themselves under the elms, the huge boughs of which cast shadows on the moonlit footpath, they met now and again black forms which silently skirted the house fronts. These two were amorous couples, closely wrapped in one and the same cloak and strolling in the darkness. This style of promenading has been instituted by the young lovers of southern towns. Those boys and girls among the people who mean to marry sooner or later, but who do not dislike a kiss or two in advance, know no spot where they can kiss at their ease without exposing themselves to recognition and gossip. Accordingly, while strolling about the suburbs, the plots of waste land, the footpaths of the high road, in fact, all these places where there are few passers-by and numerous shady nooks, they conceal their identity by wrapping themselves in these long cloaks, which are capacious enough to cover a whole family. The parents tolerate these proceedings, however stiff may be provincial propriety. No apprehensions seemingly are entertained. And, on the other hand, nothing could be more charming than these lovers' rambles, which appeals so keenly to the Southerner's fanciful imagination. There is a veritable masquerade, fertile in innocent enjoyments, within the reach of the most humble. The girl clasps her sweetheart to her bosom, enveloping him in her own warm cloak. And no doubt it is delightful to be able to kiss one's sweetheart within those shrouding folds without danger of being recognized. One couple is exactly like another and to the belated pedestrian who sees the vague groups gliding hither and thither, tis merely love passing, love guessed and scarce espied. The lovers know they are safely concealed within their cloaks. They converse in undertones and make themselves quite at home. Most frequently they do not converse at all, 
but walk along at random and in silence, content in their embrace. The climate alone is to blame for having, in the first instance, prompted these young lovers to retire to secluded spots in the suburbs. On fine summer nights, one cannot walk round Plassan without coming across a hooded couple in every patch of shadow falling from the house walls. Certain places, like the Air Saint-Mitre, for instance, are full of these dark dominoes brushing past one another, gliding softly in the warm nocturnal air. One might imagine they were guests invited to some mysterious ball given by the stars to lowly lovers. When the weather is very warm and the girls do not wear cloaks, they simply turn up their overskirts. And in the winter, the more passionate lovers make light of the frosts. Thus, Miette and Silver, as they descended Benice Road, thought little of the chill December night. This ends Section 2, Chapter 1, Part 1. Section 3 of The Fortune of the Rougeon, Book 1 of Rougeon Maca Cycle by Emile Zola, translated by Henry Bizzitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Mark Leder. Section 3, Chapter 1, Part 2 They passed through the slumbering suburb without exchanging a word, but enjoying the mute delight of their warm embrace. Their hearts were heavy. The joy which they felt in being side by side was tinged with the painful emotion which comes from the thought of approaching severance, and it seemed to them that they could never exhaust the mingled sweetness and bitterness of the silence which slowly lulled their steps. But the houses soon grew fewer, and they reached the end of the Faubourg. There stands the entrance to the Jachemefrain, an iron gate fixed to two strong pillars a low row of mulberry trees being visible through the bars. Silver and Miette instinctively cast a glance inside as they passed on. Beyond the Jachemefrain, the road descends with a gentle slope to a valley, which serves as the bed of a little rivulet, the Viorne, a brook in summer but a torrent in winter. The rows of elms still extended the whole way at that time, making the high road a magnificent avenue, which cast a broad band of gigantic trees across the hill, which was planted with corn and stunted vines. On that December night, under the clear, cold moonlight, the newly ploughed fields stretching away on either hand resembled vast beds of grayish wadding, which deadened every sound in the atmosphere. The dull murmur of the Viorne in the distance alone sent a quivering thrill through the profound silence of the countryside. When the young people had begun to descend the avenue, Miette's thoughts reverted to the Jasmefrain, which they had just left behind them. "'I had great difficulty in getting away this evening,' she said. "'My uncle wouldn't let me go. He'd shut himself up in a cellar where he was hiding his money, I think.' for he seemed greatly frightened this morning at the events that are taking place. Sylvia clasped her yet more lovingly. Be brave, said he. The time will come when we shall be able to see each other freely the whole day long. You must not fret. Oh, replied the girl, shaking her head, you are very hopeful. For my part, I sometimes feel very sad. It isn't the hard work which grieves me. On the contrary, I'm often very glad of my uncle's severity and the tasks he sets me. He was quite right to make me a peasant girl. I should perhaps have turned out badly, for, do you know, Silver, there are moments when I fancy myself under a curse. I feel, then, that I should like to be dead. I think of you-know-whom. As she spoke these last words, her voice broke into a sob. Silver interrupted her somewhat harshly. "'Be quiet,' he said. "'You promised not to think about it. It's no crime of yours. We love each other very much, don't we?' 
he added in a gentler tone. When we're married, you'll have no more unpleasant hours. I know, murmured Miette. You are so kind. You sustain me. What am I to do? I sometimes have fears and feelings of revolt. I think at times that I have been wronged, and then I should like to do something wicked. You see, I pour forth my heart to you. Whenever my father's name is thrown in my face, I feel my whole body burning. When the urchins cry at me as I pass, Eh, le chantigre! I lose all control of myself and feel that I should like to lay hold of them and whip them. After a savage pause, she resumed. As for you, you're a man. You're going to fight. You're very lucky. Silvère had let her speak on. After a few steps, he observed sorrowfully, You're wrong, Miet. Yours is bad anger. You shouldn't rebel against justice. As for me, I'm going to fight in defense of our common rights, not to gratify any personal animosity. All the same, the young girl continued, I should like to be a man and handle a gun. I feel that it would do me good. Then, as Silvère remained silent, she perceived that she had displeased him. Her feverishness subsided, and she whispered in a supplicating tone, You are not angry with me, are you? It's your departure which grieves me and awakens such ideas. I know very well you are right, but I ought to be humble. Then she began to cry, and Silvère, moved by her tears, grasped her hands and kissed them. See now how you pass from anger to tears, like a child, he said lovingly. You must be reasonable. I am not scolding you. I only want to see you happier, and that depends largely upon yourself. The remembrance of the drama which Miette had so sadly evoked cast a temporary gloom over the lovers. They continued their walk with bowed heads and troubled thoughts. Do you think I'm much happier than you? Silvere at last inquired, resuming the conversation in spite of himself. If my grandmother had not taken care of me and educated me, what would have become of me? With the exception of my uncle Antoine, who is an artisan like myself and who taught me to love the Republic, all my other relations seemed to fear that I might besmirch them by coming near them. He was now speaking with animation and suddenly stopped detaining me at in the middle of the road. God is my witness, he continued, that I do not envy or hate anybody. But if we triumph, I shall have to tell the truth to those fine gentlemen. Uncle Antoine knows all about this matter. You'll see when we return. We shall all live free and happy. Then Miet gently led him on, and they resumed their walk. You dearly love your republic? the girl asked, a saying a joke. Do you love me as much? Her smile was not altogether free from a tinge of bitterness. She was thinking, perhaps, how easily Silvere abandoned her to go and scour the countryside. But the lad gravely replied, You are my wife, to whom I have given my whole heart. I love the republic because I love you. When we are married, we shall want plenty of happiness, and it is to procure a share of that happiness that I am going away tomorrow morning. You surely don't want to persuade me to remain at home. Oh, no, cried the girl eagerly. A man should be brave. Courage is beautiful. You must forgive my jealousy. I should like to be as strong-minded as you are. You would love me all the more, wouldn't you? After a moment's silence, she added, with charming vivacity and ingenuousness, Ah, oh, how willingly I shall kiss you when you come back! This outburst of a loving and courageous heart deeply affected Silver. He clasped Miette in his arms and printed several kisses on her cheek. As she laughingly struggled to escape him, her eyes filled with tears of emotion. All around the lovers, the country still slumbered amid the deep stillness of the cold. 
They were now halfway down the hill. On the top of a rather lofty hillock to the left stood the ruins of a windmill, blanched by the moon. The tower which had fallen in on one side alone remained. This was the limit which the young people had assigned to their walk. They had come straight from the Faubourg without casting a single glance at the fields between which they passed. When Silver had kissed Miette's cheek, he raised his head and observed the mill. "'What a long walk we've had!' he exclaimed. "'See, here is the mill. It must be nearly half-past nine. We must go home.' But Miette pouted. "'Let us walk a little further,' she implored. "'Only a few steps, just as far as the little crossroad. "'No farther, really.' "'Silver smiled as he again took her round the waist. "'Then they continued to descend the hill, "'no longer fearing inquisitive glances, "'for they had not met a living soul since passing the last houses. "'They nevertheless remained enveloped in the long police which seemed, as it were, a natural nest for their love. It had shrouded them on so many happy evenings. Had they simply walked side by side, they would have felt small and isolated in that vast stretch of country, whereas, blended together as they were, they became bolder and seemed less puny. Between the folds of the police they gazed upon the field stretching on both sides of the road, without experiencing that crushing feeling with which far-stretching, callous vistas oppress the human affections. It seemed to them as though they had brought their house with them. They felt a pleasure in viewing the countryside as from a window, delighting in the calm solitude, the sheets of slumbering light, the glimpses of nature vaguely distinguishable beneath the shroud of night and winter. The whole of that valley, indeed, which, while charming them, could not thrust itself between their close-pressed hearts. All continuity of conversation had ceased. They spoke no more of others, nor even of themselves. They were absorbed by the present, pressing each other's hands, uttering exclamations at the sight of some particular spot, exchanging words at rare intervals, and then understanding each other but little, for drowsiness came from the warmth of their embrace. Silver forgot his republican enthusiasm, yet no longer reflected that her lover would be leaving her in an hour, for a long time, perhaps forever. The transports of their affection lulled them into a feeling of security, as on other days when no prospect of parting had marred the tranquility of their meetings. They still walked on and soon reached the little crossroad mentioned by Miette, a bit of a lane which led through the fields to a village on the banks of the Viorne. But they passed on, pretending not to notice this path, where they had agreed to stop. And it was only some minutes afterwards that Silver whispered, It must be very late. You will get tired. No. I assure you I'm not at all tired, the girl replied. I could walk several leagues like this easily. Then in a coaxing tone she added, Let us go down as far as the meadows of St. Clair. There we will really stop and turn back. Silver, whom the girl's rhythmic gait lulled to semi-somnolence, made no objection, and their rapture began afresh. They now went on more slowly, fearing the moment when they would have to retrace their steps. So long as they walked onward, they felt as though they were advancing to the eternity of their mutual embrace. The return would mean separation and bitter leave-taking. The declivity of the road was gradually becoming more gentle. In the valley below, there are meadows extending as far as the Viorne, which runs at the other end, beneath a range of low hills. These meadows, separated from the high road by thick-set hedges, are the meadows of St. Clair. Bah! exclaimed Silver this time, as he caught sight of the first patches of grass. We may as well go as far as the bridge. At this, Miette burst out laughing, clasped the young man round the neck, and kissed him noisily. 
At the spot where the hedges begin, there were in those days two elms forming the end of a long avenue, two colossal trees larger than any of the others. The treeless fields stretch out from the high road like a broad band of green wool, as far as the willows and birches by the river. The distance from the last elms to the bridge is scarcely three hundred yards. The lovers took a good quarter of an hour to cover that space. At last, however slow their gait, they reached the bridge, and there they stopped. The road to Nice ran up in front of them, along the opposite slope of the valley. But they could only see a small portion of it, as it takes a sudden turn about half a mile from the bridge and is lost to view among the wooded hills. On looking round, they caught sight of the other end of the road, that which they had just traversed and which leads in a direct line from Plassans to the Viorne. In the beautiful winter moonlight, it looks like a long silver ribbon with dark edgings traced by the rows of elms. On the right and left, the ploughed hill land showed like vast, gray, vague seas intersected by this ribbon, this roadway white with frost and brilliant as with metallic luster. Up above, on a level with the horizon, light shone from a few windows in the Faubourg, resembling glowing sparks. By degrees, Miette and Silver had walked fully a league. They gazed at the intervening road, full of silent admiration for the vast amphitheater which rose to the verge of the heavens, and over which flowed bluish streams of light as over the superposed rocks of a gigantic waterfall. The strange and colossal picture spread out amid death-like stillness and silence. Nothing could have been of more sovereign grandeur. Then the young people, having leant against the parapet of the bridge, gazed beneath them. The Viorne, swollen by the rains, flowed on with a dull, continuous sound. Up and down stream, despite the darkness which filled the hollows, they perceived the black lines of the trees growing on the banks. Here and there glided the moonbeams, casting a trail of molten metal, as it were, over the water, which glittered and danced like rays of light on the scales of some live animal. The gleams darted with a mysterious charm along the gray torrent, betwixt the vague phantom-like foliage. You might have thought this an enchanted valley, some wondrous retreat where a community of shadows and gleams lived a fantastic life. This part of the river was familiar to the lovers. They had often come here in search of coolness on warm July nights. They'd spent hours hidden among the clusters of willows on the right bank, at the spot where the meadows of St. Clair spread their verdant carpet to the waterside. They remembered every bend of the bank, the stones on which they had stepped in order to cross the Viorne, at that season as narrow as a brooklet, and certain little grassy hollows where they had indulged in their dreams of love. Miette, therefore, now gazed from the bridge at the right bank of a torrent with longing eyes. If it were warmer, she sighed, we might go down and rest a while before going back up the hill. Then, after a pause, during which she kept her eyes fixed on the banks, she resumed. Look down there, Silver, at that black mass yonder in front of the lock. Do you remember? That's the brushwood where we sat last Corpus Christi day. Yes, so it is, replied Silver softly. This was the spot where they had first ventured to kiss each other on the cheek. The remembrance just roused by the girl's words brought both of them a delightful feeling, an emotion in which the joys of the past mingled with the hopes of the morrow. Before their eyes, with the rapidity of lightning, there passed all the delightful evenings they had spent together, especially that evening of Corpus Christi Day, with the warm sky, the cool willows of the Viorne, and their own loving talk. And at the same time, whilst the past came back to their hearts full of a delightful savor, they fancied they could plunge into the unknown future, 
see their dreams realized, and march through life arm in arm, even as they had just been doing on the highway, warmly wrapped in the same cloak. Then rapture came to them again, and they smiled in each other's eyes, alone amidst all the silent radiance. Suddenly, however, Silver raised his head and, throwing off the cloak, listened attentively. Miette, in her surprise, imitated him, at a loss to understand why he had started so abruptly from her side. Confused sounds had for a moment been coming from behind the hills in the midst of which the Nice road wends its way. They suggested the distant jolting of a procession of carts, but not distinctly, so loud was the roaring of the Viorne. Gradually, however, they became more pronounced and rose at last like the tramping of an army on the march. Then, amidst the continuous growing rumble, one detected the shouts of a crowd, strange rhythmical blasts as of a hurricane. One could even have fancied they were the thunderclaps of a rapidly approaching storm which was already disturbing the slumbering atmosphere. Silver listened attentively, unable to tell, however, what were those tempest-like shouts, for the hills prevented them from reaching him distinctly. Suddenly a dark mass appeared at the turn of the road, and then the Marseillaise burst forth, formidable, sung as with avenging fury. Ah, here they are, cried Silver, with a burst of joyous enthusiasm. Forthwith he began to run up the hill, dragging Miette with him. On the left of the road was an embankment planted with evergreen oaks, up which he clambered with the young girl to avoid being carried away by the surging, howling multitude. When he'd reached the top of the bank and the shadow of the brushwood, Miette, rather pale, gazed sorrowfully at those men whose distant song had sufficed to draw Silver from her embrace. It seemed as if the whole band had thrust itself between them. They had been so happy a few minutes before, locked in each other's arms, alone and lost amidst the overwhelming silence and discreet glimmer of the moon. And now Silver, whose head was turned away from her, who no longer seemed even conscious of her presence, had eyes only for those strangers whom he called his brothers. The band descended the slope with a superb, irresistible stride. There could have been nothing grander than the eruption of those few thousand men into that cold, still, deathly scene. The highway became a torrent, rolling with living waves which seemed inexhaustible. At the bend in the road fresh masses ever appeared, whose songs ever helped to swell the roar of this human tempest. When the last battalions came in sight, the uproar was deafening. The Marseillaise filled the atmosphere as if blown through enormous trumpets by giant mouths, which cast it, vibrating with a brazen clang, into every corner of the valley. The slumbering countryside awoke with a start, quivering like a beaten drum, resonant to its very entrails, and repeating with each and every echo the passionate notes of a national song. And then the singing was no longer confined to the men. From the very horizon, from the distant rocks, the ploughed land, the meadows, the copses, the smallest bits of brushwood, human voices seemed to come. The great amphitheatre, extending from the river to Plassans, the gigantic cascade over which the bluish moonlight flowed, was as if filled with innumerable, invisible people cheering the insurgents. And in the depths of the Viorne, Along the waters, streaked with mysterious metallic reflections, there was not a dark nook but seemed to conceal human beings who took up each refrain with yet greater passion. With air and earth alike quivering, the whole countryside cried for vengeance and liberty. So long as the little army was descending the slope, the roar of the populace thus rolled on in sonorous waves broken by abrupt outbursts, which shook the very stones in the roadway. Silver, pale with emotion, still listened and looked on. The insurgents who led the van of that swarming, roaring stream, so vague and monstrous in the darkness, were rapidly approaching the bridge. 
I thought, murmured Miette, that you would not pass through Plassans. They must have altered the plan of operations, Sylvère replied. We were, in fact, to have marched to the chief town by the Cologne Road, passing to the left of Plassans and Orcher. They must have left Amboise this afternoon and passed Les Toulettes this evening. The head of the column had already arrived in front of the young people. The little army was more orderly than one would have expected from a band of undisciplined men. The contingents from the various towns and villages formed separate battalions, each separated by a distance of a few paces. These battalions were apparently under the orders of certain chiefs. For the nonce, the pace at which they were descending the hillside made them a compact mass of invincible strength. There were probably about 3,000 men, all united and carried away by the same storm of indignation. The strange details of the scene were not discernible amidst the shadows cast over the highway by the lofty slopes. At five or six feet from the brushwood, however, where Miette and Silver were sheltered, the left-hand embankment gave place to a little pathway which ran alongside the Viarn, and the moonlight flowing through this gap cast a broad band of radiance across the road. When the first insurgents reached this patch of light, they were suddenly illumined by a sharp white glow which revealed, with singular distinctness, every outline of visage or costume. And as the various contingents swept on, the young people thus saw them emerge fiercely and without cessation from the surrounding darkness. As the first men passed through the light, Miette instinctively clung to Sylvère, although she knew she was safe, even from observation. She passed her arm round the young fellow's neck, resting her head against his shoulder. And with the hood of her police encircling her pale face, she gazed fixedly at that square patch of light as it was rapidly traversed by those strange faces, transfigured by enthusiasm with dark open mouths full of the furious cry of the Marseillaise. Silver, whom she felt quivering at her side, then bent towards her and named the various contingents as they passed. The column marched along eight abreast. In the van were a number of big, square-headed fellows who seemed to possess the Herculean strength and naive confidence of giants. They would doubtless prove blind, intrepid defenders of the Republic. On their shoulders they carried large axes, whose edges, freshly sharpened, glittered in the moonlight. Those are the woodcutters of the forests of the Say, said Silver. They have been formed into a corps of sappers. At a signal from their leaders, they would march as far as Paris, battering down the gates of the towns with their axes, just as they cut down the old cork trees on the mountain. The young man spoke with pride of the heavy fists of his brethren, and on seeing a band of laborers and rough-bearded men, tanned by the sun, coming along behind the woodcutters, he continued, This is the contingent from La Palou. That was the first place to rise. The men in blouses are laborers who cut up the cork trees. The others in velveteen jackets must be sportsmen poachers and charcoal burners living in the passes of the Say. The poachers knew your father, Miette. They have good firearms, which they handle skillfully. Ah, uh, if all were armed in the same manner. We are short of muskets. See, the laborers have only got cudgels. Miette, still speechless, looked on and listened. As Silver spoke to her of her father, the blood surged to her cheeks. Her face burnt as she scrutinized the sportsman with a strange air of mingled indignation and sympathy. From this moment she grew animated, yielding to the feverish quiver which the insurgent songs awakened. The column, which had just begun the Marseillaise afresh, was still marching down as though lashed on by the sharp blasts of the Mistral. The men of La Pelou were followed by another troop of workmen, among whom a goodly number of middle-class folks in greatcoats were to be seen. Those are the men of saint martin de vaux Silver resumed. That bourg rose almost at the same time as La Palou. The masters joined the workmen. 
There are some rich men there, Miet, men whose wealth would enable them to live peacefully at home, but who prefer to risk their lives in defense of liberty. One can but admire them. Weapons are very scarce, however. They've scarcely got a few fowling pieces. But do you see those men yonder, Miet, with red bands round their left elbows? They are the leaders. The contingents descended the hill more rapidly than Silver could speak. While he was naming the men from saint martin de vaux two battalions had already crossed the ray of light which blanched the roadway. Did you see the insurgents from Alboise and Les Toulettes pass by just now, he asked. I recognized Boga, the blacksmith. They must have joined the band today. How they do run! Miette was now leaning forward in order to see more of the little bands described to her by the young man. The quiver she felt rose from her bosom to her throat. Then a battalion, larger and better disciplined than the others, appeared. The insurgents composing it were nearly all dressed in blue blouses with red sashes round their waists. One would have thought they were arrayed in uniform. A man on horseback with a saber at his side was in the midst of them, and most of these improvised soldiers carried guns probably carbines and old muskets of the National Guard. I don't know those, said Silver. The man on horseback must be the chief I've heard spoken of. He brought with him the contingents from Favarolles and the neighboring villages. The whole column ought to be equipped in the same manner. He had no time to take breath. Ah, see, here are the country people, he suddenly cried. Small groups of ten or twenty men at the most were now advancing behind the men of Faverol. They all wore the short jacket of the southern peasantry, and as they sang they brandished pitchforks and scythes. Some of them even only carried large navvies' shovels. Every hamlet, however, had sent its able-bodied men. Silver, who recognized the parties by their leaders, enumerated them in feverish tones. The contingent from Chavano, said he. There are only eight men, but they are strong. Uncle Antoine knows them. Here's Nazaire. Here's Pougeot. They're all here. Not one has failed to answer the summons. Valkyra. Hold. There's the parson amongst them. I've heard about him. He's a staunch Republican. He was becoming intoxicated with the spectacle. Now that each battalion existed of only a few insurgents, he had to name them yet more hastily, and his precipitancy gave him the appearance of one in a frenzy. Ah, Miette, he continued, what a fine march past. Rosin, Vernou, Corbière, and there are more still, you'll see. These have only got scythes, but they'll mow down the troops as close as the grass in their meadows. saint Europe, Mazet, Les Gares, Marsan, the whole north side of the Say. Ah, we shall be victorious. Victorious. The whole country is with us. Look at those men's arms. They are hard and black as iron. There's no end to them. There's Puinat, Rochnoir. Those last are smugglers. They're carrying carbines. Still more scythes and pitchforks. The contingents of country folk are still passing. Castel le Vieux, saint anne Grey, Estourmel, Mortarin. His voice was husky with emotion as he finished naming these men who seemed to be borne away by a whirlwind as fast as he enumerated them. Erect with glowing countenance, he pointed out the several contingents with a nervous gesture. Miette followed his movements. The road below attracted her like the depths of a precipice. To avoid slipping down the incline, she clung to the young man's neck. A strange intoxication emanated from those men who themselves were inebriated with clamor, courage, and confidence. Those beings seen athwart a moonbeam, those youths and those men in their prime, those old people brandishing strange weapons and dressed in the most diverse costumes, from working smock to middle-class overcoat, those endless rows of heads, which the hour and the circumstances endowed with an expression of fanatical energy and enthusiasm, gradually appeared to the girl like a whirling, impetuous torrent. At certain moments she fancied they were not of themselves moving, 
that they were really being carried away by the force of the Marseillaise, by that hoarse, sonorous chant. She could not distinguish any conversation. She heard but a continuous volume of sound alternating from bass to shrill notes, as piercing as nails driven into one's flesh. This roar of revolt, this call to combat, to death, with its outbursts of indignation, its burning thirst for liberty, its remarkable blending of bloodthirsty and sublime impulses unceasingly smote her heart, penetrating more deeply at each fierce outburst and filling her with the voluptuous pangs of a virgin martyr who stands erect and smiles under the lash. And the crowd flowed on, ever amidst the same sonorous wave of sound. The march passed, which should not really last more than a few minutes, seemed to the young people to be interminable. Truly, Miette was but a child. She had turned pale at the approach of the band. She'd wept for the loss of love. But she was a brave child whose ardent nature was easily fired by enthusiasm. Thus, ardent emotions had gradually got possession of her, and she became as courageous as a youth. She would willingly have seized the weapon and followed the insurgents. As the muskets and scythes filed past, her white teeth glistened longer and sharper between her red lips, like the fangs of a young wolf eager to bite and tear. And as she listened to Silvere enumerating the contingents from the countryside with ever-increasing haste, the pace of the column seemed to her to accelerate still more. She soon fancied it all a cloud of human dust swept along by a tempest. Everything began to whirl before her. Then she closed her eyes. Big hot tears were rolling down her cheeks. Silver's eyelashes were also moist. I don't see the men who left Plassans this afternoon, he murmured. He tried to distinguish the end of the column, which was still hidden by the darkness. Suddenly he cried with joyous exultation, Ah, here they are! They've got the banner! The banner has been entrusted to them! Then he wanted to leap from the slope in order to join his companions. At this moment, however, the insurgents halted. Words of command ran along the column. The Marseillaise died out in a final rumble, and one could only hear the confused murmuring of the still surging crowd. Silver, as he listened, caught the orders which were passed on from one contingent to another. They called the men of Plassans to the van. Then, as each battalion ranged itself alongside the road to make way for the banner, the young man reascended the embankment, dragging Miette with him. Come, he said, we can get across the river before they do. When they were on the top, among the ploughed land, they ran along to a mill whose lock bars the river. Then they crossed the Viorne on a plank placed there by the millers and cut across the meadows of St. Clair, running hand in hand without exchanging a word. The column threw a dark line over the highway, which they followed alongside the hedges. There were some gaps in the hawthorns, and at last Silver and Miette sprang on to the road through one of them. In spite of the circuitous way they had come, they arrived at the same time as the men of Plassans. Silver shook hands with some of them. They must have thought he had heard of a new route they had chosen and had come to meet them. Miette, whose face was half concealed by her hood, was scrutinized rather inquisitively. Why, it's Chantegray, at last said one of the men from the Faubourg of Plassans. The niece of Rebouffa the Meijer of the Jache Mefrain. Footnote. A Meijer is a farmer in Provence who shares the expenses and profits of his farm with the owner of the land. Where have you sprung from, gadabout? cried another voice. Silver, intoxicated with enthusiasm, had not thought of a distress which his sweetheart would feel at the jeers of the workmen. Miette, all confusion, looked at him as if to implore his aid. But before he could even open his lips, another voice rose from the crowd, brutally exclaiming, Our father's at the galleys. We don't want the daughter of a thief and murderer among us. At this, Miette turned dreadfully pale. You lie, she muttered. 
If my father did kill anybody, he never thieved. And as Silver, pale and trembling more than she, began to clench his fists, Stop, she continued, this is my affair. Then, turning to the men, she repeated with a shout, You lie! You lie! He never stole a copper from anybody. You know it well enough. Why do you insult him when he can't be here? She drew herself up, superb with indignation. With her ardent, half-wild nature, she seemed to accept the charge of murder composedly enough, but that of theft exasperated her. They knew it, and that was why folks, from stupid malice, often cast the accusation in her face. The man who had just called her father a thief was merely repeating what he'd heard said for many years. The girl's defiant attitude only incited the workmen to jeer the more. Silver still had his fists clenched, and matters might have become serious if a poacher from Messey, who had been sitting on a heap of stones at the roadside awaiting the order to march, had not come to the girl's assistance. "'The little one's right,' he said. "'Chantigray was one of us. I knew him. Nobody knows the real facts of his little matter. I always believed in the truth of his deposition before the judge. The gendarme whom he brought down with a bullet while he was out shooting was no doubt taking aim at him at the time. A man must defend himself. At all events, Chantigray was a decent fellow. He committed no robbery. As often happens in such cases, the testimony of this poacher sufficed to bring other defenders to Miet's aid. Several workmen also professed to have known Chantigray. Yes, yes, it's true, they all said. He wasn't a thief. There are some scoundrels at Plassan who ought to be sent to prison in his place. Chantigray was our brother. Come now, be calm, little one. Miet had never before heard anyone speak well of her father. He was generally referred to as a beggar, a villain, and now she found good fellows who had forgiving words for him and declared him to be an honest man. She burst into tears, again full of the emotion awakened in her by the Marseillaise, and she bethought herself how she might thank these men for their kindness to her in misfortune. For a moment she conceived the idea of shaking them all by the hand like a man, but her heart suggested something better. By her side stood the insurgent who carried the banner. She touched the staff, and to express her gratitude, said in an entreating tone, Give it to me. I will carry it. The simple-minded workman understood the ingenuous sublimity of this form of gratitude. Yes, they all cried, Chantigray shall carry the banner. However, a woodcutter remarked that she would soon get tired and would not be able to go far. Oh, I'm quite strong, she retorted proudly, tucking up her sleeves and showing a pair of arms as big as those of a grown woman. Then, as they handed her the flag, she resumed, Wait just a moment. Forthwith, she pulled off her cloak and put it on again after turning the red lining outside. In the clear moonlight, she appeared to be arrayed in a purple mantle reaching to her feet. The hood resting on the edge of her chignon formed a kind of Phrygian cap. She took the flag, pressed the staff to her bosom, and held herself upright amid the folds of that blood-colored banner which waved behind her. Enthusiastic child that she was, her countenance with its curly hair, large eyes moist with tears, and lips parted in a smile, seemed to rise with energetic pride as she turned it towards the sky. At that moment, she was the Virgin Liberty. The insurgents burst into applause. The vivid imagination of those Southerners was fired with enthusiasm at the sudden apparition of this girl so nervously clasping their banner to her bosom. Shouts rose from the nearest group. Bravo, Chantigray! Chantigray forever! She shall remain with us. She'll bring us luck. They would have cheered her for a long time yet had not the order to resume the march arrived. When the column moved on, Miette pressed Silver's hand and whispered in his ear, You hear? I shall remain with you. 
Are you glad? Silvere, without replying, returned the pressure. He consented. In fact, he was deeply affected, unable to resist the enthusiasm which fired his companions. Miette seemed to him so lovely, so grand, so saintly. During the whole climb up the hill, he still saw her before him, radiant amidst a purple glory. She was now blended with his other adored mistress, the Republic. He would have liked to be in action already with his gun on his shoulder. But the insurgents moved slowly. They had orders to make as little noise as possible. Thus the column advanced between the rows of elms like some gigantic serpent whose every ring had a strange quivering. The frosty December night had again sunk into silence, and the Viorne alone seemed to roar more loudly. On reaching the first houses of the Faubourg, Silver ran on in front to fetch his gun from the Air saint mitre which he found slumbering in the moonlight. When he again joined the insurgents, they had reached the Porte de Rome. Miette bent towards him, and with her childish smile observed, I feel as if I were at the procession on Corpus Christi Day, carrying the banner of the Virgin. This ends Chapter 1, Part 2. Section 4 of The Fortune of the Rougeon, Book 1 of Rougeon Maca Cycle, by Emile Zola, translated by Henry Bizzitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Mark Leder. Section 4, Chapter 2, Part 1. Plasson is a sub-prefecture with about 10,000 inhabitants. Built on a plateau overlooking the Viorne and resting on the north side against the Garrigue Hills, one of the last spurs of the Alps, the town is situated as it were in the depths of a cul-de-sac. In 1851 it communicated with the adjoining country by two roads only, the Nice Road, which runs down to the east, and the Lyon Road, which rises to the west, the one continuing the other on almost parallel lines. Since that time, a railway has been built which passes to the south of the town, below the hill which descends steeply from the old ramparts to the river. At the present day, on coming out of the station on the right bank of a little torrent, one can see, by raising one's head, the first houses of Plassans, with their gardens disposed in terrace fashion. It is, however, only after an uphill walk, lasting a full quarter of an hour, that one reaches these houses. About twenty years ago, owing, no doubt, to deficient means of communication, there was no town that had more completely retained the pious and aristocratic character of the old Provençal cities. Plassan then had, and has even now, a whole district of large mansions built in the reigns of Louis the Fourteenth and Louis the Fifteenth, a dozen churches, Jesuit and Capuchin houses, and a considerable number of convents. Class distinctions were long perpetuated by the town's divisions into various districts. There were three of them, each forming, as it were, a separate and complete locality with its own churches, promenades, customs, and landscapes. The district of the nobility, called Saint-Marc, after the name of one of its parish churches, is a sort of miniature Versailles, with straight streets overgrown with grass and large square houses which conceal extensive gardens. It extends to the south along the edge of the plateau. Some of the mansions built on the declivity itself have a double row of terraces, whence one can see the whole valley of the Viorne, a most charming vista, most vaunted in that part of the country. Then, on the northwest, the old quarter formed of the original town rears its narrow, tortuous lanes bordered with tottering hovels. The town hall, the civil court, the market, and the gendarmerie barracks are situated here. This, the most populous part of the Plassin, is inhabited by working men and shopkeepers, all the wretched, toiling, common folk. The new town forms a sort of parallelogram to the northeast, 
the well-to-do, those who have slowly amassed a fortune, and those engaged in the liberal professions here occupy houses set out in straight lines and colored a light yellow. This district, which is embellished by the sub-prefecture, an ugly plaster building decorated with rose moldings, numbered scarcely five or six streets in 1851. It is of quite recent formation, and it's only since the construction of the railway that it has been growing in extent. One circumstance, which even at the present time tends to divide Plassans into three distinct independent parts, is that the limits of the districts are clearly defined by the principal thoroughfares. The Cour and the Rue de Rome, which is, as it were, a narrow extension of the former, run from west to east, from the Grand Porte to the Porte de Rome, thus cutting the town into two portions and dividing the quarter of the nobility from the others. The latter are themselves parted by the Rue de la Banne. This street, the finest in the locality, starts from the extremity of the Cour Sauveur and ascends northward, leaving the black masses of the old quarter on its left and the light yellow houses of the new town on its right. It is here, about halfway along the street, that stands the sub-prefecture, in the rear of a small square planted with sickly trees. The people of Plassans are very proud of this edifice. As if to keep more isolated and shut up within itself, the town is belted with old ramparts, which only serve to increase its gloom and render it more confined. These ridiculous fortifications, preyed upon by ivy and crowned with wild gillyflowers, flowers are about as high and as thick as the walls of a convent, and could be demolished by gunshot. They have several openings, the principal of which, the Porte de Rome and the Grand Porte, afford access to the Nice Road and the Lyon Road at the other end of town. Until 1853, these openings were furnished with huge wooden two-leaved gates, arched at the top, and strengthened with bars of iron. These gates were double-locked at 11 o'clock in summer and 10 o'clock in winter. The town, having thus shot its bolts like a timid girl, went quietly to sleep. A keeper, who lived in a little cell in one of the inner corners of each gateway, was authorized to admit belated persons, but it was necessary to stand parleying a long time. The keeper would not let people in until, by the light of his lantern, he had carefully scrutinized their faces through a peephole. If their looks displeased him, they had to sleep outside. This custom of locking the gates every evening was highly characteristic of the spirit of the town, which was a commingling of cowardice, egotism, routine, exclusiveness, and devout longing for a cloistered life. Plassans, when it had shut itself up, would say to itself, I am at home, with the satisfaction of some pious bourgeois who, assured of the safety of his cash box and certain that no noise will disturb him, duly says his prayers and retires gladly to bed. No other town, I believe, has so long persisted in thus incarcerating itself like a nun. The population of Plasson is divided into three groups, corresponding with the same number of districts. Putting aside the functionaries, the sub-prefect, the receiver of taxes, the mortgage commissioner, and the postmaster, who are all strangers to the locality, where they are objects of envy rather than of esteem, and who live after their own fashion. The real inhabitants, those who were born there and have every intention of ending their days there, feel too much respect for traditional usages and established boundaries not to pen themselves of their own accord in one or other of the town's social divisions. The nobility virtually cloister themselves. Since the fall of Charles X, they scarcely ever go out, and when they do, they are eager to return to their large, dismal mansions and walk along furtively as though they were in a hostile country. They do not visit anyone, nor do they even receive each other. Their drawing rooms are frequented by a few priests only. They spend the summer in the chateau, which they possess in the environs. In the winter, they sit round their firesides. They are, as it were, dead people weary of life. And thus, the gloomy silence of a cemetery hangs over their quarter of the town. 
The doors and windows are carefully barricaded. One would think their mansions were so many convents shut off from all the tumult of the world. At rare intervals, an abbey, whose measured tread adds to the gloomy silence of these sealed homes, passes by and glides like a shadow through some half-opened doorway. The well-to-do people, the retired tradesmen, the lawyers and notaries, all those of a little easy-going, ambitious world that inhabits the new town, endeavor to infuse some liveliness into Plassans. They go to the parties given by the sub-prefect and dream of giving similar entertainments. They eagerly seek popularity, call a workman, my good fellow, chat with the peasants about the harvest, read the papers, and walk out with their wives on Sundays. Theirs are the enlightened minds of the district. They are the only persons who venture to speak disparagingly of the ramparts. In fact, they have several times demanded of the authorities the demolition of those old walls, relics of a former age. At the same time, the most skeptical among them experience a shock of delight whenever a marquis or a count deigns to honor them with a stiff salutation. Indeed, the dream of every citizen of the new town is to be admitted to a drawing room of a San Marc quarter. They know very well that their ambition is not attainable, and it is this which makes them proclaim all the louder that they are free thinkers. But they are free thinkers in words only. Firm friends of the authorities, they are ready to rush into the arms of the first deliverer at the slightest indication of popular discontent. The group which toils and vegetates in the old quarter is not so clearly defined as the others. The laboring classes are here in a majority, but retail dealers and even a few wholesale traders are to be found among them. As a matter of fact, Plassan is far from being a commercial center. There's only just sufficient trade to dispose of the products of the country, oil, wine, and almonds. As for industrial labor, it is represented almost entirely by three or four evil-smelling tan yards, a felt hat manufactory, and some soap-boiling works, which last are relegated to a corner of the Faubourg. This little commercial and industrial world, though it may on high days and holidays visit the people of the new district, generally takes up its quarters among the operatives of the old town. Merchants, retail traders, and artisans have common interests which unite them together. On Sundays only, the masters make themselves spruce and foregather apart. On the other hand, the laboring classes, which constitute scarcely a fifth of the population, mingle with the idlers of the district. It is only once a week, and during the fine weather, that the three districts of Plassan come together, face to face. The whole town repairs to the Cour Sauveur on Sunday after Vespers. Even the nobility venture thither. Three distinct currents flow along this sort of boulevard planted with rows of plane trees. The well-to-do citizens of the new quarter merely pass along before quitting the town by the Grand Porte and taking the Avenue du Mai on the right, where they walk up and down till nightfall. Meanwhile, the nobility and the lower classes share the Cour Sauveur between them. For more than a century past, the nobility have selected the walk on the south side, which is bordered with large mansions, and is the first to escape the heat of the sun. The lower classes have to rest content with the walk on the north, where the cafes, inns, and tobacconist shops are located. The people and the nobility promenade the whole afternoon, walking up and down the cour without any one of either party thinking of changing sides. They are only separated by a distance of some seven or eight yards, yet it is as if they were a thousand leagues away from each other, for they scrupulously follow those two parallel lines as though they must not come in contact here below. Even during the revolutionary periods, each party kept to its own side. This regulation walk on Sunday and the locking of the town gates in the evening are analogous instances which suffice to indicate the character of the 10,000 people inhabiting the town. Here, amidst these surroundings, until the year 1848, there vegetated an obscure family that enjoyed little esteem, 
but whose head, Pierre Rougeon, subsequently played an important part in life owing to certain circumstances. Pierre Rougeon was the son of a peasant. His mother's family, the Fouquet, owned towards the end of the last century a large plot of ground in the Faubourg behind the old cemetery of saint mitre This ground was subsequently joined to the Jacques Meffrin. The Fouquet were the richest market gardeners in that part of the country. They supplied an entire district of Plassans with vegetables. However, their name died out a few years before the revolution. Only one girl, Adelaide, remained. Born in 1768, she had become an orphan at the age of 18. This girl, whose father had died insane, was a long, lank, pale creature, with a scared look and strange ways which one might have taken for shyness so long as she was a little girl. As she grew up, however, she became still stranger. She did certain things which were inexplicable even to the cleverest folk of the Faubourg, and from that time it was rumored that she was cracked like her father. She had scarcely been an orphan six months, in possession of a fortune which rendered her an eagerly sought heiress, when it transpired that she'd married a young gardener named Rougeon, a rough-hewn peasant from the Basse Alpes. This Rougeon, after the death of the last of the male Fouquet, which had engaged him for a term, had remained in the service of the deceased's daughter. From the situation of salaried servant, he ascended rapidly to the enviable position of husband. This marriage was a first shock to public opinion. No one could comprehend why Adelaide preferred this poor fellow, coarse, heavy, vulgar, scarce able to speak French, to those other young men, sons of well-to-do farmers, who'd been seen hovering round her for some time. And, as provincial people do not allow anything to remain unexplained, they made sure there was some mystery at the bottom of this affair, alleging even that the marriage of the two young people had become an absolute necessity. But events proved the falsity of the accusation. More than a year went by before Adelaide had a son. The Faubourg was annoyed. It could not admit that it was wrong, and determined to penetrate the supposed mystery. Accordingly, all the gossips kept a watch upon the Rougeon. They soon found ample matter for tittle-tattle. Rougeon died almost suddenly, fifteen months after his marriage, from a sunstroke received one afternoon while he was weeding a bed of carrots. Scarcely a year then elapsed, before the young widow caused unheard of scandal. It became known as an indisputable fact that she had a lover. She did not appear to make any secret of it. Several persons asserted that they heard her use endearing terms in public to poor Rougeon's successor. Scarcely a year of widowhood and a lover already. Such a disregard of propriety seemed monstrous out of all reason and the scandal was heightened by Adelaide's strange choice. At that time there dwelt at the end of the impasse Saint-Mitre, in a hovel the back of which abutted on the Fouquet's land, a man of bad repute, who was generally referred to as that scoundrel Macquart. This man would vanish for weeks and then turn up some fine evening, sauntering about with his hands in his pockets and whistling as though he'd just come from a short walk and the women sitting at their doorsteps as he passed. There's that scoundrel McCart. He's hidden his bales and his gun in some hollow of the Viorne. The truth was, McCart had no means, and yet ate and drank like a happy drone during his short sojourns in the town. He drank copiously and with fierce obstinacy. Seating himself alone at a table in some tavern, he would linger there evening after evening, with his eyes stupidly fixed on his glass, neither seeing nor hearing anything around him. When the landlord closed his establishment, he would retire with a firm step, with his head raised as if he were kept yet more erect by inebriation. McCart walked so straight, he's surely dead drunk, people used to say, as they saw him going home. Usually, when he had had no drink, he walked with a slight stoop, and shunned the gaze of curious people with a kind of savage shyness. 
Since the death of his father, a journeyman tanner who had left him his sole heritage, the hovel in the Impasse Saint-Mitre, he'd never been known to have either relatives or friends. The proximity of the frontiers and the neighboring forests of the Say had turned this singular, lazy fellow into a combination of smuggler and poacher, one of those suspicious-looking characters of whom passers-by observe, I shouldn't care to meet that man at midnight in the dark wood. Tall, with a formidable beard and lean face, Macquart was the terror of the good women of the Faubourg of Poisson. They actually accused him of devouring little children raw. Though he was hardly thirty years old, he looked fifty. Amidst his bushy beard and malocks of hair which hung over his face in poodle fashion, one could only distinguish the gleam of his brown eyes, the furtive sorrowful glance of a man of vagrant instincts, rendered vicious by wine and a pariah life. Although no crimes had actually been brought home to him, no theft or murder was ever perpetrated in the district without suspicion at once falling upon him. And it was this ogre, this brigand, this scoundrel Macart, whom Adelaide had chosen. In twenty months, she had two children by him, first a boy and then a girl. There was no question of marriage between them. Never had the Faubourg beheld such audacious impropriety. The stupefaction was so great, the idea of Macart having found a young and wealthy mistress so completely upset the gossips, that they even spoke gently of Adelaide. Poor thing, she's gone quite mad, they would say. If she had any relatives, she would have been placed in confinement long ago. And as they never knew anything of the history of those strange amours, they accused that rogue Macart of having taken advantage of Adelaide's weak mind to rob her of her money. The legitimate son, little Pierre Rougeon, grew up with his mother's other offspring. The latter, Antoine and Ursule, the young wolves as they were called in the district, were kept at home by Adelaide, who treated them as affectionately as a first child. She did not appear to entertain a very clear idea of the position in life reserved for these two poor creatures. To her, they were the same in every respect as her firstborn. She would sometimes go out holding Pierre with one hand and Antoine with the other, never noticing how differently the two little fellows were already regarded. It was a strange home. For nearly twenty years everyone lived there after his or her fancy, the children like the mother. Everything went on free from control. In growing to womanhood, Adelaide had retained the strangeness which had been taken for shyness when she was fifteen. It was not that she was insane, as the people of the Faubourg asserted, but there was a lack of equilibrium between her nerves and her blood, a disorder of the brain and heart which made her lead a life out of the ordinary, different from that of the rest of the world. She was certainly very natural, very consistent with herself, but in the eyes of the neighbors her consistency became pure insanity. She seemed desirous of making herself conspicuous. It was thought that she was wickedly determined to turn things at home from bad to worse, whereas with great naivete she simply acted according to the impulses of her nature. Ever since giving birth to her first child, she'd been subject to nervous fits, which brought on terrible convulsions. These fits recurred periodically, every two or three months. The doctors whom she consulted declared they could do nothing for her, that age would weaken the severity of the attacks. They simply prescribed a dietary regimen of underdone meat and quinine wine. However, these repeated shocks led to cerebral disorder. She lived on from day to day like a child, like a fawning animal yielding to its instincts. When Macart was on his rounds, she passed her time in lazy, pensive idleness. All she did for her children was to kiss and play with them, and as soon as her lover returned, she would disappear. Behind Macquart's hovel, there was a little yard separated from the Fouquet's property by a wall. One morning, the neighbors were much astonished to find in this wall a door which had not been there the previous evening. 
Before an hour had elapsed, the entire Faubourg had flocked to the neighboring windows. The lovers must have worked the whole night to pierce the opening and place the door there. They could now go freely from one house to the other. The scandal was revived. Everyone felt less pity for Adelaide, who was certainly the disgrace of the suburb. She was reproached more wrathfully for that door, that tacit, brutal admission of her union, than even for her two illegitimate children. People should at least study appearances, the most tolerant women would say. But Adelaide did not understand what was meant by studying appearances. She was very happy, very proud of her door. She had assisted Macaw to knock the stones from the wall and had even mixed the mortar so that the work might proceed the quicker. And she came with childish delight to inspect the work by daylight on the morrow, an act which was deemed a climax of shamelessness by three gossips who observed her contemplating the masonry. From that date, whenever Macaw reappeared, it was thought, as no one then ever saw the young woman, that she was living with him in the hovel of the impasse Saint-Mitre. The smuggler would come very irregularly, almost always unexpectedly, to Plassans. Nobody ever knew what life the lovers led during the two or three days he spent there at distant intervals. They used to shut themselves up. The little dwelling seemed uninhabited. Then, as the gossips had declared that Macaw had simply seduced Adelaide in order to spend her money, they were astonished after a time to see him still lead his wanted life, ever uphill and downdale and as badly equipped as previously. Perhaps the young woman loved him all the more for seeing him at rare intervals. Perhaps he had disregarded her entreaties, feeling an irresistible desire for a life of adventure. The gossips invented a thousand fables, without succeeding in giving any reasonable explanation of a connection which had originated and continued in so strange a manner. The hovel in the impasse Saint-Mitre remained closed and preserved its secrets. It was merely guessed that Macar had probably acquired the habit of beating Adelaide, although the sound of a quarrel never issued from the house. However, on several occasions she was seen with her face black and blue and her hair torn away. At the same time, she did not display the least dejection or grief, nor did she seek in any way to hide her bruises. She smiled and seemed happy. No doubt she allowed herself to be beaten without breathing a word. This existence lasted for more than fifteen years. At times, when Adelaide returned home, she'd find her house upside down, but would not take the least notice of it. She was utterly ignorant of the practical meaning of life, of the proper value of things and the necessity for order. She let her children grow up like those plum trees which sprout along the highways at the pleasure of the rain and sun. They bore their natural fruits like wild stock which has never known grafting or pruning. Never was nature allowed such complete sway. Never did such mischievous creatures grow up more freely under the sole influence of instinct. They rolled among the vegetables, passed their days in the open air playing and fighting like good-for-nothing urchins. They stole provisions from the house and pillaged the few fruit trees in the enclosure. They were the plundering, squalling, familiar demons of this strange abode of lucid insanity. When their mother was absent for days together, they'd make such an uproar and hit upon such diabolical devices for annoying people that the neighbors had to threaten them with a whipping. Moreover, Adelaide did not inspire them with much fear. If they were less obnoxious to other people when she was at home, it was because they made her their victim shirking school five or six times a week and doing everything they could to receive some punishment which would allow them to squall to their heart's content. But she never beat them, nor even lost her temper. She lived on very well, placidly, indolently, in a state of mental abstraction amidst all the uproar. At last, indeed, this uproar became indispensable to her to fill the void in her brain. She smiled complacently when she heard anyone say, Her children will beat her someday, and it'll serve her right. 
To all remarks, her utter indifference seemed to reply, What does it matter? She troubled even less about her property than about her children. The Fouquet's enclosure, during the many years that this singular existence lasted, would have become a piece of waste ground if the young woman had not luckily entrusted the cultivation of her vegetables to a clever market gardener. This man, who was to share the profits with her, robbed her impudently, though she never noticed it. The circumstance had its advantages, however, for in order to steal the more, the gardener drew as much as possible from the land which in the result almost doubled in value. Pierre, the legitimate son, either from secret instinct or from his knowledge of the different manner in which he and the others were regarded by the neighbors, domineered over his brother and sister from an early age. In their quarrels, although he was much weaker than Antoine, he always got the better of the contest, beating the other with all the authority of a master. With regard to Ursule, a poor, puny, wan little creature, she was handled with equal roughness by both the boys. Indeed, until they were fifteen or sixteen, the three children fraternally beat each other without understanding their vague mutual hatred, without realizing how foreign they were to one another. It was only in youth that they found themselves face to face with definite self-conscious personalities. At sixteen, Antoine was a tall fellow, a blend of Macart's and Adelaide's failings. Macart, however, predominated in him with his love of vagrancy, his tendency to drunkenness, and his brutish savagery. At the same time, under the influence of Adelaide's nervous nature, the vices which in the father assumed a kind of sanguinary frankness were in the son tinged with an artfulness full of hypocrisy and cowardice. Antoine resembled his mother by his total want of dignified will, by his effeminate, voluptuous egotism, which disposed him to accept any bed of infamy provided he could lounge upon it at his ease and sleep warmly in it. People said of him, Ah, the brigand, he hasn't even the courage of his villainy like Macar. If ever he commits a murder, it will be with pinpricks. Physically, Antoine inherited Adelaide's thick lips only. His other features resembled those of the smuggler, but they were softer and more prone to change of expression. In Ursule, on the other hand, physical and moral resemblance to the mother predominated. There was a mixture of certain characteristics in her also, but born the last at a time when Adelaide's love was warmer than Macart's, the poor little thing seemed to have received with her sex a deeper impress of her mother's temperament. Moreover, hers was not a fusion of the two natures, but rather a juxtaposition, a remarkably close soldering. Ursula was whimsical and displayed at times the shyness, the melancholy, and the transports of a pariah. Then she would often break out into nervous fits of laughter and muse lazily, like a woman unsound both in head and heart. Her eyes, which at times had a scared expression like those of Adelaide, were as limpid as crystal, similar to those of kittens doomed to die of consumption. In presence of those two illegitimate children, Pierre seemed a stranger. To one who had not penetrated to the roots of his being, he would have appeared profoundly dissimilar. Never did child's nature show a more equal balance of the characteristics of its parents. He was the exact mean between the peasant Rougeon and the nervous Adelaide. Paternal grossness was attenuated by the maternal influence. One found in him the first phase of that evolution of temperaments which ultimately brings about the amelioration or deterioration of a race. Although he was still a peasant, his skin was less coarse, his face less heavy, his intellect more capacious and more supple. In him, the defects of his father and his mother had advantageously reacted upon each other. If Adelaide's nature, rendered exquisitely sensitive by her rebellious nerves, had combated and lessened Rougeau's full-bodied ponderosity, 
The latter had successfully prevented the young woman's tendency to cerebral disorder from being implanted in the child. Pierre knew neither the passions nor the sickly ravings of Macart's young whelps. Very badly brought up, unruly and noisy like all children who are not restrained during their infancy, he nevertheless possessed at bottom such sense and intelligence as would always preserve him from perpetrating any unproductive folly. His vices, his laziness, his appetite for indulgence lacked the instinctiveness which characterized Antoine's. He meant to cultivate and gratify them honorably and openly. In his plump person of medium height, in his long pale face, in which the features derived from his father had acquired some of the maternal refinement, one could already detect signs of sly and crafty ambition and insatiable desire, with the hardness of heart and envious hatred of a peasant son whom his mother's means and nervous temperament had turned into a member of the middle classes. When, at the age of seventeen, Pierre observed and was able to understand Adelaide's disorders, and the singular position of Antoine and Ursule, he seemed neither sorry nor indignant, but simply worried as to the course which would best serve his own interests. He was the only one of the three children who had pursued his studies with any industry. When a peasant begins to feel the need of instruction, he most frequently becomes a fierce calculator. At school, Pierre's playmates roused his first suspicions by the manner in which they treated and hooted his brother. Later on, he came to understand the significance of many looks and words. And at last, he clearly saw that the house was being pillaged. From that time forward, he regarded Antoine and Ursule as shameless parasites, mouths that were devouring his own substance. Like the people of the Faubourg, he thought that his mother was a fit subject for a lunatic asylum, and feared that she would end by squandering all her money if he did not take steps to prevent it. What gave him the finishing stroke was the dishonesty of the gardener who cultivated the land. At this, in one day, the unruly child was transformed into a thrifty, selfish lad, hurriedly matured, as regards his instincts, by the strange, improvident life which he could no longer bear to see around him without a feeling of anguish. Those vegetables, from the sale of which the market gardener derived the largest profits, really belonged to him. The wine which his mother's offspring drank, the bread they ate, also belonged to him. The whole house, the entire fortune, was his by right, according to his boorish logic. He alone, the legitimate son, was the heir. And as his riches were in danger, as everybody was greedily gnawing at his future fortune, he sought a means of turning them all out. Mother, brother, sister, servants, and of succeeding immediately to his inheritance. The conflict was a cruel one. The lad knew that he must first strike his mother. Step by step, with patient tenacity, he executed a plan whose every detail he had long previously thought out. His tactics were to appear before Adelaide like a living reproach. Not that he flew into a passion or upbraided her for her misconduct, but he had acquired a certain manner of looking at her without saying a word which terrified her. Whenever she returned from a short sojourn in Macart's hovel, she could not turn her eyes on her son without a shudder. She felt his cold glances, as sharp as steel blades, pierce her deeply and pitilessly. The severe, taciturn demeanor of the child of the man whom she had so soon forgotten strangely troubled her poor, disordered brain. She would fancy at times that Rougon had risen from the dead to punish her for her dissoluteness. Every week she fell into one of those nervous fits which were shattering her constitution. She was left to struggle until she recovered consciousness, after which she would creep about more feebly than ever. She would also often sob the whole night long, holding her head in her hands and accepting the wounds that Pierre dealt her with resignation, as if they'd been the strokes of an avenging deity. At other times she repudiated him. 
She would not acknowledge her own flesh and blood in that heavy-faced lad, whose calmness chilled her own feverishness so painfully. She would a thousand times rather have been beaten than glared at like that. Those implacable looks which followed her everywhere threw her at last into such unbearable torments that on several occasions she determined to see her lover no more. As soon, however, as Macart returned, she forgot her vows and hastened to him. The conflict with her son began afresh, silent and terrible, when she came back home. At the end of a few months she fell completely under his sway. She stood before him like a child doubtful of her behavior, and fearing that she deserves a whipping. Pierre had skillfully bound her hand and foot, and made a very submissive servant of her, without opening his lips, without once entering into difficult and compromising explanations. This ends Chapter 2, Part 1. Section 5 of The Fortune of the Rougeon, Book 1 of Rougeon Maca Cycle, by Emile Zola, translated by Henry Vizitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Mark Leder. Section 5, Chapter 2, Part 2. When the young man felt that his mother was in his power, that he could treat her like a slave, he began in his own interest to turn her cerebral weakness and the foolish terror with which his glances inspired her to his own advantage. His first care, as soon as he was master at home, was to dismiss the market gardener and replace him by one of his own creatures. Then he took upon himself the supreme direction of the household, selling, buying, and holding the cash box. On the other hand, he made no attempt to regulate Adelaide's actions or to correct Antoine and Ursule for their laziness. That mattered little to him, for he counted upon getting rid of these people as soon as an opportunity presented itself. He contented himself with portioning out their bread and water. Then, having already got all the property in his own hands, he awaited an event which would permit him to dispose of it as he pleased. Circumstances proved singularly favorable. He escaped the conscription on the ground of being a widow's eldest son. But two years later, Antoine was called out. His bad luck did not affect him much. He counted on his mother purchasing a substitute for him. Adelaide, in fact, wished to save him from serving. Pierre, however, who held the money, turned a deaf ear to her. His brother's compulsory departure would be a lucky event for him, and greatly assist the accomplishment of his plans. When his mother mentioned the matter to him, he gave her such a look that she did not venture to pursue it. His glance plainly signified, Do you wish then to ruin me for the sake of your illegitimate offspring? Forthwith, she selfishly abandoned Antoine, for before everything else she sought her own peace and quietness. Pierre, who did not like violent measures, and who rejoiced at being able to eject his brother without a disturbance, then played the part of a man in despair. The year had been a bad one, money was scarce, and to raise any he would be compelled to sell a portion of the land, which would be the beginning of their ruin. Then he pledged his word of honor to Antoine that he would buy him out the following year, though he meant to do nothing of the kind. Antoine then went off, duped and half-satisfied. Pierre got rid of Ursule in a still more unexpected manner. A journeyman hatter of the Faubourg, named Moray, conceived a real affection for the girl, whom he thought as white and delicate as any young lady from the Saint-Marc quarter. He married her. On his part, it was a love match, free from all sordid motives. As for Ursule, she accepted the marriage in order to escape a home where her eldest brother rendered life intolerable. Her mother, absorbed in her own courses and using her remaining energy to defend her own particular interests, regarded the matter with absolute indifference. She was even glad of Ursule's departure from the house, 
hoping that Pierre, now that he had no further cause for dissatisfaction, would let her live in peace after her own fashion. No sooner had the young people been married than Moray perceived that he would have to quit Plessant if he did not wish to hear endless disparaging remarks about his wife and his mother-in-law. Taking Ursule with him, he accordingly repaired to Marseilles, where he worked at his trade. It should be mentioned that he had not asked for one sou of dowry. When Pierre, somewhat surprised by this disinterestedness, commenced to stammer out some explanations, Moray closed his mouth by saying that he preferred to earn his wife's bread. Nevertheless, the worthy son of the peasant remained uneasy. Moray's indifference seemed to him to conceal some trap. Adelaide now remained to be disposed of. Nothing in the world would have induced Pierre to live with her any longer. She was compromising him. It was with her that he would have liked to make a start. But he found himself between two very embarrassing alternatives. To keep her and thus in a measure share her disgrace and bind a fetter to his feet which would arrest him in his ambitious flight or to turn her out, with the certainty of being pointed at as a bad son, which would have robbed him of the reputation for good nature which he desired. Knowing that he would be in want of everybody, he desired to secure an untarnished name throughout Plassans. There was but one method to adopt, namely to induce Adelaide to leave of her own accord. Pierre neglected nothing to accomplish this end. He considered his mother's misconduct a sufficient excuse for his own hard-heartedness. He punished her as one would chastise a child. The tables were turned. The poor woman cowered under the stick which, figuratively, was constantly held over her. She was scarcely forty-two years old and already had the stammerings of terror and vague, pitiful looks of an old woman in her dotage. Her son continued to stab her with his piercing glances, hoping that she would run away when her courage was exhausted. The unfortunate woman suffered terribly from shame, restrained desire, and enforced cowardice, receiving the blows dealt her with passive resignation, and nevertheless returning to Macar with the determination to die on the spot rather than submit. There were nights when she would have got out of bed and thrown herself into the Viorne, if with her weak, nervous nature she had not felt the greatest fear of death. On several occasions she thought of running away and joining her lover on the frontier. It was only because she did not know whither to go that she remained in the house, submitting to her son's contemptuous silence and secret brutality. Pierre divined that she would have left long ago if she had only had a refuge. He was waiting an opportunity to take a little apartment for her somewhere, when a fortuitous occurrence, which he had not ventured to anticipate, abruptly brought about the realization of his desires. Information reached the Faubourg that Macart had just been killed on the frontier by a shot from a custom house officer at the moment when he was endeavoring to smuggle a load of Geneva watches into France. The story was true. The smuggler's body was not even brought home, but was interred in the cemetery of a little mountain village. Adelaide's grief plunged her into stupor. Her son, who watched her curiously, did not see her shed a tear. Her cart had made her soul legatee. She inherited his hovel in the impasse Saint-Mitre and his carbine, which a fellow smuggler, braving the balls of the custom house officers, loyally brought back to her. On the following day she retired to the little house, hung the carbine above the mantelpiece, and lived there, estranged from all the world, solitary and silent. Pierre was at last sole master of the house. The Fouquet's land belonged to him in fact, if not in law. He never thought of establishing himself on it, it was too narrow a field for his ambition. To till the ground and cultivate vegetables seemed to him boorish, unworthy of his faculties. He was in a hurry to divest himself of everything recalling the peasant. 
With his nature refined by his mother's nervous temperament, he felt an irresistible longing for the enjoyments of the middle classes. In all his calculations, therefore, he had regarded the sale of the Fouquet's property as the final consummation. This sale, by placing a round sum of money in his hands, would enable him to marry the daughter of some merchant who would take him into partnership. At this period, the wars of the First Empire were greatly thinning the ranks of eligible young men. Parents were not so fastidious as previously in the choice of a son-in-law. Pierre persuaded himself that money would smooth all difficulties and that the gossip of the Faubourg would be overlooked. He intended to pose as a victim, as an honest man suffering from a family disgrace, which he deplored, without being soiled by it or excusing it. For several months already he had cast his eyes on a certain Felicité Puech, the daughter of an oil dealer. The firm of Puech and Lacan, whose warehouses were in one of the darkest lanes of the old quarter, was far from prosperous. It enjoyed but doubtful credit in the market, and people talked vaguely of bankruptcy. It was precisely in consequence of these evil reports that Pierre turned his batteries in this direction. No well-to-do trader would have given him his daughter. He meant to appear on the scene at the very moment when old Puesh should no longer know which way to turn. He would then purchase Felicité of him and re-establish the credit of the house by his own energy and intelligence. It was a clever expedient for ascending the first rung of the social ladder, for raising himself above his station. Above all things, he wished to escape from that frightful faubourg where everybody reviled his family and to obliterate all these foul legends by effacing even the very name of the Fouquet's enclosure. For that reason, the filthy streets of the old quarter seemed to him perfect paradise. There only he would be able to change his skin. The moment which he had been awaiting soon arrived. The firm of Puech and Lacan seemed to be at the last gasp. The young man then negotiated the match with prudent skill. He was received, if not as a deliverer, at least as a necessary and acceptable expedient. The marriage agreed upon, he turned his attention to the sale of the ground. The owner of the Jasmefrain, desiring to enlarge his estate, had made him repeated offers. A low, thin party wall alone separated the two estates. Pierre speculated on the eagerness of his wealthy neighbor, who, to gratify his caprice, offered as much as 50,000 francs for the land. It was double its value. Pierre whoever, with the craftiness of a peasant, pulled a long face and said that he did not care to sell, that his mother would never consent to get rid of the property where the Fouquets had lived from father to son for nearly two centuries. But all the time that he was seemingly holding back, he was really making preparations for the sale. Certain doubts had arisen in his mind. According to his own brutal logic, the property belonged to him. He had the right to dispose of it as he chose. Beneath this assurance, however, he had vague presentments of legal complications. So he indirectly consulted a lawyer of the Faubourg. He learned some fine things from him. According to the lawyer, his hands were completely tied. His mother alone could alienate the property, and he doubted whether she would. But what he did not know... What came as a heavy blow to him was that Ursule and Antoine, those young wolves, had claims on the estate. What? They would despoil him? Rob him? The legitimate child? The lawyer's explanations were clear and precise, however. Adelaide, it is true, had married Rougeon under the common property system. But as the whole fortune consisted of land, the young woman, according to law, again came into possession of everything at her husband's death. Moreover, Macart and Adelaide had duly acknowledged their children when declaring their birth for registration, and thus these children were entitled to inherit from their mother. For sole consolation, Pierre learnt that the law reduced the share of illegitimate children in favor of the others. 
This, however, did not console him at all. He wanted to have everything. He would not have shared ten sous with Ursule and Antoine. This vista of the intricacies of the code opened up a new horizon, which he scanned with a singularly thoughtful air. He soon recognized that a shrewd man must always keep the law on his side, and this is what he devised without consulting anyone, even the lawyer whose suspicions he was afraid of arousing. He knew how to turn his mother round his finger. One fine morning he took her to a notary and made her sign a deed of sale. Provided she were left the hovel in the impasse saint mitre Adelaide would have sold all Plassan. Besides, Pierre assured her an annual income of 600 francs and made the most solemn promises to watch over his brother and sister. This oath satisfied the good woman. She recited before the notary the lesson which it had pleased her son to teach her. On the following day, the young man made her place her name at the foot of a document in which she acknowledged having received 50,000 francs as the price of the property. This was his stroke of genius, the act of a rogue. He contented himself with telling his mother, who was a little surprised at signing such a receipt when she had not seen a centime of the 50,000 francs, that it was a pure formality of no consequence whatever. As he slipped the paper into his pocket, he thought to himself, Now, let the young wolves ask me to render an account. I'll tell them the old woman has squandered everything. They'll never dare to go to law with me about it. A week afterwards, the party wall no longer existed. A plough had turned up the vegetable beds. The Fouquet's enclosure, in accordance with young Rougeon's wish, was about to become a thing of the past. A few months later, the owner of the Jachemefrain even had the old market gardener's house, which was falling to pieces, pulled down. When Pierre had secured the 50,000 francs, he married Félicité Puech with as little delay as possible. Félicité was a short, dark woman such as one often meets in Provence. She looked like one of those brown, lean, noisy grasshoppers which in their sudden leaps often strike their heads against the almond trees. Thin, flat-breasted, with pointed shoulders and a face like that of a polecat, her features singularly sunken and attenuated. It was not easy to tell her age. She looked as near fifteen as thirty, although she was in reality only nineteen, four years younger than her husband. There was much feline slyness in the depths of her little black eyes, which suggested gimlet holes. Her low, bumpy forehead, her slightly depressed nose with delicate quivering nostrils, her thin red lips and prominent chin parted from her cheeks by strange hollows, all suggested the countenance of an artful dwarf, a living mask of intrigue, an active, envious ambition. With all her ugliness, however, Felicité possessed a sort of gracefulness which rendered her seductive. People said of her that she could be pretty or ugly as she pleased. It would depend on the fashion in which she tied her magnificent hair, but it depended still more on the triumphant smile which illumined her golden complexion when she thought she'd got the better of somebody. Born under an evil star, and believing herself ill-used by fortune, she was generally content to appear an ugly creature. She did not, however, intend to abandon the struggle, for she had vowed that she would some day make the whole town burst with envy by an insolent display of happiness and luxury. Had she been able to act her part on a more spacious stage, where full play would have been allowed her ready wit, she would have quickly brought her dream to pass. Her intelligence was far superior to that of the girls of her own station and education. Evil tongues asserted that her mother, who had died a few years after she was born, had, during the early period of her married life, been familiar with the Marquise de Carnavan, a young nobleman of the Saint-Marc quarter. In fact, Felicité had the hands and feet of a marchioness, and in this respect did not appear to belong to that class of workers from which she was descended. 
Her marriage with Pierre Rougeon, that semi-peasant, that man of the Faubourg, whose family was in such bad odor, kept the old quarter in a state of astonishment for more than a month. She let people gossip, however, receiving the stiff congratulations of her friends with strange smiles. Her calculations had been made. She had chosen Rougeon for a husband as one would choose an accomplice. Her father, in accepting the young man, had merely had eyes for the 50,000 francs which were to save him from bankruptcy. Felicité, however, was more keen-sighted. She looked into the future and felt that she would be in want of a robust man, even if he were somewhat rustic, behind whom she might conceal herself and whose limbs she would move at will. She entertained a deliberate hatred for the insignificant little exquisites of provincial towns, the lean herd of notaries' clerks and prospective barristers who stand shivering with cold while waiting for clients. Having no dowry, and despairing of ever marrying a rich merchant's son, she by far preferred a peasant whom she could use as a passive tool to some lank graduate who would overwhelm her with his academical superiority and drag her about all her life in search of hollow vanities. She was of opinion that the woman ought to make the man. She believed herself capable of carving a minister out of a cowherd. That which had attracted her in Rougeon was his broad chest, his heavy frame, which was not altogether wanting in elegance. A man thus built would bear with ease and sprightliness the massive intrigues which she dreamt of placing on his shoulders. However, while she appreciated her husband's strength and vigor, she also perceived that he was far from being a fool. Under his coarse flesh she had divined the cunning suppleness of his mind. Still, she was a long way from really knowing her Rougeon. She thought him far stupider than he was. A few days after her marriage, as she was by chance fumbling in the drawer of a secretaire, she came across the receipt for 50,000 francs which Adelaide had signed. At sight of it, she understood things and felt rather frightened. Her own natural average honesty rendered her hostile to such expedients. Her terror, however, was not unmixed with admiration. Rougeon became in her eyes a very smart fellow. The young couple bravely sought to conquer fortune. The firm of Puech and Lacan was not, after all, so embarrassed as Pierre had thought. Its liabilities were small. It was merely in want of ready money. In the provinces, Traders adopt prudent courses to save them from serious disasters. Puech and Lacan were prudent to an excessive degree. They never risked a thousand crowns without the greatest fear, and thus their house, a veritable whole, was an unimportant one. The 50,000 francs that Pierre brought into it sufficed to pay the debts and extend the business. The beginnings were good. During three successive years, the olive harvest was an abundant one. Felicité, by a bold stroke which absolutely frightened both Pierre and old Puech, made them purchase a considerable quantity of oil which they stored in their warehouse. During the following years, as the young woman had foreseen, the crops failed, and a considerable rise in prices having set in, they realized large profits by selling out their stock. A short time after this haul, Puech and Lecomte retired from the firm, content with the few sous they had just secured and ambitious of living on their incomes. The young couple now had sole control of the business and thought that they had at last laid the foundation of their fortune. You have vanquished my ill luck, Felicité would sometimes say to her husband. One of the rare weaknesses of her energetic nature was to believe herself stricken by misfortune. Hitherto, so she asserted, nothing had been successful with either herself or her father, in spite of all their efforts. Goaded by her southern superstition, she prepared to struggle with fate as one struggles with somebody who's endeavoring to strangle one. Circumstances soon justified her apprehensions in a singular manner. Ill luck returned inexorably. Every year some fresh disaster shook Rougeon's business. 
A bankruptcy resulted in the loss of a few thousand francs. His estimates of crops proved incorrect. Through the most incredible circumstances, the safest speculations collapsed miserably. It was a truceless, merciless combat. You see, I was born under an unlucky star, Felicite would bitterly exclaim. And yet she struggled furiously, not understanding how it was that she, who had shown such keen scent in a first speculation, could now only give her husband the most deplorable advice. Pierre, dejected and less tenacious than herself, would have gone into liquidation a score of times it had not been for his wife's firm obstinacy. She longed to be rich. She perceived that her ambition could only be attained by fortune. As soon as they possessed a few hundred thousand francs, they would be masters of the town. She would get her husband appointed to an important post, and she would govern. It was not the attainment of honors which troubled her. She felt herself marvelously well armed for such a combat. But she could do nothing to get together the first few bags of money which were needed. Though the ruling of men caused her no apprehensions, she felt a sort of impotent rage at the thought of those inert, white, cold, five-franc pieces over which her intriguing spirit had no power and which obstinately resisted her. The battle lasted for more than thirty years. The death of Puesh proved another heavy blow. Felicité, who had counted upon an inheritance of about 40,000 francs, found that the selfish old man, in order to indulge himself in his old age, had sunk all his money in a life annuity. The discovery made her quite ill. She was gradually becoming soured. She was growing more lean and harsh. To see her from morning till night whirling around the jars of oil, one would have thought she believed that she could stimulate the sails by continually flitting about like a restless fly. Her husband, on the contrary, became heavier. Misfortune fattened him, making him duller and more indolent. These thirty years of combat did not, however, bring him to ruin. At each annual stock-taking, they managed to make both ends meet fairly well. If they suffered any loss during one season, they recouped themselves the next. However, it was precisely this living from hand to mouth which exasperated Felicite. She would by far have preferred a big failure. They would then perhaps have been able to commence life over again instead of obstinately persisting in their petty business, working themselves to death to gain the bare necessaries of life. During one-third of a century, they did not save 50,000 francs. It should be mentioned that, from the very first years of their married life, they had a numerous family, which in the long run became a heavy burden to them. In the course of five years, from 1811 to 1815, Felicité gave birth to three boys. Then, during the four ensuing years, she presented her husband with two girls— these had but an indifferent welcome. Daughters are a terrible embarrassment when one has no dowry to give them. However, the young woman did not regard this troop of children as the cause of their ruin. On the contrary, she based on her son's heads the building of the fortune which was crumbling in her own hands. They were hardly ten years old before she discounted their future careers in her dreams. Doubting whether she would ever succeed herself, she centered in them all her hopes of overcoming the animosity of fate. They would provide satisfaction for her disappointed vanity. They would give her that wealthy, honorable position which she had hitherto sought in vain. From that time forward, without abandoning the business struggle, she conceived a second plan for obtaining the gratification of her domineering instincts. It seemed to her impossible that amongst her three sons there should not be a man of superior intellect who would enrich them all. She felt it, she said. Accordingly, she nursed the children with a fervor in which maternal severity was blended with an usurer's solicitude. 
She amused herself by fattening them as though they constituted a capital, which, later on, would return a large interest. Enough, Pierre would sometimes exclaim. All children are ungrateful. You're spoiling them. You're ruining us. When Felicite spoke of sending them to college, he got angry. Latin was a useless luxury. It would be quite sufficient if they went through the classes of a little neighboring school. The young woman, however, persisted in her design. She possessed certain elevated instincts which made her take a great pride in surrounding herself with accomplished children. Moreover, she felt that her sons must never remain as illiterate as her husband if she wished to see them become prominent men. She fancied them all three in Paris in high positions, which she did not clearly define. When Rougeon consented and the three youngsters had entered the eighth class, Felicité felt the most lively satisfaction she had ever experienced. She listened with delight as they talked of their professors and their studies. When she heard her eldest son make one of his brothers decline Rosa a Rose, it sounded like delicious music to her. It is only fair to add that her delight was not tarnished by any sordid calculations. Even Rougeon felt the satisfaction which an illiterate man experiences on perceiving his sons grow more learned than himself. Then the fellowship which grew up between their sons and those of the local bigwigs completed the parents' gratification. The youngsters were soon on familiar terms with the sons of the mayor and the sub-prefect, and even with two or three young noblemen whom the San Marc quarter had deigned to send to the Plessant College. Felicité was at a loss how to repay such an honor. The education of the three lads weighed seriously on the budget of the Rougeon household. Until the boys had taken their degrees, their parents, who kept them at college at enormous sacrifices, lived in hopes of their success. When they had obtained their diplomas, Felicité wished to continue her work and even persuaded her husband to send the three to Paris. Two of them devoted themselves to the study of law, and the third passed through the school of medicine. Then, when they were men and had exhausted the resources of the Rougeon family and were obliged to return and establish themselves in the provinces, their parents' disenchantment began. They idled about and grew fat, and Felicité again felt all the bitterness of her ill luck. Her sons were failing her. They'd ruin her and did not return any interest on the capital which they represented. This last blow of fate was the heaviest, as it fell on her ambition and her maternal vanity alike. Rougeon repeated to her from morning till night, I told you so, which only exasperated her the more. One day, as she was bitterly reproaching her eldest son with a large amount of money expended on his education, he said to her with equal bitterness, I will repay you later on, if I can, but as you had no means, you should have brought us up to a trade. We're out of our element. We're suffering more than you. Felicite understood the wisdom of these words. From that time, she ceased to accuse her children and turned her anger against fate, which never wearied of striking her. She started her old complaints afresh, and bemoaned more and more the want of means which made her strand, as it were, in port. Whenever Rougeon said to her, Your sons are lazy fellows, they'll eat up all we have, she sourly returned, Would to God I had more money to give them! If they do vegetate, poor fellows, it's because they haven't got a sou to bless themselves with. At the beginning of the year 1848, on the eve of the Revolution of February, the three young Rougeon held very precarious positions at Plassans. They presented most curious and profoundly dissimilar characteristics, though they came of the same stock. They were, in reality, superior to their parents. The race of the Rougeon was destined to become refined through its female side. Adelaide had made Pierre a man of moderate enterprise, disposed to low ambitions. Felicité had inspired her sons with a higher intelligence, 
with the capacity for greater vices and greater virtues. At the period now referred to, the eldest, Eugène, was nearly 40 years old. He was a man of middle height, slightly bald and already disposed to obesity. He had his father's face, a long face with broad features. Beneath his skin one could divine the fat to which were due the flabby roundness of his features and his yellowish waxy complexion. Though his massive square head still recalled the peasant, his physiognomy was transfigured, lit up from within, as it were, when his drooping eyelids were raised and his eyes awoke to life. In the son's case, the father's ponderousness had turned to gravity. This big fellow, Eugène, usually preserved a heavy, somnolent demeanor. At the same time, certain of his heavy, languid movements suggested those of a giant stretching his limbs, pending the time for action. By one of those alleged freaks of nature, of which, however, science is now commencing to discover the laws, a physical resemblance to Pierre was perfect in Eugène. Félicité, on her side, seemed to have furnished him with his brains. He offered an instance of certain moral and intellectual qualities of maternal origin being embedded in the coarse flesh he had derived from his father. He cherished lofty ambitions, possessed domineering instincts, and, sh and showed singular contempt for trifling expedience and petty fortunes. He was a proof that Plassan was perhaps not mistaken in suspecting that Felicité had some blue blood in her veins. The passion for indulgence, which became formidably developed in the Rougeon, and was in fact the family characteristic, attained in his case its highest pitch, he longed for self-gratification, but in the form of mental enjoyment such as would gratify his burning desire for domination. A man such as this was never intended to succeed in a provincial town. He vegetated there for fifteen years, his eyes turned towards Paris, watching his opportunities. On his return home he had entered his name on the rolls in order to be independent of his parents. After that, he pleaded from time to time, earning a bare livelihood without appearing to rise above average mediocrity. At Plassan, his voice was considered thick, his movements heavy. He generally wandered from the question at issue, rambled, as the wise acres expressed it. On one occasion, particularly when he was pleading in a case for damages, he so forgot himself as to stray into a political disquisition to such a point that the presiding judge interfered, whereupon he immediately sat down with a strange smile. His client was condemned to pay a considerable sum of money, a circumstance which did not, however, seem to cause Eugène the least regret for his irrelevant digression. He appeared to regard his speeches as mere exercises which would be of use to him later on. It was this that puzzled and disheartened Felicité. She would have liked to see her son dictating the law to the civil court of Plassans. At last, she came to entertain a very unfavorable opinion of her firstborn. To her mind, this lazy fellow would never be the one to shed any luster on the family. Pierre, on the contrary, felt absolute confidence in him. Not that he had more intuition than his wife, but because external appearances sufficed him, and he flattered himself by believing in the genius of a son who was his living image. A month prior to the revolution of February 1848, Eugène became restless. Some special inspiration made him anticipate the crisis. From that time forward, he seemed to feel out of his element at Plassan. He would wander about the streets like a distressed soul. At last, he formed a sudden resolution and left for Paris with scarcely 500 francs in his pocket. Aristide, the youngest son, was, so to speak, diametrically opposed to Eugène. He had his mother's face and a covetousness and slyness of character prone to trivial intrigues in which his father's instincts predominated. Nature has need of symmetry. Short, with pitiful countenance suggesting the knob of a stick carved into a punch's head, 
Aristide ferreted and fumbled everywhere without any scruples, eager only to gratify himself. He loved money as his eldest brother loved power. While Eugène dreamed of bending a people to his will and intoxicated himself with visions of future omnipotence, the other fancied himself ten times a millionaire, installed in a princely mansion, eating and drinking to his heart's content, and enjoying life to the fullest possible extent. Above all things, he longed to make a rapid fortune. When he was building his castles in the air, they would rise in his mind as if by magic. He would become possessed of tons of gold in one night. These visions agreed with his indolence, as he never troubled himself about the means, considering those the best which were the most expeditious. In his case, the race of the Rougeon, of those coarse, greedy peasants with brutish appetites, had matured too rapidly. Every desire for material indulgence was found in him, augmented threefold by hasty education, and rendered the more insatiable and dangerous by the deliberate way in which the young man had come to regard their realization as his set purpose. In spite of her keen feminine intuition, Felicite preferred this son. She did not perceive the greater affinity between herself and Eugène. She excused the follies and indolence of her youngest son under the pretext that he would someday be the superior genius of the family and that such a man was entitled to live a disorderly life until his intellectual strength should be revealed. Aristide subjected her indulgence to a rude test. In Paris, he led a low, idle life. He was one of those students who enter their names at the taverns of the Quartier Latin. He did not remain there, however, more than two years. His father, growing apprehensive and seeing that he had not yet passed a single examination, kept him at Plassan and spoke of finding a wife for him, hoping that domestic responsibility would make him more steady. Aristide let himself be married. He had no very clear idea of his own ambitions at this time. Provincial life did not displease him. He was battening in his little town, eating, sleeping, and sauntering about. Felicité pleaded his cause so earnestly that Pierre consented to board and lodge the newly married couple on condition that the young man should turn his attention to the business. From that time, however, Aristide led a life of ease and idleness. He spent his days and the best part of his nights at the club, again and again slipping out of his father's office like a schoolboy to go and gamble away the few louis that his mother gave him clandestinely. It is necessary to have lived in the depths of the French provinces to form an idea of the four brutifying years which the young fellow spent in this fashion. In every little town there is a group of individuals who thus live on their parents, pretending at times to work, but in reality cultivating idleness with a sort of religious zeal. Aristide was typical of these incorrigible drones. For four years he did little but play écarté. While he passed his time at the club, his wife, a fair-complexioned, nerveless woman, helped to ruin the Rougeon business by her inordinate passion for showy gowns and her formidable appetite, a rather remarkable peculiarity in so frail a creature. Angel, however, adored sky blue ribbons and roast beef. She was the daughter of a retired captain who was called Commander Sicardo, a good-hearted old gentleman who'd given her a dowry of 10,000 francs, all his savings. Pierre, in selecting Angel for his son, had considered that he'd made an unexpected bargain, so lightly did he esteem Aristide. However, that dowry of 10,000 francs, which determined his choice, ultimately became a millstone round his neck. His son, who was already a cunning rogue, deposited the 10,000 francs with his father, with whom he entered into partnership declining with the most sincere professions of devotion to keep a single copper. We have no need of anything, he said. You'll keep my wife and myself, and we'll reckon up later on. 
Pierre was short of money at the time and accepted not, however, without some uneasiness at Aristide's disinterestedness. The latter calculated that it would be years before his father would have 10,000 francs in ready money to repay him so that he and his wife would live at the paternal expense so long as the partnership could not be dissolved. It was an admirable investment for his few banknotes. When the old dealer understood what a foolish bargain he had made, he was not in a position to rid himself of Aristide. Angèle's dowry was involved in speculations which were turning out unfavorably. He was exasperated, stung to the heart at having to provide for his daughter-in-law's voracious appetite and to keep his son in idleness. Had he been able to buy them out of the business, he would twenty times have shut his doors on those bloodsuckers, as he emphatically expressed it. Felicité secretly defended them. The young man who had divined her dreams of ambition would every evening describe to her the elaborate plans by which he would shortly make a fortune. By a rare chance, she had remained on excellent terms with her daughter-in-law. It must be confessed that Angèle had no will of her own. She could be moved and disposed of like a piece of furniture. Meanwhile, Pierre became enraged whenever his wife spoke to him of the success their youngest son would ultimately achieve. He declared that he would really bring them to ruin. During the four years that the young couple lived with him, he stormed in this manner, wasting his impotent rage in quarrels, without in the least disturbing the equanimity of Aristide and Angèle. They were located there, and there they intended to remain like blocks of wood. At last, Pierre met with a stroke of luck which enabled him to return the 10,000 francs to his son. When, however, he wanted to reckon up accounts with him, Aristide interposed so much chicanery that he had to let the couple go without deducting a copper for their board and lodging. They installed themselves but a short distance off, in a part of the old quarter called the Place Saint-Louis. The 10,000 francs were soon consumed. They had everything to get for their new home. Moreover, Aristide made no change in his mode of living as long as any money was left in the house. When he had reached the last hundred franc note, he felt rather nervous. He was seen prowling about the town in a suspicious manner. He no longer took his customary cup of coffee at the club. He watched feverishly whilst play was going on without touching a card. Poverty made him more spiteful than he would otherwise have been. He bore the blow for a long time, obstinately refusing to do anything in the way of work. In 1840, he had a son, little Maxime, whom his grandmother Felicité fortunately sent to college, paying his fees clandestinely. That made one mouth less at home, but poor Angèle was dying of hunger and her husband was at last compelled to seek a situation. He secured one at the sub-prefecture. He remained there nearly ten years, and only attained a salary of 1,800 francs per annum. From that time forward it was with ever-increasing malevolence and rancor that he hungered for the enjoyments of which he was deprived. His lowly position exasperated him. The paltry hundred and fifty francs which he received every month seemed to him an irony of fate. Never did man burn with such desire for self-gratification. Felicité, to whom he imparted his sufferings, was by no means grieved to see him so eager. She thought his misery would stimulate his energies. At last, crouching in ambush as it were, with his ears wide open, he began to look about him like a thief seeking his opportunity. At the beginning of 1848, when his brother left for Paris, he had a momentary idea of following him. But Eugène was a bachelor, and he, Aristide, could not take his wife so far without money. So he waited, scenting a catastrophe, and ready to fall on the first prey that might come within reach. The other son, Pascal, born between Eugène and Aristide, did not appear to belong to the family. He was one of those frequent cases which give the lie to the laws of heredity. 
During the evolution of a race, nature often produces some one being whose every element she derives from her own creative powers. Nothing in the moral or physical constitution of Pascal recalled the Rougeon. Tall, with a grave and gentle face, he had an uprightness of mind, a love of study, a retiring modesty which contrasted strangely with the feverish ambitions and unscrupulous intrigues of his relatives. After acquitting himself admirably of his medical studies in Paris, he had retired by preference to Plessant, notwithstanding the offers he received from his professors. He loved a quiet provincial life. He maintained that for a studious man such a life was preferable to the excitement of Paris. Even at Plassans, he did not exert himself to extend his practice. Very steady and despising fortune, he contented himself with a few patients sent him by chance. All his pleasures were centered in a bright little house in the new town, where he shut himself up, lovingly devoting his whole time to the study of natural history. He was particularly fond of physiology. It was known in the town that he frequently purchased dead bodies from the hospital gravedigger, a circumstance which rendered him an object of horror to delicate ladies and certain timid gentlemen. Fortunately, they did not actually look upon him as a sorcerer, but his practice diminished, and he was regarded as an eccentric character to whom people of good society ought not to entrust even a fingertip for fear of being compromised. The mayor's wife was one day heard to say, I would sooner die than be attended by that gentleman. He smells of death. From that time, Pascal was condemned. He seemed to rejoice at the mute terror which he inspired. The fewer patients he had, the more time he could devote to his favorite sciences. As his fees were very moderate, the poorer people remained faithful to him. He earned just enough to live and lived contentedly a thousand leagues away from the rest of the country, absorbed in the pure delight of his researches and discoveries. From time to time he sent a memoir to the Académie des Sciences at Paris. Poisson did not know that this eccentric character, this gentleman who smelt of death, was well known and highly esteemed in the world of science. When people saw him starting on Sundays for an excursion among the Garry Hills, with a botanist's bag hung round his neck and the geologist's hammer in his hand, they would shrug their shoulders and institute a comparison between him and some other doctor of a town who was noted for his smart cravat, his affability to the ladies, and the delicious odor of violets which his garments always diffused. Pascal's parents did not understand him any better than other people. When Felicité saw him adopting such a strange, unpretentious mode of life, she was stupefied and reproached him for disappointing her hopes. She, who tolerated Aristide's idleness because she thought it would prove fertile, could not view without regret the slow progress of Pascal, his partiality for obscurity and contempt for riches, his determined resolve to lead a life of retirement, he was certainly not the child who would ever gratify her vanities. But where do you spring from? She would sometimes say to him. You're not one of us. Look at your brothers, how they keep their eyes open, striving to profit by the education we've given them, whilst you waste your time on follies and trifles. You make a very poor return to us, who've ruined ourselves for your education. No, you're certainly not one of us. Pascal, who preferred to laugh whenever he was called upon to feel annoyed, replied cheerfully, but not without a sting of irony. Oh, you need not be frightened. I shall never drive you to the verge of bankruptcy. When any of you are ill, I will attend you for nothing. Moreover, though he never displayed any repugnance to his relatives, he very rarely saw them, following in this wise his natural instincts. Before Aristide obtained a situation at the sub-prefecture, Pascal had frequently come to his assistance. For his part, he had remained a bachelor. He had not the least suspicion of the grave events that were preparing. 
For two or three years he'd been studying the great problem of heredity, comparing the human and animal races together, and becoming absorbed in the strange results which he obtained. Certain observations which he had made with respect to himself and his relatives had been, so to say, the starting point of his studies. The common people, with their natural intuition, so well understood that he was quite different from the other Rougeon, but they invariably called him Monsieur Pascal, without ever adding his family name. Three years prior to the Revolution of 1848, Pierre and Felicité retired from business. Old age was coming on apace. They were both past fifty and were weary enough of the struggle. In face of their ill fortune, they were afraid of being ultimately ruined if they obstinately persisted in the fight. Their sons, by disappointing their expectations, had dealt them the final blow. Now that they despaired of ever being enriched by them, they were anxious to make some little provision for old age. They retired with 40,000 francs at the utmost. This sum provided an annual income of 2,000 francs, just sufficient to live in a small way in the provinces. Fortunately, they were by themselves, having succeeded in marrying their daughters, Marthe and Sidonie, the former of whom resided at Marseille and the latter in Paris. After they had settled their affairs, they would much have liked to take up their abode in the new town, the quarter of the retired traders, but they dared not do so. Their income was too small. They were afraid that they would cut but a poor figure there. So, as a sort of compromise, they took apartments in the Rue de la Ban, that street which separates the old quarter from the new one. As their abode was one of the row of houses bordering the old quarter, they still lived among the common people. Nevertheless, they could see the town of the richer classes from their windows, so that they were just on the threshold of the promised land. Their apartments, situated on the second floor, consisted of three large rooms, dining room, drawing room, and bedroom. The first floor was occupied by the owner of the house, a stick and umbrella manufacturer, who had a shop on the ground floor. The house, which was narrow and by no means deep, had only two stories. Felicité moved into it with a bitter pang. In the provinces, to live in another person's house is an avowal of poverty. Every family of position at Plassans had a house of its own, landed property being very cheap there. Pierre kept the purse strings well tied. He would not hear of any embellishments. The old furniture, faded, worn, damaged though it was, had to suffice without even being repaired. Felicité, however, who keenly felt the necessity for this parsimony, exerted herself to give fresh polish to all the wreckage. She herself knocked nails into some of the furniture, which was more dilapidated than the rest, and darned the frayed velvet of the armchairs. The dining room, which, like the kitchen, was at the back of the house, was nearly bare. A table and a dozen chairs were lost in the gloom of this large apartment, whose window faced the gray wall of a neighboring building. As no strangers ever went into the bedroom, Felicité had stowed all her useless furniture there. Thus, besides a bedstead, wardrobe, secretaire, and washstand, it contained two cradles, one perched atop of the other, a sideboard whose doors were missing, and an empty bookcase, venerable ruins which the old woman could not make up her mind to part with. All her cares, however, were bestowed upon the drawing room, and she almost succeeded in making it comfortable and decent. The furniture was covered with yellowish velvet with satin flowers. In the middle stood a round table with a marble top, while a couple of pier tables, surmounted by mirrors, leant against the walls at either end of the room. There was even a carpet, which just covered the middle of the floor, and a chandelier in a white muslin cover which the flies had spotted with black specks. On the walls hung six lithographs representing the great battles of Napoleon I. Moreover, the furniture dated from the first years of the empire. 
The only embellishment that Felicite could obtain was to have the walls hung with orange-hued paper covered with large flowers. Thus, the drawing room had a strange yellow glow, which filled it with an artificial dazzling light. The furniture, the paper, and the window curtains were yellow. The carpet and even the marble tabletop showed touches of yellow. However, when the curtains were drawn, the colors harmonized fairly well, and the drawing room looked almost decent. But Felicite had dreamed of quite a different kind of luxury. She regarded with mute despair this ill-concealed misery. She usually occupied the drawing room, the best apartment in the house, and the sweetest and bitterest of her pastimes was to sit at one of the windows which overlooked the Rue de la Banne and gave her a side view of the square in front of the sub-prefecture. That was the paradise of her dreams. That little, neat, tidy square with its bright houses seemed to her a garden of Eden. She would have given ten years of her life to possess one of those habitations. The house at the left-hand corner, in which the receiver of taxes resided, particularly tempted her. She contemplated it with eager longing. Sometimes, when the windows of this abode were open, she could catch a glimpse of rich furniture and tasteful elegance which made her burn with envy. At this period, the Rougeon passed through a curious crisis of vanity and unsatiated appetite. The few proper feelings which they had once entertained had become embittered. They posed as victims of evil fortune, not with resignation, however, for they seemed still more keenly determined that they would not die before they had satisfied their ambitions. In reality, they did not abandon any of their hopes, notwithstanding their advanced age. Felicité professed to feel a presentiment that she would die rich. However, each day of poverty weighed them down the more. When they recapitulated their vain attempts, when they recalled their thirty-year struggle and the defection of their children, when they saw their airy castles end in this yellow drawing room, whose shabbiness they could only conceal by drawing the curtains, they were overcome with bitter rage. Then, as a consolation, they would think of plans for making a colossal fortune, seeking all sorts of devices. Felicité would fancy herself the winner of the grand prize of a hundred thousand francs in some lottery, while Pierre pictured himself carrying out some wonderful speculation. They lived with one sole thought, that of making a fortune immediately, in a few hours, of becoming rich and enjoying themselves if only for a year. Their whole beings tended to this stubbornly, without a pause. And they still cherished some faint hopes with regard to their sons, with that peculiar egotism of parents who cannot bear to think that they've sent their children to college without deriving some personal advantage from it. Felicité did not appear to have aged. She was still the same dark little woman, ever on the move, buzzing about like a grasshopper. Any person walking behind her on the pavement would have thought her a girl of fifteen, from the lightness of her step and the angularity of her shoulders and waist. Even her face had scarcely undergone any change. It was simply rather more sunken, rather more suggestive of a snout of a polecat. As for Pierre Rougeon, he had grown corpulent had become a highly respectable-looking citizen who only lacked a decent income to make him a very dignified individual. His pale, flabby face, his heaviness, his languid manner seemed redolent of wealth. He had one day heard a peasant who did not know him say, "'Ah, he's some rich fellow, that fat old gentleman there. He's no cause to worry about his dinner.' This was a remark which stung him to the heart, for he considered it cruel mockery to be only a poor devil while possessing the bulk and contented gravity of a millionaire. When he shaved on Sundays in front of a small five-sou looking-glass hanging from the fastening of a window, he would often think that in a dress coat and white tie he would cut a far better figure at the sub-prefects 
than such or such a functionary of Plessant. This peasant's son, who had grown sallow from business worries and corpulent from a sedentary life, whose hateful passions were hidden beneath naturally placid features, really had that air of solemn imbecility which gives a man a position in an official salon. People imagined that his wife held a rod over him, but they were mistaken. He was as self-willed as a brute. Any determined expression of extraneous will would drive him into a violent rage. Felicite was far too supple to thwart him openly. With her light, fluttering nature, she did not attack obstacles in front. When she wished to obtain something from her husband or drive him the way she thought best, She'd buzz round him in her grasshopper fashion, stinging him on all sides, and returning to the charge a hundred times until he yielded almost unconsciously. He felt, moreover, that she was shrewder than he, and tolerated her advice fairly patiently. Felicite, more useful than the coach fly, would sometimes do all the work while she was thus buzzing round Pierre's ears. Strange to say, the husband and wife never accused each other of their ill success. The only bone of contention between them was the education lavished on their children. The revolution of 1848 found all the Rougeon on the lookout, exasperated by their bad luck, and disposed to lay violent hands on fortune if ever they should meet her in a byway. They were a family of bandits lying in wait, ready to rifle and plunder. Eugène kept an eye on Paris. Aristide dreamt of strangling Plessant. The mother and father, perhaps the most eager of the lot, intended to work on their own account and reap some additional advantage from their son's doings. Pascal alone, that discreet wooer of science, led the happy, indifferent life of a lover in his bright little house in the new town. This ends Chapter 2, Part 2. Section 6 of The Fortune of the Rougeon, Book 1 of rougeon Maca Cycle, by Emile Zola, translated by Henri Visitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Mark Leader. Section 6, Chapter 3, Part 1. In that closed, sequestered town of Plessant, where class distinction was so clearly marked in 1848, the commotion caused by political events was very slight. Even at the present day, the popular voice sounds very faintly there. The middle classes bring their prudence to bear in the matter, the nobility their mute despair, and the clergy their shrewd cunning. Kings may usurp thrones or republics may be established without scarcely any stir in the town. Plassant sleeps while Paris fights. But though on the surface the town may appear calm and indifferent, in the depths hidden work goes on which it is curious to study. If shots are rare in the streets, intrigues consume the drawing rooms of both the New Town and the Saint Marc Quarter. Until the year 1830, the masses were reckoned of no account. Even at the present time, they are similarly ignored. Everything is settled between the clergy, the nobility, and the bourgeoisie. The priests, who are very numerous, give the cue to the local politics. They lay subterranean minds, as it were, and deal blows in the dark, following a prudent tactical system which hardly allows of a step in advance or retreat even in the course of ten years. The secret intrigues of men who desire above all things to avoid noise require special shrewdness, a special aptitude for dealing with small matters, and a patient endurance such as one only finds in persons callous to all passions. It is thus that provincial dilatoriness, which is so freely ridiculed in Paris, is full of treachery, secret stabs, hidden victories, and defeats. These worthy men, particularly when their interests are at stake, kill at home with a snap of the fingers, as we, the Parisians, 
kill with cannon in the public thoroughfares. The political history of Plassans, like that of all little towns in Provence, is singularly characteristic. Until 1830, the inhabitants remained observant Catholics and fervent royalists. Even the lower classes only swore by God and their legitimate sovereigns. Then there came a sudden change. Faith departed, the working and middle classes deserted the cause of legitimacy, and gradually espoused the great democratic movement of our time. When the Revolution of 1848 broke out, the nobility and the clergy were left alone to labor for the triumph of Henri V. For a long time they had regarded the succession of the Orleanists as a ridiculous experiment which sooner or later would bring back the Bourbons. Although their hopes were singularly shaken, they nevertheless continued the struggle, scandalized by the defection of their former allies, whom they strove to win back to their cause. The San Marc Quarter, assisted by all the parish priests, set to work. Among the middle classes, and especially among the people, the enthusiasm was very great on the morrow of the events of February. These apprentice republicans were in haste to display their revolutionary fervor. As regards the gentry of the new town, however, the conflagration, bright though it was, lasted no longer than a fire of straw. The small house owners and retired tradespeople who had had their good days or had made snug little fortunes under the monarchy were soon seized with panic. The Republic, with its constant shocks and convulsions, made them tremble for their money and their life of selfishness. Consequently, when the clerical reaction of 1849 declared itself, nearly all the middle classes passed over to the conservative party. They were received with open arms. The new town had never before had such close relations with the San Marc Quarter. Some of the nobility even went so far as to shake hands with lawyers and retired oil dealers. This unexpected familiarity kindled the enthusiasm of the new quarter, which henceforward waged bitter warfare against the Republican government. To bring about such a coalition, the clergy had to display marvelous skill and endurance. The nobility of Plassans, for the most part, lay prostrate as if half dead. They retained their faith, but lethargy had fallen on them, and they preferred to remain inactive, allowing the heavens to work their will. They would gladly have contented themselves with silent protest, feeling perhaps a vague presentiment that their divinities were dead, and that there was nothing left for them to do but rejoin them. Even at this period of confusion, when the catastrophe of 1848 was calculated to give them a momentary hope of the return of the Bourbons, they showed themselves spiritless and indifferent, speaking of rushing into the melee, yet never quitting their hearths without a pang of regret. The clergy battled indefatigably against this feeling of impotence and resignation. They infused a kind of passion into their work. A priest, when he despairs, struggles all the more fiercely. The fundamental policy of the Church is to march straight forward, even though she may have to postpone the accomplishment of her projects for several centuries. She never wastes a single hour, but is always pushing forward with increasing energy. So it was the clergy who led the reaction of Plassans. The nobility only lent them their name, nothing more. The priests hid themselves behind the nobles, restrained them, directed them, and even succeeded in endowing them with a semblance of life. When they had induced them to overcome their repugnance so far as to make common cause with the middle classes, they believed themselves certain of victory. The ground was marvelously well prepared. This ancient royalist town, with its population of peaceful householders and timorous tradespeople, was destined to range itself sooner or later on the side of law and order. The clergy, by their tactics, hastened the conversion. After gaining the landlords of the new town to their side, they even succeeded in convincing the little retail dealers of the old quarter. From that time, the reactionary movement obtained complete possession of the town. 
all opinions were represented in this reaction. Such a mixture of embittered liberals, legitimists, Orleanists, Bonapartists, and clericals had never before been seen. It mattered little, however, at that time. The sole object was to kill the Republic, and the Republic was at the point of death. Only a fraction of the people, a thousand workmen at most, out of the ten thousand souls in the town, still saluted the Tree of Liberty planted in the middle of the square in front of the sub-prefecture. The shrewdest politicians of Plassans, those who led the reactionary movement, did not scent the approach of the empire until very much later. Prince Louis Napoleon's popularity seemed to them a mere passing fancy of the multitude. His person inspired them with but little in admiration. They reckoned him a non-entity, a dreamer incapable of laying his hands on France and especially of maintaining his authority. To them, he was only a tool whom they would make use of, who would clear the way for them, and whom they would turn out as soon as the hour arrived for the rightful pretender to show himself. Footnote. The Count de Chambord, Henri V. However, months went by, and they became uneasy. It was only then that they vaguely perceived they were being duped. They had no time, however, to take any steps, the coup d'etat burst over their heads, and they were compelled to applaud. That great abomination, the Republic, had been assassinated. That, at least, was some sort of triumph. So the clergy and the nobility accepted accomplished facts with resignation, postponing until later the realization of their hopes and making amends for their miscalculations by uniting with the Bonapartists for the purpose of crushing the last Republicans. It was these events that laid the foundation of the Rougeons' fortune. After being mixed up with the various phases of the crisis, they rose to eminence on the ruins of liberty. These bandits had been lying in wait to rob the Republic. As soon as it had been strangled, they helped to plunder it. After the events of February 1848, Felicite, who had the keenest scent of all the members of the family, perceived that they were at last on the right track. So she began to flutter around her husband, goading him on to bestir himself. The first rumors of the revolution that had overturned King Louis-Philippe had terrified Pierre. When his wife, however, made him understand that they had little to lose and much to gain from a convulsion, he soon came round to her way of thinking. "'I don't know what you can do,' Felicité repeatedly said, but it seems to me that there's plenty to be done. Did not Monsieur de Carnavant say to us one day that he would be rich if ever Henri V should return, and that this sovereign would magnificently recompense those who had worked for his restoration? Perhaps our fortune lies in that direction. We may yet be lucky. The Marquis de Carnavant the nobleman who, according to the scandalous talk of the town, had been on very familiar terms with Felicité's mother, used occasionally to visit the Rougeon. Evil tongues asserted that Madame Rougeon resembled him. He was a little, lean, active man, seventy-five years old at that time, and Felicité certainly appeared to be taking his features and manner as she grew older, it was said that the wreck of his fortune, which had already been greatly diminished by his father at the time of the emigration, had been squandered on women. Indeed, he cheerfully acknowledged his poverty. Brought up by one of his relatives, the Count de Valquera, he lived the life of a parasite, eating at the Count's table and occupying a small apartment just under his roof. "'Little one!' he would often say to Felicité as he patted her on the cheek, "'If ever Henri V gives me a fortune, I will make you my heiress.' He still called Felicité little one, even when she was fifty years old. It was of these friendly pats, of these repeated promises of an inheritance that Madame Rougeon was thinking when she endeavoured to drive her husband into politics. Monsieur de Carnavant had often bitterly lamented his inability to render her any assistance. 
No doubt he would treat her like a father if ever he should acquire some influence. Pierre, to whom his wife half explained the situation in veiled terms, declared his readiness to move in any direction indicated. The Marquis's peculiar position qualified him to act as an energetic agent of the reactionary movement at Plassans from the first days of the Republic. This bustling little man who had everything to gain from the return of his legitimate sovereigns worked assiduously for their cause. While the wealthy nobility of the San Marc quarter were slumbering in mute despair, fearing, perhaps, that they might compromise themselves and again be condemned to exile, he multiplied himself, as it were, spread the propaganda and rallied faithful ones together, he was a weapon whose hilt was held by an invisible hand. From that time forward he paid daily visits to the Rougeon. He required a center of operations. His relative, Monsieur de Valquera, had forbidden him to bring any of his associates into his house, so he'd chosen Felicité's yellow drawing room. Moreover, he very soon found Pierre a valuable assistant. He could not go himself and preach the cause of legitimacy to the petty traders and workmen of the old quarter. They would have hooted him. Pierre, on the other hand, who had lived among these people, spoke their language and knew their wants, was able to catechize them in a friendly way. He thus became an indispensable man. In less than a fortnight, the Rougeons were more determined royalists than the king himself. The Marquis, perceiving Pierre's zeal, shrewdly sheltered himself behind him. What was the use of making himself conspicuous when a man with such broad shoulders was willing to bear on them the burden of all the follies of a party? He allowed Pierre to reign, puff himself out with importance, and speak with authority, content to restrain or urge him on, according to the necessities of the cause. Thus, the old oil dealer became a personage of Mark. In the evening, when they were alone, Felicite used to say to him, Go on, don't be frightened. We're on the right track. If this continues, we shall be rich. We shall have a drawing room like the tax receivers and be able to entertain people. A little party of conservatives had already been formed at the Rougeon's house, and meetings were held every evening in the yellow drawing-room to declaim against the Republic. Among those who came were three or four retired merchants who trembled for their money and clamored with all their might for a wise and strong government. An old almond dealer, a member of the municipal council, Monsieur Isidore Granou, was the head of this group. His hair-lipped mouth was cloven a little way from the nose, his round eyes, his air of mingled satisfaction and astonishment, made him resemble a fat goose whose digestion is attended by wholesome terror of the cook. He spoke little, having no command of words, and he only pricked up his ears when anyone accused the Republicans of wishing to pillage the houses of the rich, whereupon he would color up to such a degree as to make one fear an approaching apoplectic fit, and mutter low imprecations, in which the words idlers, scoundrels, thieves, and assassins frequently recurred. All those who frequented the yellow drawing room were not, however, as heavy as this fat goose. A rich landowner, Monsieur Rudier, with a plump, insinuating face, used to discourse there for hours altogether with all the passion of an Orleanist whose calculations had been upset by the fall of Louis Philippe. He had formerly been a hosier at Paris and a purveyor to the court, but had now retired to Plassans. He had made his son a magistrate, relying on the Orleanist party to promote him to the highest dignities. The revolution having ruined all his hopes, he had rushed wildly into the reaction. His fortune, his former commercial relations with the Tuileries, which he transformed into friendly intercourse, that prestige which is enjoyed by every man in the provinces who has made his money in Paris and deigns to come and spend it in a faraway department, gave him great influence in the district. Some persons hastened to him as though he were an oracle. However, the strongest intellect of the yellow drawing-room 
was certainly Commander Sicardot, Aristide's father-in-law. Of Herculean frame, with a brick-red face scarred and planted with tufts of gray hair, he was one of the most glorious old dolts of the Grande Armée. During the February Revolution, he'd been exasperated with the street warfare and never wearied of referring to it, proclaiming with indignation that this kind of fighting was shameful, whereupon he recalled with pride the grand reign of Napoleon. Another person seen at the Rougeon's house was an individual with clammy hands and equivocal look, one Monsieur Vuillet, a bookseller who supplied all the devout ladies of the town with holy images and rosaries. Vuillet dealt in both classical and religious works. He was a strict Catholic, a circumstance which ensured him the custom of the numerous convents and parish churches. Further, by a stroke of genius, he had added to his business the publication of a little bi-weekly journal, the Gazette de Plassans, which was devoted exclusively to the interests of the clergy. This paper involved an annual loss of a thousand francs, but it made him the champion of the church and enabled him to dispose of his sacred, unsaleable stock. Though he was virtually illiterate and could not even spell correctly, he himself wrote the articles of the Gazette with the humility and rancor that compensated for his lack of talent. The Marquis, in entering on the campaign, had perceived immediately the advantage that might be derived from the cooperation of this insipid sacristan with the coarse mercenary pen. After the February Revolution, the articles in the Gazette contained fewer mistakes. The Marquis revised them. One can now imagine what a singular spectacle the Rougeon's yellow drawing room presented every evening. All opinions met there to bark at the Republic. Their hatred of that institution made them agree together. The Marquise, who never missed a meeting, appeased by his presence the little squabbles which occasionally arose between the commander and the other adherents. These plebeians were inwardly flattered by the handshakes which he distributed on his arrival and departure. Roudier, however, like a free thinker of the Rue Saint-Honoré, asserted that the Marquis had not a copper to bless himself with and was disposed to make light of him. M. de Carnavant, on his side, preserved the amiable smile of a nobleman lowering himself to the level of these middle-class people without making any of those contemptuous grimaces which any other resident of the Saint-Marc quarter would have thought fit under such circumstances. The parasite life he had led had rendered him supple, he was the life and soul of the group, commanding in the name of unknown personages whom he never revealed. They want this, they don't want that, he would say. The concealed divinities who thus watched over the destitutes of Plassans from behind some cloud, without appearing to interfere directly in public matters, must have been certain priests, the great political agents of the country. When the Marquis pronounced that mysterious word, they, which inspired the assembly with such marvelous respect, Vuillet confessed with a gesture of pious devotion that he knew them very well. The happiest person in all this was Felicité. At last she had people coming to her drawing room. It was true she felt a little ashamed of her old yellow velvet furniture. She consoled herself, however, thinking of the rich things she would purchase when the good cause should have triumphed. The Rougeons had, in the end, regarded their royalism as very serious. Felicité went as far as to say, when Rudier was not present, that if they had not made a fortune in the oil business, the fault lay in the monarchy of July. This was her mode of giving a political tinge to their poverty. She had a friendly word for everybody, even for Granou inventing each evening some new polite method of waking him up when it was time for departure. The drawing room, that little band of conservatives belonging to all parties and daily increasing in numbers, soon wielded powerful influence. Owing to the diversified characters of its members, and especially to the secret impulse which each one received from the clergy, it became the center of the reactionary movement and spread its influence throughout Plassans. 
the policy of the Marquis, who sank his own personality, transformed Rougeon into the leader of the party. The meetings were held at his house, and this circumstance sufficed in the eyes of most people to make him the head of the group and draw public attention to him. The whole work was attributed to him. He was believed to be the chief artisan of the movement, which was gradually bringing over to the Conservative Party those who had lately been enthusiastic Republicans. There are some situations which benefit only persons of bad repute. These lay the foundations of their fortune where men of better position and more influence would never dare to risk theirs. Rudier, Granu, and the others, all men of means and respectability, certainly seemed a thousand times preferable to Pierre as the acting leaders of the Conservative Party, but none of them would have consented to turn his drawing room into a political centre. Their convictions did not go so far as to induce them to compromise themselves openly. In fact, they were only so many provincial babblers who liked to inveigh against the Republic at a neighbor's house, as long as the neighbor was willing to bear the responsibility of their chatter. The game was too risky. There was no one among the middle classes of Plassan who cared to play it except the Rougeon, whose ungratified longings urged them on to extreme measures. In the month of April 1849, Eugène suddenly left Paris and came to stay with his father for a fortnight. Nobody ever knew the purpose of this journey. It is probable that Eugène wanted to sound his native town to ascertain whether he might successfully stand as a candidate for the legislature which was about to replace the Constituent Assembly. He was too shrewd to risk a failure. No doubt public opinion appeared to him little in his favor, for he abstained from any attempt. It was not known to Plassans what had become of him in Paris, what he was doing there. On his return to his native place, folks found him less heavy and somnolent than formerly. They surrounded him and endeavored to make him speak out concerning the political situation. But he feigned ignorance and compelled them to talk. A little perspicacity would have detected that beneath his apparent unconcern there was great anxiety with regard to the political opinions of the town. However, he seemed to be sounding the ground more on behalf of a party than on his own account. Although he had renounced all hope for himself, he remained at Plassans until the end of the month, assiduously attending the meetings in the yellow drawing room. As soon as the bell rang, announcing the first visitor, he would take up his position in one of the window recesses as far as possible from the lamp. And he remained there the whole evening, resting his chin on the palm of his right hand and listening religiously. The great absurdities did not disturb his equanimity. He nodded approval even to the wild grunts of Granu. When anyone asked him his own opinion, he politely repeated that of the majority. Nothing seemed to tire his patience, neither the hollow dreams of the Marquis, who spoke of the Bourbons as if 1815 were a recent date, nor the effusions of Citizen Rudier, who grew quite pathetic when he recounted how many pairs of socks he had supplied to the citizen king, Louis-Philippe. On the contrary, he seemed quite at his ease in this Tower of Babel. Sometimes, when these grotesque personages were storming against the Republic, his eyes would smile, while his lips retained their expression of gravity. His meditative manner of listening and his invariable complacency had earned him the sympathy of everyone. He was considered a non-entity, but a very decent fellow. Whenever an old oil or almond dealer failed to get a hearing amidst the clamor for some plan for which he could save France if he were only a master, he took himself off to Eugène and shouted his marvelous suggestions in his ear. And Eugène gently nodded his head, as though delighted with the grand projects he was listening to. Fouillet alone regarded him with a suspicious eye. This bookseller, half sacristan and half journalist, spoke less than the others, but was more observant. He had noticed that Eugène occasionally conversed at times in a corner with Commander Sicardot. 
so he determined to watch them, but never succeeded in overhearing a word. Eugène silenced the commander by a wink whenever V.A. approached them. From that time, Sicardot never spoke of a Napoleon's without a mysterious smile. Two days before his return to Paris, Eugène met his brother Aristide on the Cours Sauveur, and the latter accompanied him for a short distance with the importunity of a man in search of advice. As a matter of fact, Aristide was in great perplexity. Ever since the proclamation of the Republic, he had manifested the most lively enthusiasm for the new government. His intelligence, sharpened by two years' stay at Paris, enabled him to see farther than the thick heads of Plessant. He divined the powerlessness of the Legitimists and Orleanists, without clearly distinguishing, however, what third thief might come and juggle the Republic away. At all hazard he had ranged himself on the side of the victors, and he had severed his connection with his father, whom he publicly denounced as an old fool, an old dolt whom the nobility had bamboozled. Yet my mother is an intelligent woman, he would add. I should never have thought her capable of inducing her husband to join a party whose hopes are simply chimerical. They're taking the right course to end their lives in poverty. But then, women know nothing about politics. For his part, he wanted to sell himself as dearly as possible. His great anxiety as to the direction in which the wind was blowing, so that he might invariably range himself on the side of that party, which, in the hour of triumph, would be able to reward him munificently. Unfortunately, he was groping in the dark. Shut up in his faraway province, without a guide, without any precise information, he felt quite lost. While waiting for events to trace out a sure and certain path, he preserved the enthusiastic Republican attitude which he had assumed from the very first day. Thanks to this demeanor, he remained at the sub-prefecture, and his salary was even raised. Burning, however, with the desire to play a prominent part, he persuaded a bookseller, one of Vuillet's rivals, to establish a democratic journal, to which he became one of the most energetic contributors. Under his impulse, the Independent waged merciless warfare against the reactionaries. But the current gradually carried him further than he wished to go. He ended by writing inflammatory articles which made him shudder when he reperused them. It was remarked at Plassans that he directed a series of attacks against all whom his father was in the habit of receiving of an evening in his famous yellow drawing room. The fact is that the wealth of Roudier and Granou exasperated Aristide to such a degree as to make him forget all prudence. Urged on by his jealous, insatiate bitterness, he had already made the middle classes his irreconcilable enemy when Eugène's arrival and demeanor at Plassans caused him great consternation. He confessed to himself that his brother was a skillful man. According to him, that big drowsy fellow always slept with one eye open, like a cat lying in wait before a mouse hole. And now here was Eugène spending entire evenings in the yellow drawing room and devoting himself to those same grotesque personages whom he, Aristide, had so mercilessly ridiculed. When he discovered from the gossip of the town that his brother shook hands with Granou and the Marquise, he asked himself with considerable anxiety, what was the meaning of it? Could he himself have been deceived? Had the Legitimists or the Orleanists really any chance of success? The thought terrified him. He lost his equilibrium, and as frequently happens, he fell upon the Conservatives with increased rancor, as if to avenge his own blindness. On the evening prior to the day, when he stopped Eugène on the Cour Sauveur, he had published in the Indépendant a terrible article on the intrigues of the clergy, in response to a short paragraph from Vuillet, who had accused the Republicans of desiring to demolish the churches. Vuillet was Aristide's bugbear. 
Never a week passed but these two journalists exchanged the greatest insults. In the provinces, where a periphrastic style is still cultivated, polemics are clothed in high-sounding phrases. Aristide called his adversary Brother Judas, or Slave of St. Anthony. Fouillet gallantly retorted by terming the Republican a monster glutted with blood whose ignoble purveyor was the guillotine. In order to sound his brother, Aristide, who did not dare to appear openly uneasy, contented himself with asking, Did you read my article yesterday? What do you think of it? Eugène lightly shrugged his shoulders. You're a simpleton, brother, was his sole reply. Then you think Vuillet right? cried the journalist, turning pale. You believe in Vuillet's triumph? I? Vuillet? He was certainly about to add, Vuillet is as big a fool as you are. But observing his brother's distorted face anxiously extended towards him, he experienced sudden mistrust. Vuillet has his good points, he calmly replied. On parting from his brother, Aristide felt more perplexed than before. Eugène must certainly have been making game of him, for Vouillet was really the most abominable person imaginable. However, he determined to be prudent and not tie himself down any more, for he wished to have his hands free should he ever be called upon to help any party in strangling the Republic. Eugène on the morning of his departure, an hour before getting into the diligence, took his father into the bedroom and had a long conversation with him. Felicité, who remained in the drawing room, vainly tried to catch what they were saying. They spoke in whispers, as if they feared lest a single word should be heard outside. When at last they quitted the bedroom, they seemed in high spirits. After kissing his father and mother, Eugène, who usually spoke in a drawling tone, exclaimed with vivacity, You have understood me, father? There lies our fortune. We must work with all our energy in that direction. Trust in me. I'll follow your instructions faithfully, Rougeon replied. Only don't forget what I asked you as the price of my cooperation. If we succeed, your demand shall be satisfied. I give you my word. Moreover, I will write to you and guide you according to the direction which events may take. Mind, no panic or excitement. You must obey me implicitly. What have you been plotting there? Felicite asked inquisitively. My dear mother, Eugène replied with a smile, you have had too little faith in me thitherto to induce me to confide in you my hopes, particularly as at present they are only based on probabilities. To be able to understand me you would require faith. However, father will inform you when the right time comes. Then, as Felicite assumed the demeanor of a woman who feels somewhat piqued, he added in her ear as he kissed her once more, I take after you, although you disowned me. Too much intelligence would be dangerous at the present moment. When the crisis comes, it is you who will have to manage the business. He then quitted the room, but suddenly reopening the door, exclaimed in an imperious tone, Above all things, do not trust Aristide. He is a marl who would spoil everything. I have studied him sufficiently to feel certain that he will always fall on his feet. Don't have any pity. If we make a fortune, he'll know well enough how to rob us of his share. When Eugène had gone, Felicité endeavored to ferret out the secret that was being hidden from her. She knew her husband too well to interrogate him openly. He would have angrily replied that it was no business of hers. In spite, however, of the clever tactics she pursued, she learnt absolutely nothing. Eugène had chosen a good confidant for those troubled times when the greatest discretion was necessary. 
Pierre, flattered by his son's confidence, exaggerated that passive ponderosity which made him so impenetrable. When Felicité saw that she would not learn anything from him, she ceased to flutter round him. On one point only did she remain inquisitive, but in this respect her curiosity was intense. The two men had mentioned a price stipulated by Pierre himself. What could that price be? This, after all, was the sole point of interest for Felicité, who did not care a rap for political matters. She knew that her husband must have sold himself dearly, but she was burning to know the nature of the bargain. One evening, when they'd gone to bed, finding Pierre in a good humor, she brought the conversation round to the discomforts of their poverty. It's quite time to put an end to this, she said. We've been ruining ourselves in oil and fuel since those gentlemen have been coming here. And who will pay the reckoning? Nobody, perhaps. Her husband fell into the trap and smiled with complacent superiority. Patience, said he. And with an air of shrewdness, he looked into his wife's eye and added, Would you be glad to be the wife of a receiver of taxes? Felicite's face flushed with a joyous glow. She sat up in bed and clapped her old withered little hands like a child. Really? she stammered. At Plassin? Pierre, without replying, gave a long, affirmative nod. He enjoyed his consort's astonishment and emotion. But, she at last resumed, half sitting, you would have to deposit an enormous sum as security. I've heard that our neighbor, Monsieur Pierrot, had to deposit 80,000 francs with the treasury. Ah, said the retired oil dealer. That's nothing to do with me. Eugène will see to that. He will get the money advanced by a banker in Paris. You see, I selected an appointment bringing in a good income. Eugène at first made a wry face, saying one must be rich to occupy such posts, to which influential men were usually nominated. I persisted, however, and he yielded. To be a receiver of taxes, one need not know either Greek or Latin. I shall have a representative, like Monsieur Perrault, and he will do all the work. Felicité listened to him with rapture. I guessed, however, he continued, what it was that worried our dear son. We're not much liked here. People know that we have no means and will make themselves obnoxious. But all sorts of things occur in a time of crisis. Eugène wished to get me an appointment in another town. However, I objected. I want to remain at Plassans. Yes, yes, we must remain here, the old woman quickly replied. We have suffered here, and here we must triumph. Ah, I'll crush them all, those fine ladies on the mail, who scornfully eye my woolen dresses. I didn't think of the appointment of receiver of taxes at all. I thought you wanted to become mayor. Mayor? Nonsense. That appointment is honorary. Eugène also mentioned the mayoralty to me. I replied, I'll accept if you give me an income of 15,000 francs. This conversation, in which high figures flew about like rockets, quite excited Felicité. She felt delightfully buoyant. But at last, she put on a devout air and gravely said, Come, let us reckon it out. How much will you earn? Well, said Pierre, the fixed salary, I believe, is 3,000 francs. 3,000, Felicité counted. Then there is so much per cent on the receipts, which at Plassan may produce the sum of 12,000 francs. That makes 15,000. Yes, about 15,000 francs. That's what Perrault earns. That's not all. Perrault does a little banking business on his own account. It's allowed. Perhaps I shall be disposed to make a venture when I feel luck on my side. Well, let us say 20,000. 20,000 francs a year, repeated Felicité, overwhelmed by the amount. 
We shall have to repay the advances, Pierre observed. That doesn't matter, Felicite replied. We shall be richer than many of those gentlemen. Are the Marquise and the others going to share the cake with you? No, no, it will be all for us, he replied. Then, as she continued to importune him with her questions, Pierre frowned, thinking that she wanted to wrest his secret from him. We've talked enough, he said abruptly. It's late. Let's go to sleep. It will bring us bad luck to count our chickens beforehand. I haven't got the place yet. Above all things, be prudent. When the lamp was extinguished, Felicite could not sleep. With her eyes closed, she built the most marvelous castles in the air. Those 20,000 francs a year danced a diabolical dance before her in the darkness. She occupied splendid apartments in the new town, enjoyed the same luxuries as Monsieur Pierrot, gave parties and bespattered the whole place with her wealth. That, however, which tickled her vanity most was the high position that her husband would then occupy. He would pay their state dividends to Granou, Rudier, and all those people who now came to their house as they might come to a cafe to swagger and learn the latest news. She'd noticed the free and easy manner in which these people entered her drawing room, and it made her take a dislike to them. Even the Marquise, with his ironical politeness, was beginning to displease her. To triumph alone, therefore, to keep the cake for themselves, she expressed it, was a revenge which she fondly cherished. Later on, when all those ill-bred persons presented themselves, hats off before Monsieur Rougeon, the receiver of taxes, she would crush them in her turn. She was busy with these thoughts all night, and on the morrow, as she opened the shutters, she instinctively cast her first glance across the street towards Monsieur Pierrot's house, and smiled as she contemplated the broad damask curtains hanging in the windows. This ends Chapter 3, Part 1. Section 7 of The Fortune of the Rougeon, Book 1 of Rougeon Maca Cycle, by Emile Zola, translated by Henry Vizitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Mark Leader. Chapter 3, Part 2 Felicite's hopes, in becoming modified, had grown yet more intense. Like all women, she did not object to a tinge of mystery. The secret object that her husband was pursuing excited her far more than the legitimist intrigues of Monsieur de Carnaval had ever done. She abandoned without much regret the calculation she had based on the Marquis's success, now that her husband declared he'd be able to make large profits by other means. She displayed, moreover, remarkable prudence and discretion. In reality, she was still tortured by anxious curiosity. She studied Pierre's slightest actions, endeavoring to discover their meaning. What if by chance he were following the wrong track? What if Eugène were dragging them in his train into some breakneck pit, whence they would emerge yet more hungry and impoverished? However, faith was dawning on her. Eugène had commanded with such an air of authority that she ultimately came to believe in him. In this case again, some unknown power was at work. Pierre would speak mysteriously of the high personages whom their eldest son visited in Paris. For her part, she did not know what he could have to do with them. But on the other hand, she was unable to close her eyes to Aristide's ill-advised acts at Plassans. The visitors to her drawing-room did not scruple to denounce the democratic journalist with extreme severity. Granou muttered that he was a brigand, and Rudier would three or four times a week repeat to Felicite, Your son is writing some fine articles. Only yesterday he attacked our friend Vouillet with revolting scurrility. The whole room joined in the chorus, and Commander Sicardot spoke of boxing his son-in-law's ears, while Pierre flatly disowned him. The poor mother hung her head, restraining her tears. 
For an instant, she felt an inclination to burst forth, to tell Rudier that her dear child, in spite of his faults, was worth more than he and all the others put together. But she was tied down, and did not wish to compromise the position they had so laboriously attained. Seeing the whole town so bitter against Aristide, she despaired of his future, thinking he was hopelessly ruining himself. On two occasions she spoke to him in secret, imploring him to return to them and not to irritate the yellow drawing room any further. Aristide replied that she did not understand such matters, that she was the one who had committed a great blunder in placing her husband at the service of the Marquis. So she had to abandon her son to his own courses, resolving, however, that if Eugène succeeded, she would compel him to share the spoils with the poor fellow who was her favorite child. After the departure of his eldest son, Pierre Rougeon pursued his reactionary intrigues. Nothing seemed to have changed in the opinions of the famous yellow drawing room. Every evening the same men came to join in the same propaganda in favor of the establishment of a monarchy, while the master of the house approved and aided them with as much zeal as in the past. Eugène had left Plessant on May 1st. A few days later the yellow drawing room was in raptures. The gossips were discussing the letter of the President of the Republic to General Oudinot, in which the siege of Rome had been decided upon. This letter was regarded as a brilliant victory due to the firm demeanor of the reactionary party. Since 1848, the chambers had been discussing the Roman question, but it had been reserved for a Bonaparte to stifle a rising republic by an act of intervention which France, if free, would never have countenanced. The Marquis declared, however, that one could not better promote the cause of legitimacy and Vuillet wrote a superb article on the matter. The enthusiasm became unbounded when a month later, Commander Sicardot entered the Rougeon's house one evening and announced to the company that the French army was fighting under the walls of Rome. Then, while everybody was raising exclamations at this news, he went up to Pierre and shook hands with him in a significant manner. And when he had taken a seat, he began to sound the praises of the President of the Republic, who, said he, was the only person able to save France from anarchy. Let him save it, then, as quickly as possible, interrupted the Marquis, and let him understand his duty by restoring it to its legitimate masters. Pierre seemed to approve this fine retort, and having thus given proof of his ardent royalism, he ventured to remark that Prince Louis Bonaparte had his entire sympathy in the matter. He thereupon exchanged a few short sentences with the commander, commending the excellent intentions of the president, which sentences one might have thought prepared and learnt beforehand. Bonapartism now, for the first time, made its entry into the yellow drawing room. It is true that since the election of December 10th, the prince had been treated there with a certain amount of consideration. He was preferred a thousand times to Cavagnac, and the whole reactionary party had voted for him. But they regarded him rather as an accomplice than a friend, and as such they distrusted him, and even began to accuse him of a desire to keep for himself the chestnuts which he had pulled out of the fire. On that particular evening, however, owing to the fighting at Rome, they listened with favor to the praises of Pierre and the commander. The group, led by Granou and Rudier, already demanded that the president should order all Republican rascals to be shot, while the Marquise, leaning against the mantelpiece, gazed meditatively at a faded rose on the carpet. When he at last lifted his head, Pierre, who had furtively watched his countenance as if to see the effect of his words, suddenly ceased speaking. However, M. de Carnavant merely smiled and glanced at Félicité with a knowing look. This rapid by-play was not observed by other people. Vuillet alone remarked in a sharp tone, "'I would rather see your Bonaparte at London than at Paris. Our affairs would get along better then.' 
At this, the old oil dealer turned slightly pale, fearing that he'd gone too far. I'm not anxious to retain my Bonaparte, he said, with some firmness. You know where I would send him to if I were the master. I simply assert that the expedition to Rome was a good stroke. Felicite had followed this scene with inquisitive astonishment. However, she did not speak of it to her husband, which proved that she adopted it as the basis of secret study. The Marquis smile, the significance of which escaped her, set her thinking. From that day forward, Rougeon, at distant intervals, whenever the occasion offered, slipped in a good word for the President of the Republic. On such evenings, Commander Sicardot acted the part of a willing accomplice. At the same time, clerical opinion still reigned supreme in the yellow drawing room. It was more particularly in the following year that this group of reactionaries gained decisive influence in the town, thanks to the retrograde movement which was going on at Paris. All those anti-liberal laws which the country called the Roman Expedition at home definitively secured the triumph of the Rougeon faction. The last enthusiastic bourgeois saw the Republic tottering and hastened to rally round the conservatives. Thus, the Rougeon's hour had arrived. The new town almost gave them an ovation on the day when the Tree of Liberty, planted on the square before the sub-prefecture, was sawed down. This tree, a young poplar brought from the banks of the Viorne, had gradually withered, much to the despair of the Republican workingmen, who would come every Sunday to observe the progress of the decay without being able to comprehend the cause of it. A hatter's apprentice at last asserted that he had seen a woman leave Rougeon's house and pour a pail of poisoned water at the foot of the tree. It thenceforward became a matter of history that Felicite herself got up every night to sprinkle the poplar with vitriol. When the tree was dead, the municipal council declared that the dignity of the Republic required its removal. For this, as they feared the displeasure of the working classes, they selected an advanced hour of the night. However, the conservative householders of the new town got wind of a little ceremony, and all came down to the square before the sub-prefecture in order to see how the Tree of Liberty would fall. The frequenters of the yellow drawing-room stationed themselves at the windows there. When the poplar cracked and fell with a thud in the darkness, as tragically rigid as some mortally stricken hero, Felicite felt bound to wave a white handkerchief. This induced the crowd to applaud, and many responded to the salute by waving their handkerchiefs likewise. A group of people even came under the window shouting, We'll bury it! We'll bury it! They meant the Republic, no doubt. Such was Felicite's emotion that she almost had a nervous attack. It was a fine evening for the yellow drawing room. However, the Marquis still looked at Felicité with the same mysterious smile. This little old man was far too shrewd to be ignorant of whither France was tending. He was among the first to scent the coming of the Empire. When the Legislative Assembly, later on, exhausted its energies in useless squabbling, when the Orleanists and the Legitimists tacitly accepted the idea of the coup d'etat, he said to himself that the game was definitely lost. In fact, he was the only one who saw things clearly. Fouillet certainly felt that the cause of Henry V, which his paper defended, was becoming detestable. But it mattered little to him. He was content to be the obedient creature of the clergy. His entire policy was framed so as to enable him to dispose of as many rosaries and sacred images as possible. As for Rudier and Granu, they lived in a state of blind scare. It was not certain whether they really had any opinions. All that they desired was to eat and sleep in peace. Their political aspirations went no further. The Marquis, though he had bidden farewell to his hopes, continued to come to the Rougeons as regularly as ever. He enjoyed himself there. The clash of rival ambitions among the middle classes and the display of their follies had become an extremely amusing spectacle to him. 
He shuddered at the thought of again shutting himself in the little room which he owed to the beneficence of the Comte de Valquera. With a kind of malicious delight, he kept to himself the conviction that the Bourbon hour had not yet arrived. He feigned blindness, working as hitherto for the triumph of legitimacy, and still remaining at the orders of the clergy and nobility, though from the very first day he had penetrated Pierre's new course of action and believed that Felicité was his accomplice. One evening, being the first to arrive, he found the old lady alone in the drawing-room. "'Well, little one,' he asked with his smiling familiarity, "'are your affairs going on all right? Why the deuce do you make such mysteries with me?' "'I'm not hiding anything from you,' Felicité replied, somewhat perplexed. "'Come, do you think you can deceive an old fox like me, eh? My dear child,' Treat me as a friend. I'm quite ready to help you secretly. Come now, be frank. A bright idea struck Felicité. She had nothing to tell, but perhaps she might find out something if she kept quiet. Why do you smile? Monsieur de Carnavant resumed. That's the beginning of a confession, you know. I suspected that you must be behind your husband. Pierre is too stupid to invent the pretty treason you are hatching. I sincerely hope the Bonapartists will give you what I should have asked for you from the Bourbon. This single sentence confirmed the suspicions which the old lady had entertained for some time past. Prince Louis has every chance, hasn't he? she eagerly inquired. Will you betray me if I tell you that I believe so? the Marquise laughingly replied. I've donned my mourning over it, little one. I'm simply a poor old man, worn out and only fit to be laid on the shelf. It was for you, however, that I was working. Since you've been able to find the right track without me, I shall feel some consolation in seeing you triumph amidst my own defeat. Above all things, don't make any more mysteries. Come to me if you are ever in trouble." And he added, with the skeptical smile of a nobleman who's lost caste, Shaw, I also can go in for a little treachery. At this moment, the clan of retired oil and almond dealers arrived. Ah, the dear reactionaries, Monsieur de Carnavant continued in an undertone. You see, little one, the great art of politics consists in having a pair of good eyes when other people are blind. You hold all the best cards in the pack. On the following day, Felicité, incited by this conversation, desired to make sure on the matter. They were then in the first days of the year 1851. For more than 18 months, Rougeon had been in the habit of receiving a letter from his son Eugène regularly, every fortnight. He would shut himself in the bedroom to read these letters, which he then hid at the bottom of an old secretaire the key of which he carefully kept in his waistcoat pocket. Whenever his wife questioned him about their son, he would simply answer, Eugène writes that he's going on all right. Felicité had long since thought of laying hands on her son's letters. So, early on the morning after her chat with the Marquise, while Pierre was still asleep, she got up on tiptoes, took the key of the secretaire from her husband's waistcoat, and substituted in its place that of the chest of drawers, which was of the same size. Then, as soon as her husband had gone out, she shut herself in the room in her turn, emptied the drawer, and read all the letters with feverish curiosity. Monsieur de Carnavant had not been mistaken, and her own suspicions were confirmed. There were about forty letters— which enabled her to follow the course of that great Bonapartist movement which was to terminate in the Second Empire. The letters constituted a sort of concise journal, narrating events as they occurred and drawing hopes and suggestions from each of them. Eugène was full of faith. He described Prince Louis Bonaparte to his father as the predestined necessary man who alone could unravel the situation. 
He had believed in him prior even to his return to France, at a time when Bonapartism was treated as a ridiculous chimera. Felicite understood that her son had been a very active secret agent since 1848. Although he did not clearly explain his position in Paris, it was evident that he was working for the Empire under the orders of personages whose names he mentioned with a sort of familiarity. Each of his letters gave information as to the progress of the cause, to which an early denouement was foreshadowed, and usually concluded by pointing out the line of action that Pierre should pursue at Plassans. Felicité could now comprehend certain words and acts of her husband, whose significance had previously escaped her. Pierre was obeying his son and blindly following his recommendations. When the old woman had finished reading, she was convinced. Eugène's entire thoughts were clearly revealed to her. He reckoned upon making his political fortune in the squabble and repaying his parents the debt he owed them for his education by throwing them a scrap of the prey as soon as the quarry was secured. However small the assistance his father might render to him and to the cause, it would not be difficult to get him appointed receiver of taxes. Nothing would be refused to one who, like Eugène, had steeped his hands in the most secret machinations. His letters were simply a kind attention on his part, a device to prevent the Rougeon from committing any act of imprudence for which Felicité felt deeply grateful. She read certain passages of the letters twice over, notably those in which Eugène spoke in vague terms of a final catastrophe. This catastrophe, the nature or bearings of which she could not well conceive, became a sort of end of the world for her. God would range the chosen ones on his right hand and the damned on his left, and she placed herself among the former. When she succeeded in replacing the key in her husband's waistcoat pocket on the following night, she made up her mind to employ the same expedient for reading every fresh letter that arrived. She resolved, likewise, to profess complete ignorance. This plan was an excellent one. Henceforward, she gave her husband the more assistance as she appeared to render it unconsciously. When Pierre thought he was working alone, it was she who brought the conversation round to the desired topic, recruiting partisans for the decisive moment. She felt hurt at Eugène's distrust of her. She wanted to be able to say to him, after the triumph, I knew all, and so far from spoiling anything, I have secured the victory. Never did an accomplice make less noise or work harder. The Marquise, whom she taken into her confidence, was astounded at it. The fate of her dear Aristide, however, continued to make her uneasy. Now that she shared the faith of her eldest son, the rabid articles of the Independent alarmed her all the more. She longed to convert the unfortunate Republican to Napoleonist ideas, but she did not know how to accomplish this in a discreet manner. She recalled the emphasis with which Eugène had told them to be on their guard against Aristide. At last she submitted the matter to Monsieur de Carnavant, who was entirely of the same opinion. "'Little one,' he said to her, in politics, one must know how to look after oneself. If you were to convert your son and the Independent were to start writing in defense of Bonapartism, it would deal the party a rude blow. The Independent had already been condemned. Its title alone suffices to enrage the middle classes of Plassans. Let dear Aristide flounder about. This only molds young people. He does not appear to me to be cut out for carrying on the role of a martyr for any length of time. However, in her eagerness to point out the right way to her family, now that she believed herself in possession of the truth, Felicite even sought to convert her son Pascal. The doctor, with the egotism of a scientist immersed in his researches, gave little heed to politics. Empires might fall while he was making an experiment yet he would not have deigned to turn his head. He at last yielded, however, to certain importunities of his mother, who accused him more than ever of living like an unsociable churl. 
If you were to go into society, she said to him, you'd get some well-to-do patience. Come at least and spend some evenings in our drawing room. You will make the acquaintance of Monsieur Rudier, Granou, and Sicardo, all gentlemen in good circumstances, who will pay you four or five francs a visit. The poor people will never enrich you. The idea of succeeding in life, of seeing all her family attain to fortune, had become a form of monomania with Felicité. Pascal, in order to be agreeable to her, came and spent a few evenings in the yellow drawing room. He was much less bored there than he had apprehended. At first he was rather stupefied at the degree of imbecility to which sane men can sink. The old oil and almond dealers, the marquise and the commander even, appeared to him so many curious animals which he had not hitherto had an opportunity of studying. He looked with the naturalist's interest at their grimacing faces, in which he discerned traces of their occupations and appetites. He listened also to their inane chatter, just as he might have tried to catch the meaning of a cat's mew or a dog's bark. At this period he was occupied with comparative natural history, applying to the human race the observations which he had made upon animals with regard to the working of heredity. While he was in the yellow drawing-room, therefore, he amused himself with the belief that he had fallen in with a menagerie. He established comparisons between the grotesque creatures he found there and certain animals of his acquaintance. The Marquis, with his leanness and small crafty-looking head, reminded him exactly of a long green grasshopper. Fouillet impressed him as a pale, slimy toad. He was more considerate for Rudier, a fat sheep, and for the commander, an old, toothless mastiff. But the prodigious Granou was a perpetual cause of astonishment to him. He spent a whole evening measuring this imbecile's facial angle. When he heard him mutter indistinct imprecations against those bloodsuckers, the Republicans, he always expected to hear him moan like a calf and he could never see him rise from his chair without imagining that he was about to leave the room on all fours. Talk to them, his mother used to say in an undertone. Try and make a practice out of these gentlemen. I am not a veterinary surgeon, he at last replied, exasperated. One evening, Felicité took him into a corner and tried to catechize him. She was glad to see him come to her house rather assiduously. She thought him reconciled to society, not suspecting for a moment the singular amusement that he derived from ridiculing these rich people. She cherished the secret project of making him the fashionable doctor of Plassans. It would be sufficient if men like Granou and Rudier consented to give him a start. She wished above all to impart to him the political views of the family, considering that a doctor had everything to gain by constituting himself a warm partisan of the regime which was to succeed the Republic. "'My dear boy,' she said to him, "'as you have now become reasonable, you must give some thought to the future. You're accused of being a Republican because you are foolish enough to attend all the beggars of the town without making any charge. Be frank, what are your real opinions?' Pascal looked at his mother with naive astonishment, then with a smile replied, My real opinions? I don't quite know. I am accused of being a Republican, did you say? Very well. I don't feel at all offended. I am undoubtedly a Republican, if you understand by that word a man who wishes the welfare of everybody. But you will never attain to any position, Felicite quickly interrupted. You will be crushed. Look at your brothers. They're trying to make their way. Pascal then comprehended that he was not called upon to defend his philosophic egotism. His mother simply accused him of not speculating on the political situation. He began to laugh somewhat sadly and then turned the conversation into another channel. Felicité could never induce him to consider the chances of the various parties, nor to enlist in that one of them which seemed likely to carry the day. However, 
He still occasionally came to spend an evening in the yellow drawing room. Grinu interested him like an antediluvian animal. In the meantime, events were moving. The year 1851 was a year of anxiety and apprehension for the politicians of Plassans, and the cause which the Rougeons served derived advantage from this circumstance. The most contradictory news arrived from Paris. Sometimes the Republicans were in the ascendant. Sometimes the Conservative Party was crushing the Republic. The echoes of the squabbles which were rending the Legislative Assembly reached the depths of the provinces, now in an exaggerated, now in an attenuated form, varying so greatly as to obscure the vision of the most clear-sighted. The only general feeling was that a denouement was approaching. The prevailing ignorance as to the nature of this denouement kept timid middle-class people in a terrible state of anxiety. Everybody wished to see the end. They were sick of uncertainty and would have flung themselves into the arms of the Grand Turk if he would have deigned to save France from anarchy. The Marquis' smile became more acute. Of an evening in the yellow drawing room, when Granu's growl was rendered indistinct by fright, he would draw near to Felicite and whisper in her ear, Come, little one, the fruit is ripe. But you must make yourself useful. Felicite, who continued to read Eugène's letters and knew that a decisive crisis might any day occur, had already often felt the necessity of making herself useful, and reflected as to the manner in which the Rougeons should employ themselves. At last she consulted the Marquise. It all depends upon circumstances, the little old man replied. If the department remains quiet, if no insurrection occurs to terrify Plassan, it will be difficult for you to make yourselves conspicuous and render any services to the new government. I advise you in that case to remain at home and peacefully await the bounties of your son Eugène. But if the people rise and our brave bourgeois think themselves in danger, there will be a fine part to play. Your husband is somewhat heavy. Oh, said Felicite, I'll undertake to make him supple. Do you think the department will revolt? To my mind, it's a certainty. Plassan perhaps will not make a stir. The reaction has secured too firm a hold here for that. But the neighboring towns, especially the small ones and the villages, have long been worked by certain secret societies and belong to the advanced Republican Party. If a coup d'etat should burst forth, the toxin will be heard throughout the entire country, from the forests of the Seyid to the plateau of saint Roux. Felicité reflected. You think, then, she resumed, that an insurrection is necessary to ensure our fortune. That's my opinion, replied Monsieur de Carnavant, and he added with a slightly ironical smile, A new dynasty is never founded excepting upon an affray. But is good manure. It'll be a fine thing for the Rougeon to date from a massacre like certain illustrious families. These words, accompanied by a sneer, sent a cold chill through Felicité's bones. But she was a strong-minded woman, and the sight of Monsieur Perrault's beautiful curtains, which she religiously viewed every morning, sustained her courage. Whenever she felt herself giving way, she planted herself at the window and contemplated the tax receiver's house. For her, it was the Tuileries. She had determined upon the most extreme measures in order to secure an entree into the new town, that promised land, on the threshold of which she'd stood with burning longing for so many years. The conversation which she had held with the Marquise had at last clearly revealed the situation to her. A few days afterwards, she succeeded in reading one of Eugène's letters in which he, who was working for the coup d'état, seemed also to rely upon an insurrection as the means of endowing his father with some importance. Eugène knew his department well. 
All his suggestions had been framed with the object of placing as much influence as possible in the hands of the yellow drawing room reactionaries, so that the Rougeon might be able to hold the town at the critical moment. In accordance with his desires, the yellow drawing room was master of Plassans in November 1851. Rudier represented the rich citizens there, and his attitude would certainly decide that of the entire new town. Granu was still more valuable. He had the municipal council behind him. He was its most powerful member, a fact which will give some idea of its other members. Finally, through Commander Sicardo, whom the Marquis had succeeded in getting appointed as chief of a national guard, the yellow drawing room had the armed forces at their disposal. The Rougeons, those poor, disreputable devils, had thus succeeded in rallying round themselves the instruments of their own fortune. Everyone, from cowardice or stupidity, would have to obey them and work in the dark for their aggrandizement. They simply had to fear those other influences which might be working with the same object as themselves and might partially rob them of the merit of victory. That was their great fear, for they wanted to reserve to themselves the role of deliverers. They knew beforehand that they would be aided rather than hindered by the clergy and the nobility. But if the sub-prefect, the mayor, and the other functionaries were to take a step in advance and at once stifle the insurrection, they would find themselves thrown into the shade and even arrested in their exploits. They would have neither time nor means to make themselves useful. What they longed for was complete abstention, general panic among the functionaries. If only all regular administration should disappear and they could dispose of the destinies of Plassans for a single day, their fortune would be firmly established. Happily for them, there was not a man in the government service whose convictions were so firm or whose circumstances were so needy as to make him disposed to risk the game. The sub-prefect was a man of liberal spirit whom the executive had forgetfully left at Plassans, owing no doubt to the good repute of the town. Of timid character and incapable of exceeding his authority, he would no doubt be greatly embarrassed in the presence of an insurrection. The Rougeon, who knew that he was in favor of a democratic cause and who consequently never dreaded his zeal, were simply curious to know what attitude he would assume. As for the municipality, this did not cause them much apprehension. The mayor, M. Garçonnet, was a legitimist whose nomination had been procured by the influence of the Saint-Marc Quarter in 1849. He detested the Republicans and treated them with undisguised disdain. But he was too closely united by bonds of friendship with certain members of the church to lend any active hand in a Bonapartist coup d'etat. The other functionaries were in exactly the same position. The justices of the peace, the postmaster, the tax collector, as well as Monsieur Pierrot, the chief receiver of taxes, were all indebted for their posts to the clerical reaction and could not accept the empire with any great enthusiasm. The Rougeon, though they did not quite see how they might get rid of these people and clear the way for themselves, nevertheless indulged in sanguine hopes on finding there was little likelihood of anybody disputing their role as deliverers. But Denouement was drawing near. In the last few days of November, as the rumor of a coup d'etat was circulating, the Prince President was accused of seeking the position of Emperor. Eh, we'll call him whatever he likes, Granu exclaimed, provided he has those Republican rascals shot. This exclamation from Grenou, who was believed to be asleep, caused great commotion. The Marquise pretended not to have heard it, but all the bourgeois nodded approval. Rudier, who, being rich, did not fear to applaud the sentiment aloud, went so far as to declare, while glancing askance at Monsieur de Carnavan, that the position was no longer tenable, and that France must be chastised as soon as possible, never mind by what hand. The Marquis still maintained a silence which was interpreted as acquiescence, and thereupon the conservative clan, abandoning the cause of legitimacy, ventured to offer up prayers in favor of the empire. 
my friends said commander sicardot rising from his seat only a napoleon can now protect threatened life and property have no fear i've taken the necessary precautions to preserve order at plassans as a matter of fact the commander in concert with rougeon had concealed in a kind of cart house near the ramparts both a supply of cartridges and a considerable number of muskets he had also taken steps to secure the cooperation of the national guard on which he believed he could rely his words produced a very favorable impression on separating for the evening the peaceful citizens of the yellow drawing-room spoke of massacring the reds if they should dare to stir on december first pierre rougeon received a letter from eugene which he went to read in his bedroom in accordance with his prudent habit felicite observed however that he was very agitated when he came out again she fluttered round the secretaire all day when night came she could restrain her impatience no longer her husband had scarcely fallen asleep when she quietly got up took the key of the secretaire from the waistcoat pocket and gained possession of the letter with as little noise as possible eugene in ten lines warned his father that the crisis was at hand and advised him to acquaint his mother with the situation of affairs the hour for informing her had arrived he might stand in need of her advice felicite awaited on the morrow a disclosure which did not come she did not dare to confess her curiosity but continued to feign ignorance though in enraged at the foolish distrust of her husband who doubtless considered her a gossip and weak like other women pierre with that marital pride which inspires a man with the belief in his own superiority at home had ended by attributing all their past ill luck to his wife from the time that he fancied he'd been conducting matters alone everything seemed to him to have gone as he desired he had decided therefore to dispense altogether with his consort's counsels and to confide nothing to her in spite of his son's recommendations felicite was piqued to such a degree that she would have upset the whole affair had she not desired the triumph as ardently as pierre so she continued to work energetically for victory while endeavouring to take her revenge ah if he could only have some great fright thought she if he would only commit some act of imprudence then i should see him come to me and humbly ask for advice it would be my turn to lay down the law she felt somewhat uneasy at the imperious attitude pierre would certainly assume if he were to triumph without her aid on marrying this peasant's son in preference to some notary's clerk she had intended to make use of him as a strongly made puppet whose string she would pull in her own way and now at the decisive moment the puppet in his blind stupidity wanted to work alone all the cunning all the feverish activity within the old woman protested against this she knew pierre was quite capable of some brutal resolve such as that which he had taken when he compelled his mother to sign the receipt for fifty thousand francs but tool was indeed a useful and unscrupulous one but she felt the necessity for guiding it especially under present circumstances when considerable suppleness was requisite the official news of the coup d'etat did not reach plassans until the evening of december third thursday already at seven o'clock in the evening there was a full meeting in the yellow drawing-room although the crisis had been eagerly desired vague uneasiness appeared on the faces of the majority they discussed events amid endless chatter pierre who like the others was slightly pale thought it right as an extreme measure of prudence to excuse prince louis's decisive act to the legitimists and orleanists who were present there's talk of an appeal to the people he said the nation will then be free to choose whatever government it likes the president is a man to retire before our legitimate masters the marquis who had retained his aristocratic coolness was the only one who greeted these words with a smile the others in the enthusiasm of the moment concerned themselves very little about what might follow all their opinions foundered 
Rudier, forgetting the esteem which, as a former shopkeeper, he had entertained for the Orleanists, stopped Pierre rather abruptly. And everybody exclaimed, Don't argue the matter. Let's think of preserving order. These good people were terribly afraid of the Republicans. There had, however, been very little commotion in the town on the announcement of the events in Paris. People had collected in front of the notices posted on the door of the subprefecture. It was also rumored that a few hundred workmen had left their work and were endeavoring to organize resistance. That was all. No serious disturbance seemed likely to occur. The course which the neighboring towns and rural districts might take seemed more likely to occasion anxiety. However, it was not yet known how they received the news of the coup d'etat. Granou arrived at about nine o'clock, quite out of breath. He had just left a sitting of the municipal council, which had been hastily summoned together. Choking with emotion, he announced that the mayor, Monsieur Garçonnet, had declared, while making due reserves, that he was determined to preserve order by the most stringent measures. However, the intelligence which caused the noisiest chattering in the yellow drawing room was that of the resignation of the subprefect. This functionary had absolutely refused to communicate the dispatches of the Minister of the Interior to the inhabitants of Plassans. He had just left the town, so Grenou asserted, and it was thanks to the mayor that the messages had been posted. This was perhaps the only sub-prefect in France who had ever had the courage of his democratic opinions. Although M. Garçonnet's firm demeanor caused the Rougeon some secret anxiety, they rubbed their hands at the flight of the sub-prefect, which left the post vacant for them. It was decided on this memorable evening that the yellow drawing-room party should accept the coup d'etat and openly declare that it was in favor of accomplished facts. Fouillet was commissioned to write an article to that effect and publish it on the morrow in the Gazette. Neither he nor the Marquise raised any objection. They had, no doubt, received instructions from the mysterious individuals to whom they sometimes made pious allusions. The clergy and the nobility were already resigned to the course of lending a strong hand to the victors in order to crush their common enemy, the Republic. While the yellow drawing room was deliberating on the evening in question, Aristide was perspiring with anxiety. Never had a gambler, staking his last louis on a card, felt such anguish. During the day, the resignation of his chief, the sub-prefect, had given him much matter for reflection. He'd heard him repeat several times that the coup d'etat must prove a failure. This functionary, endowed with a limited amount of honesty, believed in the final triumph of a democracy, though he had not the courage to work for that triumph by offering resistance. Aristide was in the habit of listening at the doors of the sub-prefecture in order to get precise information, for he felt that he was groping in the dark and clung to the intelligence which he gleaned from the officials. The sub-prefect's opinion struck him forcibly, but he remained perplexed. He thought to himself, Why does the fellow go away if he's so certain that the prince president will meet with a check? However, as he was compelled to espouse one side or the other, he resolved to continue his opposition. He wrote a very hostile article on the coup d'etat and took it to the Indépendant the same evening for the following morning's issue. He had corrected the proofs of this article and was returning home somewhat calmed when, as he passed along the Rue de la Bain, he instinctively raised his head and glanced at the Rougeon's windows. Their windows were brightly lighted up. What can they be plotting up there? The journalist asked himself, with anxious curiosity. A fierce desire to know the opinion of the yellow drawing room with regard to recent events then assailed him. He credited this group of reactionaries with little intelligence, but his doubts recurred. He was in that frame of mind when one might seek advice from a child. He could not think of entering his father's home at that moment, after the campaign he had waged against Grenou and the others. Nevertheless, he went upstairs, reflecting what a singular figure he would cut if he were surprised on the way by anyone. On reaching the Rougeon's door, he could only catch a confused echo of voices. "'What a child I am,' said he, 
Fear makes me stupid. And he was going to descend again when he heard the approach of his mother, who was about to show somebody out. He had barely time to hide in the dark corner formed by a little staircase leading to the garrets of the house. The Rougeon's door opened and the Marquise appeared, followed by Félicité. Monsieur de Carnavant usually left before the gentlemen of a new town did, in order, no doubt, to avoid having to shake hands with them in the street. "'Eh, hey, little one,' he said on the landing, in a low voice, "'these men are greater cowards than I should have thought. With such men, France will always be at the mercy of whoever dares to lay his hand upon her.' And he added, with some bitterness, as though speaking to himself, the monarchy is decidedly becoming too honest for modern times. Its day is over. Eugène announced the crisis to his father, replied Felicité. Prince Louis' triumph seems to him certain. Oh, you can proceed without fear, the Marquise replied as he descended the first steps. In two or three days, the country will be well bound and gagged. Goodbye till tomorrow, little one. Felicité closed the door again. Aristide had received quite a shock in his dark corner. However, without waiting for the Marquise to reach the street, he bounded down the staircase four steps at a time, rushed outside like a madman, and turned his steps towards the printing office of the Independent. A flood of thought surged through his mind. He was enraged and accused his family of having duped him. What? Eugène kept his parents informed of a situation, and yet his mother had never given him any of his eldest brother's letters to read, in order that he might follow the advice given therein. And it was only now he learnt by chance that his eldest brother regarded the success of the coup d'etat as certain. This circumstance, however, confirmed certain presentiments, which that idiot of a sub-prefect had prevented him from obeying. He was especially exasperated against his father, whom he thought stupid enough to be a legitimist, but who revealed himself as a Bonapartist at the right moment. "'What a lot of folly they have allowed me to perpetrate,' he muttered as he ran along. "'I'm a fine fellow now. Ah, oh, what a lesson. Granou's more capable than I.' He entered the office of the Independent like a hurricane, and asked for his article in a choking voice. The article had already been imposed. He had the form unlocked and would not rest until he himself destroyed the setting, mixing the type in a furious manner like a set of dominoes. The bookseller who managed the paper looked at him in amazement. He was, in reality, rather glad of the incident, as the article had seemed to him somewhat dangerous but he was absolutely obliged to have some copy if the Independent was to appear. "'Are you going to give me something else?' he asked. "'Certainly,' replied Aristide. He sat down at the table and began a warm panegyric on the coup d'etat. At the very first line, he swore that Prince Louis had just saved the Republic, but he'd hardly written the page before he stopped and seemed at a loss how to continue. A troubled look came over his polecat face. "'I must go home,' he said at last. "'I will send you this immediately. Your paper can appear a little later if necessary.' He walked slowly on his way home, lost in meditation. He was again giving way to indecision. Why should he veer round so quickly? Eugène was an intelligent fellow— but his mother had perhaps exaggerated the significance of some sentence in his letter. In any case, it would be better to wait and hold his tongue. An hour later, Angèle called at the booksellers, feigning deep emotion. "'My husband has just severely injured himself,' she said. "'He jammed his four fingers in a door as he was coming in.' In spite of his sufferings, he's dictated this little note, which he begs you to publish tomorrow. On the following day, the Independent, made up almost entirely of miscellaneous items of news, appeared with these few lines at the head of the first column. A deplorable accident which has occurred to our eminent contributor, Monsieur Aristide Rougeon, will deprive us of his articles for some time. 
he will suffer at having to remain silent in the present grave circumstances. None of our readers will doubt, however, the good wishes which he offers up with patriotic feelings for the welfare of France. This burlesque note had been maturely studied. The last sentence might be interpreted in favor of all parties. By this expedient, Aristide devised a glorious return for himself on the morrow of battle in the shape of a laudatory article on the victors. On the following day, he showed himself to the whole town with his arm in a sling. His mother, frightened by the notice in the paper, hastily called upon him, but he refused to show his hand and spoke with a bitterness which enlightened the old woman. "'It won't be anything,' she said in a reassuring and somewhat sarcastic tone as she was leaving. "'You only want a little rest.' It was no doubt owing to this pretended accident and the sub-prefect's departure that the Indépendant was not interfered with like most of the democratic papers of the departments. The fourth day of the month proved comparatively quiet at Passant. In the evening there was a public demonstration which the mere appearance of the gendarmes sufficed to disperse. A band of working men came to request Monsieur Garçonnet to communicate the dispatches he had received from Paris, which the latter haughtily refused to do. As it retired, the band shouted, Long live the Republic! Long live the Constitution! After this, order was restored. The yellow drawing room, after commenting at some length on this innocent parade, concluded that affairs were going on excellently. The fifth and sixth were, however, more disquieting. Intelligence was received of successive risings in small neighboring towns. The whole southern part of a department had taken up arms. La Palou and Saint-Martin-de-Vaux had been the first to rise, drawing after them the villages of Chabanneau, Nazaire, Pougeot, Valterra, and Vernou. The yellow drawing-room party was now becoming seriously alarmed. It felt particularly uneasy at seeing Plassan isolated in the very midst of the revolt. Bands of insurgents would certainly scour the country and cut off all communications. Granou announced, with a terrified look, that the mayor was without any news. Some people even asserted that blood had been shed at Marseille and that a formidable revolution had broken out in Paris. Commander Sicardot, enraged at the cowardice of the bourgeois, vowed that he would die the head of his men. On Sunday the 7th, the terror reached a climax. Already at six o'clock the yellow drawing room, where a sort of reactionary committee sat en permanence, was crowded with pale, trembling men who conversed in undertones, as though they were in a chamber of death. It had been ascertained during the day that a column of insurgents, about 3,000 strong, had assembled at Alboise, a big village not more than three leagues away. It was true that this column had been ordered to make for the chief town of the department, leaving Plesson on its left, but the plan of campaign might at any time be altered. Moreover, it sufficed for these cowardly sits to know that there were insurgents a few miles off to make them feel the horny hands of the toilers already tightened round their throats. They had had a foretaste of the revolt in the morning, the few Republicans at Plessant, seeing that they would be unable to make any determined move in the town, had resolved to join their brethren of La Palou and Saint-Martin-de-Vaux. The first group had left at about eleven o'clock by the Porte de Rome, shouting the Marseillais and smashing a few windows. Granou had had one broken. He mentioned the circumstances with stammerings of terror. Meantime, the most acute anxiety agitated the yellow drawing-room. The commander had sent his servant to obtain some information as to the exact movements of the insurgents, and the others awaited this man's return, making the most astonishing surmises. They had a full meeting. Rudier and Granou, sinking back in their armchairs, exchanged the most pitiable glances, whilst behind them moaned a terror-stricken group of retired tradesmen. Fouillet, without appearing over-scared, reflected upon what precautions he should take to protect his shop and person. He was in doubt whether he should hide himself in his garret or cellar and incline towards the latter. For their part, Pierre and the commander walked up and down, exchanging a word ever and anon. 
The old oil dealer clung to this friend Sicardot as if to borrow a little courage from him. He, who had been awaiting the crisis for such a long time, now endeavored to keep his countenance in spite of the emotion which was stifling him. As for the Marquise, more spruce and smiling than usual, he conversed in a corner with Felicité, who seemed very gay. At last a ring came. The gentlemen started as if they'd heard a gunshot. Dead silence reigned in the drawing room when Felicité went to open the door, towards which their pale, anxious faces were turned. Then the commander's servant appeared on the threshold quite out of breath and said abruptly to his master, Sir, the insurgents will be here in an hour. This was a thunderbolt. They all started up, vociferating and raising their arms towards the ceiling. For several minutes it was impossible to hear oneself speak. The company surrounded the messenger, overwhelming him with questions. Damnation, the commander at length shouted. Don't make such a row. Be calm or I won't answer for anything. Everyone sank back in his chair again, heaving long-drawn sighs. They then obtained a few particulars. The messenger had met the column at Les Tulettes and had hastened to return. There are at least three thousand of them, said he. They are marching in battalions, like soldiers. I thought I caught sight of some prisoners in their midst. Prisoners, cried the terrified bourgeois. No doubt, the Marquis interrupted in his shrill voice. I've heard that the insurgents arrest all persons who are known to have conservative leanings. This information gave a finishing touch to the consternation of the yellow drawing room. A few bourgeois got up and stealthily made for the door, reflecting that they had not too much time before them to gain a place of safety. The announcement of the arrests made by the Republicans appeared to strike Felicité. She took the Marquise aside and asked him, what do these men do with the people they arrest? Why, they carry them off in their train, Monsieur de Carnavant replied. They no doubt consider them excellent hostages. Ah, the old woman rejoined in a strange tone. Then she again thoughtfully watched the curious scene of panic around her. The bourgeois gradually disappeared. Soon there only remained Vuillet and Roudier, whom the approaching danger inspired with some courage. As for Granou, he likewise remained in his corner, his legs refusing to perform their office. Well, I like this better, Sicardo remarked, as he observed the flight of the other adherents. Those cowards were exasperating me at last. For more than two years they've been speaking of shooting all the Republicans in the province, and today they wouldn't even fire a halfpenny cracker under their noses. Then he took up his hat and turned towards the door. Let's see, he continued. Time presses. Come, Rougeon. Felicité, it seemed, had been waiting for this moment. She placed herself between the door and her husband, who, for that matter, was not particularly eager to follow the formidable Sicardo. I won't have you go out, she cried, feigning sudden despair. I won't let you leave my side. Those scoundrels will kill you. The commander stopped in amazement. Hang it all, he growled, if women are going to whine now. Come along, Rougeon. No, no, continued the old woman, affecting increase of terror. He shan't follow you. I will hang on to his clothes and prevent him. The Marquise, very much surprised at the scene, looked inquiringly at Felicité. Was this really the woman who had just now been conversing so merrily? What comedy was she playing? Pierre, meantime, seeing that his wife wanted to detain him, deigned the determination to force his way out. I tell you, you shall not go, the old woman reiterated as she clung to one of his arms. And turning towards the commander, she said to him, How can you think of offering any resistance? They are three thousand strong, and you won't be able to collect a hundred men of any spirit. You are rushing into the cannon's mouth to no purpose. Ah, that is our duty, said Sicardo impatiently. Felicité burst into sobs. If they don't kill him, they'll make him a prisoner, she continued, looked fixedly at her husband. 
Good heavens, what will become of me, left alone in an abandoned town? But, exclaimed the commander, we shall be arrested just the same if we allow the insurgents to enter the town unmolested. I believe that before an hour has elapsed, the mayor and all the functionaries will be prisoners, to say nothing of your husband and the frequenters of this drawing-room. The Marquis thought he saw a vague smile play about Felicité's lips as she answered with a look of dismay. Do you really think so? Of course, replied Sicardot. The Republicans are not so stupid as to leave enemies behind them. Tomorrow, Plassin will be emptied of its functionaries and good citizens. At these words, which she had so cleverly provoked, Felicité released her husband's arms. Pierre no longer looked as if he wanted to go out. Thanks to his wife, whose skillful tactics escaped him, however, and whose secret complicity he never for a moment suspected, he had just lighted on a whole plan of campaign. We must deliberate before taking any decision, he said to the commander. My wife is perhaps not wrong in accusing us of forgetting the true interests of our families. No, indeed, madame is not wrong, cried Granou, who'd been listening to Felicité's terrified cries with the rapture of a coward. Thereupon the commander energetically clapped his hat on his head and said in a clear voice, Right or wrong, it matters little to me. I am commander of the National Guard. I ought to have been at the mayor's before now. Confess that you are afraid, that you leave me to act alone. Well, good night. He was just turning the handle of the door when Rougeon forcibly detained him. Listen, Sicardot, he said. He drew him into a corner on seeing Vouillet prick up his big ears. And there he explained to him, in an undertone, that it would be a good plan to leave a few energetic men behind the insurgents so as to restore order in the town. And as the fierce commander obstinately refused to desert his post, Pierre offered to place himself at the head of such a reserve corps. Give me the key of the cart shed in which the arms and ammunition are kept, he said to him, and order some fifty of our men not to stir until I call for them. Sicardot ended by consenting to these prudent measures. He entrusted Pierre with the key of the cart shed, convinced as he was of the inexpediency of present resistance, but still desirous of sacrificing himself. During this conversation, the Marquise had whispered a few words in Felicité's ear with a knowing look. He complimented her, no doubt, on her theatrical display. The old woman could not repress a faint smile. But as Sicardo shook hands with Rougeon and prepared to go, she again asked him with an air of fright, Are you really determined to leave us? It is not for one of Napoleon's old soldiers to let himself be intimidated by the mob, he replied. He was already on the landing when Grenou hurried out after him, crying, If you go to the mayor's, tell him what's going on. I'll just run home to my wife to reassure her. Then Felicité bent towards the Marquis's ear and whispered with discreet gaiety, Upon my word, it is best that devil of a commander should go and get himself arrested. He's far too zealous. However, Rougeon brought Granou back to the drawing room. Rudier, who had quietly followed the scene from his corner, making signs in support of the proposed measures of prudence, got up and joined them. When the Marquise and Bouillet had likewise risen, Pierre began. Now that we are alone... Among peaceable men, I propose that we should conceal ourselves so as to avoid certain arrest, and be at liberty as soon as ours again becomes the stronger party. Grenou was ready to embrace him. Rudier and Vouillet breathed more easily. I shall want you shortly, gentlemen, the oil dealer continued with an important air. It is to us that the honor of restoring order in Plassan is reserved. You may rely upon us, cried Vouillet, with an enthusiasm which disturbed Felicité. Time was pressing. These singular defenders of Plassan, who hid themselves the better to protect the town, hastened away to bury themselves in some hole or other. 
Pierre, on being left alone with his wife, advised her not to make the mistake of barricading herself indoors, but to reply, if anybody came to question her, that he, Pierre, had simply gone on a short journey. And as she acted the simpleton, feigning terror and asking what all this was coming to, he replied abruptly, It's nothing to do with you. Let me manage our affairs alone. They'll get on all the better. A few minutes later, he was rapidly threading his way along the Rue de la Banne. On reaching the Cour Sauveur, he saw a band of armed workmen coming out of the old quarter and singing the Marseillaise. The devil, he thought. It was quite time indeed. Here's the town itself in revolt now. He quickened his steps in the direction of the Porte de Rome. Cold perspiration came over him while he waited there for the dilatory keeper to open the gate. Almost as soon as he set foot on the high road, he perceived in the moonlight at the other end of the Faubourg the column of insurgents whose gun barrels gleamed like white flames. So it was at a run that he dived into the impasse Saint-Mitre and reached his mother's house, which he had not visited for many a long year. This ends Chapter 3, Part 2. Section 8 of The Fortune of the Rougeon, Book 1 of Rougeon Maca Cycle by Emile Zola, translated by Henry Bizzatelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Mark Leder. Chapter 4, Part 1. Antoine Maca had returned to Plessan after the fall of the first Napoleon. He had had the incredible good fortune to escape all the final murderous campaigns of the empire. He had moved from barracks to barracks, dragging on his brutifying military life. This mode of existence brought his natural vices to full development. His idleness became deliberate. His intemperance, which brought him countless punishments, became to his mind a veritable religious duty. But that which above all made him the worst of scapegraces was the supercilious disdain which he entertained for the poor devils who had to earn their bread. "'I've got money waiting for me at home,' he often said to his comrades. "'When I've served my time, I shall be able to live like a gentleman.' This belief, together with his stupid ignorance, prevented him from rising even to the grade of corporal, since his departure, he'd never spent a day's furlough at Plassans, his brother having invented a thousand pretexts to keep him at a distance. He was therefore completely ignorant of the adroit manner in which Pierre had got possession of their mother's fortune. Adelaide, with her profound indifference, did not even write to him three times to tell him how she was going on. The silence which generally greeted his numerous requests for money did not awaken the least suspicion in him. Pierre's stinginess sufficed to explain the difficulty he experienced in securing from time to time a paltry twenty-franc piece. This, however, only increased his animosity towards his brother, who left him to languish in military service in spite of his formal promise to purchase his discharge. He vowed to himself that on his return home he would no longer submit like a child, but would flatly demand his share of the fortune to enable him to live as he pleased. In the diligence which conveyed him home, he dreamed of a delightful life of idleness. The shattering of his castles in the air was terrible. When he reached the Faubourg and could no longer even recognize the Fouquet's plot of ground, he was stupefied. He was compelled to ask for his mother's new address. There a terrible scene occurred. Adelaide calmly informed him of the sale of the property. He flew into a rage and even raised his hand against her. The poor woman kept repeating, Your brother has taken everything. It's understood that he will take care of you. At last he left her and ran off to see Pierre, whom he previously informed of his return, and who was prepared to receive him in such a way as to put an end to the matter at the first word of abuse. Listen, the oil dealer said to him, 
affecting distant coldness. Don't rouse my anger, or I'll turn you out. As a matter of fact, I don't know you. We don't bear the same name. It's quite misfortune enough for me that my mother misconducted herself without having her offspring coming here and insulting me. I was well disposed towards you, but since you are insolent, I shall do nothing for you. Absolutely nothing. Antoine was almost choking with rage. And what about my money, he cried. Will you give it up, you thief? Or shall I have to drag you before the judges? Pierre shrugged his shoulders. I've got no money of yours, he replied, more calmly than ever. My mother disposed of her fortune as she thought proper. I'm certainly not going to poke my nose into her business. I willingly renounced all hope of inheritance. I'm quite safe from your foul accusations. And as his brother, exasperated by this composure and not knowing what to think, muttered something, Pierre thrust Adelaide's receipt under his nose. The reading of the scrap of paper completed Antoine's dismay. Very well, he said in a calmer voice. I know now what I have to do. The trouble was, however, he did not know what to do. His inability to hit upon any immediate expedient for obtaining his share of the money and satisfying his desire of revenge increased his fury. He went back to his mother and subjected her to a disgraceful cross-examination. The wretched woman could do nothing but again refer him to Pierre. "'Do you think you're going to make me run to and fro like a shuttle?' he cried insolently. "'I'll soon find out which of you two has the hoard. You've already squandered it, perhaps?' And making an allusion to her former misconduct, he asked her if there was still not some low fellow to whom she gave her last sou. He did not even spare his father, that drunkard Macar, as he called him, who must have lived on her till the day of his death, and who left his children in poverty. The poor woman listened with a stupefied air. Big tears rolled down her cheeks. She defended herself with the terror of a child, replying to her son's questions as though he were a judge. She swore that she was living respectably and reiterated with emphasis that she never had a sou of the money, that Pierre had taken everything. Antoine almost came to believe it at last. Ah, the scoundrel, he muttered. That's why he wouldn't purchase my discharge. He had to sleep at his mother's house on a straw mattress flung in a corner. He had returned with his pockets perfectly empty and was exasperated at finding himself destitute of resources, abandoned like a dog in the streets without hearth or home, while his brother, as he thought, was in a good way of business and living on the fat of the land. As he had no money to buy clothes with, he went out on the following day in his regimental cap and trousers. He had the good fortune to find, at the bottom of a cupboard, an old yellowish velveteen jacket, threadbare and patched, which had belonged to Macar. In this strange attire he walked about the town, relating his story to everyone and demanding justice. The people whom he went to consult received him with a contempt which made him shed tears of rage. Provincial folks are inexorable towards fallen families. In the general opinion, it was only natural that the Rougeon Macquart should seek to devour each other. The spectators, instead of separating them, were more inclined to urge them on. Pierre, however, was at that time already beginning to purify himself of his early stains. People laughed at his roguery. Some even went so far as to say that he'd done quite right if he really had taken possession of the money, and that it would be a good lesson to the dissolute folks of the town. Antoine returned home discouraged. A lawyer had advised him, in a scornful manner, to wash his dirty linen at home, though not until he had skillfully ascertained whether Antoine possessed the requisite means to carry on a lawsuit. According to this man, the case was very involved, the pleadings would be very lengthy, and success was doubtful. Moreover, it would require money, and plenty of it. 
Antoine treated his mother yet more harshly that evening. Not knowing on whom else to wreak his vengeance, he repeated his accusation of the previous day. He kept the wretched woman up till midnight, trembling with shame and fright. Adelaide, having informed him that Pierre made her an allowance, he now felt certain that his brother had pocketed the fifty thousand francs. But in his irritation he still affected to doubt it, and did not cease to question the poor woman, again and again reproaching her with misconduct. Antoine soon found out that, alone and without resources, he could not successfully carry on a contest with his brother. He then endeavored to gain Adelaide to his cause. An accusation lodged by her might have serious consequences. But at Antoine's first suggestion of it, the poor, lazy, lethargic creature firmly refused to bring trouble on her eldest son. "'I am an unhappy woman,' she stammered. "'It's quite right of you to get angry. "'But I should feel too much remorse "'if I caused one of my sons to be sent to prison. "'No, I'd rather let you beat me.' "'He saw that he would get nothing but tears out of her, "'and contented himself with saying that she was justly punished "'and that he had no pity for her.' In the evening, upset by the continual quarrels which her son had sought with her, Adelaide had one of those nervous attacks which kept her as rigid as if she'd been dead. The young man threw her on her bed and then began to rummage the house to see if the wretched woman had any savings hidden away. He found about forty francs. He took possession of them, and while his mother still lay there, rigid and scarce able to breathe, he quietly took the diligence to Marseilles. He had just bethought himself that Moray, the journeyman hatter who had married his sister Ursule, must be indignant at Pierre's roguery and would no doubt be willing to defend his wife's interests. But he did not find in him the man he expected. Moray plainly told him that he had become accustomed to look upon Ursule as an orphan and would have no contentions with her family at any price. Their affairs were prospering, and Juan was received so coldly that he hastened to take the diligence home again. But before leaving, he was anxious to revenge himself for the secret contempt which he read in the workman's eyes, and, observing that his sister appeared rather pale and dejected, he said to her husband, in a slyly cruel way, as he took his departure, "'Have a care. My sister was always sickly, and I find her much changed for the worse. You may lose her altogether. The tears which rushed to Moray's eyes convinced him that he had touched a sore wound. But then those work people made too great a display of their happiness. When he was back again in Plessant, Antoine became the more menacing from the conviction that his hands were tied. During a whole month he was seen all over the place, he paraded the streets, recounting his story to all who would listen to him. Whenever he succeeded in extorting a franc from his mother, he would drink it away at some tavern, where he would revile his brother, declaring that the rascals should shortly hear from him. In places like these, the good-natured fraternity which reigns among drunkards procured him a sympathetic audience. All the scum of the town espoused his cause and poured forth bitter imprecations against that rascal Rougeon who left a brave soldier to starve, the discussion generally terminating with an indiscriminate condemnation of the rich. Antoine, the better to revenge himself, continued to march about in his regimental cap and trousers and his old yellow velvet jacket, although his mother had offered to purchase some more becoming clothes for him. But no, he preferred to make a display of his rags and paraded them on Sundays in the most frequented parts of the Cour Salvaire. One of his most exquisite pleasures was to pass Pierre's shop ten times a day. He would enlarge the holes in his jacket with his fingers, slacken his step, and sometimes stand talking in front of a door so as to remain longer in the street. On these occasions, too, he would bring one of his drunken friends and gossip to him, telling him about the theft of the 50,000 francs, accompanying his narrative with loud insults and menaces, which could be heard by 
everyone in the street and taking particular care that his abuse should reach the furthest end of the shop. He'll finish by coming to beg in front of our house, Felicite used to say in despair. The vain little woman suffered terribly from this scandal. She even at this time felt some regret at ever having married Rougeon. His family connections were so objectionable. She would have given all she had in the world to prevent Antoine from parading his rags. But Pierre, who was maddened by his brother's conduct, would not allow his name to be mentioned. When his wife tried to convince him that it would perhaps be better to free him from all annoyance by giving Antoine a little money, no, nothing, not a sou, he cried with rage. Let him starve. He confessed, however, at last, that Antoine's demeanor was becoming intolerable. One day, Felicité, desiring to put an end to it, called to that man, as she styled him with a disdainful curl on her lip. That man was in the act of calling her a foul name in the middle of a street, where he stood with one of his friends, even more ragged than himself. They were both drunk. Come, they want us in there, said Antoine to his companion in a jeering tone. But Felicité drew back, muttering, It's you alone we wish to speak to. Bah, the young man replied, My friend's a decent fellow. You needn't mind him hearing. He'll be my witness. The witness sank heavily on a chair. He did not take off his hat, but began to stare around him with the maudlin, stupid grin of drunkards and coarse people who know that they are insolent. Felicite was so ashamed that she stood in front of a shop door in order that people outside might not see what strange company she was receiving. Fortunately, her husband came to the rescue. A violent quarrel ensued between him and his brother. The latter, after stammering insults, reiterated his old grievances twenty times over. At last he even began to cry, and his companion was near following his example. Pierre had defended himself in a very dignified manner. Look here, he said at last, you are unfortunate, and I pity you. Although you have cruelly insulted me, I cannot forget that we are children of the same mother. If I give you anything, however, you must understand I give it to you out of kindness and not from fear. Would you like a hundred francs to help you out of your difficulties? This abrupt offer of a hundred francs dazzled Antoine's companion. He looked at the other with an air of delight which clearly signified, As the gentleman offers a hundred francs, it's time to leave off abusing him. But Antoine was determined to speculate on his brother's favorable disposition. He asked him whether he took him for a fool. It was his share, ten thousand francs, that he wanted. You're wrong. You're wrong, stuttered his friend. At last, as Pierre, losing all patience, was threatening to turn them both out, Antoine lowered his demands and contented himself with claiming one thousand francs. They quarreled for another quarter of an hour over this amount. Finally, Felicité interfered. A crowd was gathering round the shop. Listen, she said excitedly, my husband will give you two hundred francs. I'll undertake to buy you a suit of clothes and hire a room for a year for you. Rougeon got angry at this, but Antoine's comrade cried with transports of delight, All right! It's settled then. My friend accepts. Antoine did, in fact, declare in a surly way that he would accept. He felt he would not be able to get any more. It was arranged that the money and clothes should be sent to him on the following day, and that a few days later, as soon as Felicité should have found a room for him, he would take up his quarters there. As they were leaving, the young man's sottish companion became as respectful as he had previously been insolent. He bowed to the company more than a dozen times, in an awkward and humble manner, muttering many indistinct thanks, as if the Rougeon's gifts had been intended for himself. A week later, Antoine occupied a large room in the old quarter, in which Felicité, exceeding her promises, had placed a bed, a table and some chairs, 
on the young man formally undertaking not to molest them in future. Adelaide felt no regret at her son leaving her. The short stay he'd made with her had condemned her to bread and water for more than three months. However, Antoine had soon eaten and drunk the two hundred francs he received from Pierre. He never for a moment thought of investing them in some little business which would have helped him to live. When he was again penniless, having no trade and being moreover unwilling to work, he again sought to slip a hand into the Rougeon's purse. Circumstances were not the same as before, however, and he failed to intimidate them. Pierre even took advantage of this opportunity to turn him out and forbade him ever to set foot in his house again. It was of no avail for Antoine to repeat his former accusations. The townspeople, who were acquainted with his brother's munificence from the publicity which Felicité had given to it, declared him to be in the wrong and called him a lazy, idle fellow. Meanwhile, his hunger was pressing. He threatened to turn smuggler like his father and perpetrate some crime which would dishonor his family. At this, the Rougeons shrugged their shoulders. They knew he was too much of a coward to risk his neck. At last, blindly enraged against his relatives in particular and society in general, Antoine made up his mind to seek some work. In a tavern of the Faubourg, he made the acquaintance of a basket maker who worked at home. He offered to help him. In a short time, he learned to plate baskets and hampers, a coarse and poorly paid kind of labor which finds a ready market. He was very soon able to work on his own account. This trade pleased him as it was not over laborious. He could still indulge his idleness, and that was what he chiefly cared for. He would only take to his work when he could no longer do otherwise. Then he would hurriedly plate a dozen baskets and go and sell them in the market. As long as the money lasted, he lounged about, visiting all the taverns and digesting his drink in the sunshine. Then, when he'd fasted a whole day, he would once more take up his osier with a low growl and revile the wealthy who lived in idleness. The trade of a basket-maker, when followed in such a manner, is a thankless one. Antoine's work would not have sufficed to pay for his drinking bouts if he had not contrived a means of procuring his osier at low cost. He never bought any at Plassans, but used to say that he went each month to purchase a stock at a neighboring town, where he pretended it was sold cheaper. The truth, however, was that he supplied himself from the osier grounds of Viorne on dark nights. A rural policeman even caught him once in the very act, and Antoine underwent a few days' imprisonment in consequence. It was from that time forward that he posed in the town as a fierce Republican, he declared that he'd been quietly smoking his pipe by the riverside when the rural policemen arrested him, and he added, They'd like to get me out of the way because they know what my opinions are, but I'm not afraid of them, those rich scoundrels. At last, at the end of ten years of idleness, Antoine considered that he'd been working too hard. His constant dream was to devise some expedient by which he might live at his ease without having to do anything. His idleness would never have rested content with bread and water. He was not like certain lazy persons who are willing to put up with hunger, provided they can keep their hands in their pockets. He liked good feeding and nothing to do. He talked at one time of taking a situation as servant in some nobleman's house in the St. Mark quarter, but one of his friends, a groom, frightened him by describing the exacting ways of his masters. Finally, Macar, sick of his baskets, and seeing the time approach when he would be compelled to purchase the requisite osier, was on the point of selling himself as an army substitute and resuming his military life, which he preferred a thousand times to that of an artisan, when he made the acquaintance of a woman, an acquaintance which modified his plans. Josephine Gavaudin, who was known throughout the town by the familiar diminutive of Finet, was a tall, strapping wench of about thirty. With a square face of masculine proportions and a few terribly long hairs about her chin and lips, 
She was cited as a doughty woman, one who could make the weight of her fist felt. Her broad shoulders and huge arms consequently inspired the town urchins with marvelous respect, and they did not even dare to smile at her mustache. Notwithstanding all this, Finet had a faint voice, weak and clear like that of a child. Those who were acquainted with her asserted that she was as gentle as a lamb in spite of her formidable appearance. As she was very hard-working, she might have put some money aside if she'd not had a partiality for liqueurs. She adored aniseed and very often had to be carried home on Sunday evenings. On weekdays she would toil with the stubbornness of an animal. She had three or four different occupations. She sold fruit or boiled chestnuts in the market, according to the season, went out charring for a few well-to-do people, washed up plates and dishes at houses when parties were given, and employed her spare time in mending old chairs. She was more particularly known in the town as a chair mender. In the South, large numbers of straw-bottomed chairs are used. Antoine Macquart formed an acquaintance with Finet at the market. When he went to sell his baskets in the winter, he'd stand beside the stove on which she cooled her chestnuts and warm himself. He was astonished at her courage, he who was frightened of the least work. By degrees, he discerned, beneath the apparent roughness of the strapping creature, signs of timidity and kindliness. He frequently saw her give handfuls of chestnuts to the ragged urchins who stood in ecstasy round her smoking pot. At other times, when the market inspector hustled her, she very nearly began to cry, apparently forgetting all about her heavy fists. Antoine at last decided that she was exactly the woman he wanted. She would work for both, and he would lay down the law at home. She would be his beast of burden, an obedient, indefatigable animal. As for her partiality for liqueurs, he regarded this as quite natural. After well weighing the advantages of such a union, he declared himself to Finet, who was delighted with his proposal. No man had ever yet ventured to propose to her. Though she was told that Antoine was the most worthless of vagabonds, she lacked the courage to refuse matrimony. The very evening of the nuptials, the young man took up his abode in his wife's lodgings in the Rue Civadière near the market. These lodgings, consisting of three rooms, were much more comfortably furnished than his own, and he gave a sigh of satisfaction as he stretched himself out on the two excellent mattresses which covered the bedstead. Everything went on very well for the first few days. Finet attended to her various occupations as in the past. Antoine, seized with a sort of marital self-pride, was astonished even himself, played it in one week more baskets than he had ever before done in a month. On the first Sunday, however, war broke out. The couple had a goodly sum of money in the house, and they spent it freely. During the night, when they were both drunk, they beat each other outrageously without being able to remember on the morrow how it was that the quarrel had commenced. They'd remained on most affectionate terms until about ten o'clock, when Antoine had begun to beat Finet brutally, whereupon the latter, growing exasperated and forgetting her meekness, had given him back as much as she received. She went to work again bravely on the following day, as though nothing had happened, but her husband, with sullen rancor, rose late and passed the remainder of the day smoking his pipe in the sunshine. From that time forward, the McCarts adopted the kind of life which they were destined to lead in the future. It became, as it were, tacitly understood between them that the wife should toil and moil to keep her husband. Finet, who had an instinctive liking for work, did not object to this. She was as patient as a saint, provided she had had no drink, thought it quite natural that her husband should remain idle, and even strove to spare him the most trifling labor. Her little weakness, Annecy, did not make her vicious, but just. On the evenings when she'd forgotten herself in the company of a bottle of her favorite liqueur, if Antoine tried to pick a quarrel with her, she would set upon him with might and main, reproaching him with his idleness and ingratitude. 
The neighbors grew accustomed to the disturbances which periodically broke out in the couple's room. The two battered each other conscientiously. The wife slapped like a mother chastising a naughty child, but the husband, treacherous and spiteful as he was, measured his blows, and on several occasions very nearly crippled the unfortunate woman. You will be in a fine plight when you've broken one of my arms or legs, she would say to him. Who'll keep you then, you lazy fellow? Excepting for these turbulent scenes, Antoine began to find his new mode of existence quite endurable. He was well clothed and ate and drank his fill. He had laid aside the basket work altogether. Sometimes when he was feeling overboard, he would resolve to plate a dozen baskets for the next market day. But very often he did not even finish the first one. He kept, under a couch, a bundle of osier which he did not use up in twenty years. The McCarts had three children, two girls and a boy. Lisa, footnote, the pork butcher's wife in Le Ventre de Paris, the fat and the thin. Born the first in 1827, one year after the marriage, remained but little at home. She was a fine, big, healthy, full-blooded child, greatly resembling her mother. She did not, however, inherit the latter's animal devotion and endurance. McCart had implanted in her a most decided longing for ease and comfort. While she was a child, she would consent to work for a whole day in return for a cake. When she was scarcely seven years old, the wife of the postmaster, who was a neighbor of the McCarts, took a liking to her. She made a little maid of her. And when she lost her husband in 1839 and went to live in Paris, she took Lisa with her. The parents had almost given her their daughter. The second child, Gervaise, footnote, the chief female character in La Samoire, the dram shop, born the following year, was a cripple from birth. Her right thigh was smaller than the left and showed signs of curvature a curious hereditary result of the brutality which her mother had to endure during her fierce drunken brawls with Macart. Gervaise remained puny, and Finet, observing her pallor and weakness, put her on a course of anise seed under the pretext that she required something to strengthen her. But the poor child became still more emaciated. She was a tall, lank girl whose frocks, invariably too large, hung round her as if they had nothing under them. Above a deformed and puny body, she had a sweet little doll-like head, a tiny round face, pale and exquisitely delicate. Her infirmity almost became graceful. Her body swayed gently at every step with a sort of rhythmical swing. The McCart son, Jean, footnote, figures prominently in La Terre, the Earth, and La Debacle, the Downfall was born three years later. He was a robust child, in no respect recalling Gervais. Like the eldest girl, he took after his mother without having any physical resemblance to her. He was the first to import into the rougeau macaw stock a fat face with regular features, which showed all the coldness of a grave yet not over-intelligent nature. This boy grew up with the determination of someday making an independent position for himself. He attended school diligently and tortured his dull brain to force a little arithmetic and spelling into it. After that, he became an apprentice, repeating much the same efforts with a perseverance that was the more meritorious as it took him a whole day to learn what others acquired in an hour. As long as these poor little things remained a burden to the house, Antoine grumbled. They were useless mouths that lessened his own share. He vowed, like his brother, that he would have no more children, those greedy creatures who bring their parents to penury. It was something to hear him bemoan his lot when they sat five at table, and the mother gave the best morsel to Jean, Lisa, and Gervaise. That's right, he would growl. Stuff them. Make them burst. Whenever Finet bought a garment or a pair of boots for them, he would sulk for days together. Ah, if he'd only known, he would never have had that pack of brats who compelled him to limit his smoking to four sous' worth of tobacco a day 
and too frequently obliged him to eat stewed potatoes for dinner, a dish which he heartily detested. Later on, however, as soon as Jean and Gervaise earned their first francs, he found some good in children after all. Lisa was no longer there. He lived upon the earnings of the two others without compunction, as he had already lived upon their mother. It was a well-planned speculation on his part. As soon as little Gervaise was eight years old, she went to a neighboring dealer's to crack almonds. She there earned ten sous a day, which her father pocketed right royally, without even a question from Finet as to what became of the money. The young girl was next apprenticed to a laundress, and as soon as she received two francs a day for her work, the two francs strayed in a similar manner into Macart's hands. Jean, who had learned the trade of a carpenter, was likewise despoiled on pay days whenever Macart succeeded in catching him before he'd handed the money to his mother. If the money escaped Macart, which sometimes happened, he became frightfully surly. He would glare at his wife and children for a whole week, picking a quarrel for nothing, although he was, as yet, ashamed to confess the real cause of his irritations. On the next payday, however, he would station himself on the watch, and as soon as he had succeeded in pilfering the youngster's earnings, he disappeared for days together. Gervaise, beaten and brought up in the streets among all the lads of the neighborhood, became a mother when she was fourteen years of age. The father of her child was not eighteen years old. He was a journeyman tanner named Lantier. At first, Macart was furious, but he calmed down somewhat when he learned that Lantier's mother, a worthy woman, was willing to take charge of the child. He kept Gervaise, however. She was then already earning twenty-five sous a day, and he therefore avoided all question of marriage. Four years later, she had a second child, which was likewise taken in by Lantier's mother. This time, Macart shut his eyes altogether and when Finet timidly suggested that it was time to come to some understanding with the tanner in order to end a state of things which made people chatter, he flatly declared that his daughter should not leave him and that he would give her to her lover later on, when he was worthy of her and had enough money to furnish a home. This was a fine time for Antoine Macquart. He dressed like a gentleman in frock coats and trousers of the finest cloth, Cleanly shaved and almost fat, he was no longer the emaciated, ragged vagabond who had been wont to frequent the taverns. He dropped into cafés, read the papers, and strolled on the Cour Sauveur. He played the gentleman as long as he had any money in his pocket. At times of impecuniosity, he remained at home, exasperated at being kept in his hovel and prevented from taking his customary cup of coffee. On such occasions he would reproach the whole human race with his poverty, making himself ill with rage and envy, until Finet, out of pity, would often give him the last silver coin in the house so that he might spend his evening at the café. This dear fellow was fiercely selfish. Gervaise, who brought home as much as sixty francs a month, wore only thin cotton frocks, while he had black satin waistcoats made for him by one of the best tailors in Plaisant. Jean, the big lad who earned three or four francs a day, was perhaps robbed even more impudently. The café where his father passed entire days was just opposite his master's workshop, and while he had plane or saw in hand, he could see Monsieur Macart on the other side of the way, sweetening his coffee or playing piquet with some petty annuitant. It was his money that the lazy old fellow was gambling away. He, Jean, never stepped inside a café. He never had so much as five sous to pay for a drink. Antoine treated him like a little girl, never leaving him a centime, and always demanding an exact account of the manner in which he'd employed his time. If the unfortunate lad, led away by some of his mates, wasted a day somewhere in the country on the banks of the Viorne or on the slopes of Garrigue. His father would storm and raise his hand and long bear him a grudge on account of the four francs less that he received at the end of the fortnight. 
he thus held his son in a state of dependence, sometimes even looking upon the sweethearts whom the young carpenter courted as his own. Several of Gervaise's friends used to come to the Macart's house, work girls from 16 to 18 years of age, bold and boisterous girls who on certain evenings filled the room with youth and gaiety. Poor Jean, deprived of all pleasure, ever kept at home by the lack of money, looked at these girls with longing eyes. But the childish life which he was compelled to lead had implanted invincible shyness in him in playing with his sister's friends. He was hardly bold enough to touch them with the tips of his fingers. Macart used to shrug his shoulders with pity. What a simpleton, he would mutter, with an air of ironical superiority. And it was he who would kiss the girls when his wife's back was turned. He carried his attentions even further with a little laundress whom Jean pursued rather more earnestly than the others. One fine evening he stole her almost from his arms. The old rogue prided himself on his gallantry. There are some men who live upon their mistresses. Antoine Macquart lived on his wife and children with as much shamelessness and impudence. He did not feel the least compunction in pillaging the home and going out to enjoy himself when the house was bare. He still assumed a supercilious air, returning from the café only to rail against the poverty and wretchedness that awaited him at home. He found the dinner detestable. He called Gervais a blockhead and declared that Jean would never be a man. Immersed in his own selfish indulgence, he rubbed his hands whenever he'd eaten the best piece in the dish, and then he smoked his pipe, puffing slowly, while the two poor children, overcome with fatigue, went to sleep with their heads resting on the table. Thus, Macart passed his days in lazy enjoyment. It seemed to him quite natural that he should be kept in idleness like a girl, to sprawl about on the benches of some tavern, or stroll in the cool of a day along the Cour or the Mai. At last he went so far as to relate his amorous escapades in the presence of his son, who listened with glistening eyes. The children never protested, accustomed as they were to see their mother humble herself before her husband. Finet, that strapping woman who drubbed him soundly when they were both intoxicated, always trembled before him when she was sober, and allowed him to rule despotically at home. He robbed her in the night of the coppers which she'd earned during the day at the market, but she never dared to protest, except by veiled rebukes. Sometimes, when he'd squandered the week's money in advance, he accused her, poor thing, who worked herself to death, of being stupid and not knowing how to manage. Finet, as gentle as a lamb, replied in her soft, clear voice, which contrasted so strangely with her big figure, that she was no longer twenty years old and that money was becoming hard to earn. In order to console herself, she'd buy a pint of aniseed and drink little glassfuls of it with her daughter of an evening, after Antoine had gone back to the café. That was their dissipation. Jean went to bed while the two women remained at the table listening attentively in order to remove the bottle and glasses at the first sound. When Macar was late, they often became intoxicated by the many nips they thus thoughtlessly imbibed. Stupefied and gazing at each other with vague smiles, this mother and daughter would end by stuttering. Red patches appeared in Gervais's cheeks. Her delicate, doll-like face assumed a look of maudlin beatitude. Nothing could be more heart-rending than to see this wretched, pale child, aglow with a drink and wearing the idiotic smile of a confirmed sot about her moist lips. Finet, huddled up on her chair, became heavy and drowsy. They sometimes forgot to keep watch, or even lacked the strength to remove the bottle and glasses when Antoine's footsteps were heard on the stairs. On these occasions, blows were freely exchanged among the Macarts. Jean had to get up to separate his father and mother and make his sister go to bed, as otherwise she would have slept on the floor. Every political party numbers its grotesques and its villains. Antoine Macquart, devoured by envy and hatred and meditating revenge against society in general, 
welcomed the Republic as a happy era when he would be allowed to fill his pockets from his neighbor's cash box and even strangle the neighbor if the latter manifested any displeasure. His cafe life and all the newspaper articles he'd read without understanding them had made him a terrible ranter who enunciated the strangest of political theories. It's necessary to have heard one of those malcontents who ill-digest what they read haranguing the company in some provincial taproom, in order to conceive the degree of hateful folly at which Makar had arrived. As he talked a good deal, had seen active service, and was naturally regarded as a man of energy and spirit, he was much sought after and listened to by simpletons. Although he was not the chief of any party, he had succeeded in collecting round him a small group of working men who took his jealous ravings for expressions of honest and conscientious indignation. Directly after the revolution of February 48, he persuaded himself that Plexon was his own, and as he strolled along the streets, the jeering manner in which he regarded the little retail traders who stood terrified at their shop doors clearly signified... Our day has come, my little lambs. We're going to lead you a fine dance. He'd grown insolent beyond belief. He acted the part of a victorious despot to such a degree that he ceased to pay for his drinks at the cafe, and the landlord, a simpleton who trembled whenever Antoine rolled his eyes, dared not present his bill. The number of cups of coffee he consumed during this period was incalculable, Sometimes he invited his friends and shouted for hours together that the people were dying of hunger and that the rich ought to share their wealth with them. He himself would never have given a sou to a beggar. That which chiefly converted him into a fierce Republican was the hope of at last being able to revenge himself on the Rougeons, who had openly ranged themselves on the side of the reactionary party. Ah! What a triumph if he could only hold Pierre and Félicité at his mercy. Although the latter had not succeeded over well in business, they had at last become gentlefolks, while he, Macar, had still remained a working man. That exasperated him. Perhaps he was still more mortified because one of their sons was a barrister, another a doctor, and the third a clerk, while his son Jean merely worked at a carpenter's shop and his daughter Gervaise at a washerwoman's. When he compared the Mercoste with the Rougeon, he was still more ashamed to see his wife selling chestnuts in the market and mending the greasy old straw-seated chairs of the neighborhood in the evening. Pierre, after all, was but his brother and had no more right than himself to live fatly on his income. Moreover, this brother was actually playing the gentleman with money stolen from him. Whenever Macaw touched upon this subject, he became fiercely enraged. He clamored for hours together, incessantly repeating his old accusations, and never wearying of exclaiming, If my brother was where he ought to be, I should be the moneyed man at the present time. And when anyone asked him where his brother ought to be, he would reply, at the galleys, in a formidable voice. His hatred further increased when the Rougeon had gathered the conservatives round them and thus acquired a certain influence in Plassans. The famous yellow drawing room became, in his harebrained chatter at the café, a cave of bandits, an assembly of villains who every evening swore on their daggers that they would murder the people. In order to incite the starvelings against Pierre, Macart went so far as to circulate a report that the retired oil dealer was not so poor as he pretended, but that he concealed his treasures through avarice and fear of robbery. His tactics thus tended to rouse the poor people by a repetition of absurdly ridiculous tales, which he often came to believe in himself. His personal animosity and his desire for revenge were ill-concealed beneath his professions of patriotism, but he was heard so frequently and he had such a loud voice that no one would have dared to doubt the genuineness of his convictions. At bottom, all the members of this family had the same brutish passions. Felicité, who clearly understood that Macart's wild theories were simply the fruit of restrained rage and embittered envy, would much have liked to purchase his silence. 
Unfortunately, she was short of money and did not dare to interest him in the dangerous game which her husband was playing. Antoine now injured them very much among the well-to-do people of the new town. It sufficed that he was a relation of theirs. Granou and Rudier often scornfully reproached them for having such a man in their family. Felicité consequently asked herself with anguish how they could manage to cleanse themselves of such a stain. It seemed to her monstrous and indecent that Monsieur Rougeon should have a brother whose wife sold chestnuts and who himself lived in crapulous idleness. She at last even trembled for the success of their secret intrigues, so long as Antoine seemingly took pleasure in compromising them. When the diatribes which he leveled at the yellow drawing room were reported to her, she shuddered at the thought that he was capable of becoming desperate and ruining all their hopes by force of scandal. Antoine knew what consternation his demeanor must cause the Rougeon, and it was solely for the purpose of exhausting their patience that he from day to day affected fiercer opinions. At the café he frequented he used to speak of my brother Pierre in a voice which made everybody turn around and if he happened to meet some reactionary from the yellow drawing room in the street, he'd mutter some low abuse which the worthy citizen, amazed at such audacity, would repeat to the Rougeon in the evening, as though to make them responsible for his disagreeable encounter. One day, Granou arrived in a state of fury. Really, he exclaimed, when scarcely across the threshold. It's intolerable. One can't move a step without being insulted. Then, addressing Pierre, he added, When one has a brother like yours, sir, one should rid society of him. I was just quietly walking past the sub-prefecture when that rascal passed me muttering something in which I could clearly distinguish the words, Old Rogue. Felicité turned pale and felt it necessary to apologize to Granou, but he refused to accept any excuses and threatened to leave altogether. The Marquis, however, exerted himself to arrange matters. "'It's very strange,' he said, "'that the wretched fellow should have called you an old rogue. "'Are you sure that he intended the insult for you?' Granou was perplexed. He admitted at last, however, that Antoine might have muttered, so you are again going to that old rogue's? At this, Monsieur de Carnavant stroked his chin to conceal the smile which rose to his lips in spite of himself. Then Rougeon, with superb composure, replied, I thought as much. The old rogue was no doubt intended for me. I am very glad that this misunderstanding is now cleared up. Gentlemen, pray avoid the man in question, whom I formally repudiate. Felicité, however, did not take matters so coolly. Every fresh scandal caused by Macart made her more and more uneasy. She would sometimes pass the whole night wondering what those gentlemen must think of the matter. A few months before the coup d'etat, the Rougeon received an anonymous letter, three pages of foul insults, in which they were warned that if their party should ever triumph, the scandalous story of Adelaide's amours would be published in some newspaper, together with an account of the robbery perpetrated by Pierre when he compelled his mother, driven out of her senses by debauchery, to sign a receipt for 50,000 francs. This letter was a heavy blow for Rougeon himself. Felicité could not refrain from reproaching her husband with his disreputable family, for the husband and wife never for a moment doubted that this letter was Antoine's work. "'We shall have to get rid of the blackguard at any price,' said Pierre in a gloomy tone. "'He's becoming too troublesome by far.' In the meantime, Macart, resorting to his former tactics, looked round among his own relatives for accomplices who would join him against the Rougeon. He'd counted upon Aristide at first, on reading his terrible articles in the Independent. But the young man, in spite of all his jealous rage, was not so foolish as to make common cause with such a fellow as his uncle. He never even minced matters with him, but invariably kept him at a distance, 
a circumstance which induced Antoine to regard him suspiciously. In the taverns, where Macart reigned supreme, people went so far as to say the journalist was paid to provoke disturbances. Baffled on this side, Macart had no alternative but to sound his sister Ursule's children. Ursule had died in 1839, thus fulfilling her brother's evil prophecy. The nervous affliction which he had inherited from her mother had turned into slow consumption, which gradually killed her. She left three children, a daughter, 18 years of age, named Hélène, who married a clerk, and two boys, the elder François, a young man of 23, and the younger, a sickly little fellow, scarcely six years old, named Silver. The death of his wife, whom he adored, proved a thunderbolt to Moray. He dragged on his existence for another year, neglecting his business and losing all the money he'd saved. Then, one morning, he was found hanging in a cupboard, where Ursule's dresses were still suspended. His elder son, who had received a good commercial training, took a situation in the house of his uncle Rougeon, where he replaced Aristide, who had just left. Rougeon, in spite of his profound hatred for the Macar, gladly welcomed this nephew, whom he knew to be industrious and sober. He was in want of a youth whom he could trust and who would help him to retrieve his affairs. Moreover, during the time of Moray's prosperity, he'd learned to esteem the young couple, who knew how to make money, and thus he had soon become reconciled with his sister. Perhaps he thought he was making Francois some compensation by taking him into his business. Having robbed the mother, he'd shield himself from remorse by giving employment to the son. Even rogues make honest calculations, sometimes. It was, however, a good thing for him. If the house of Rougeon did not make a fortune at this time, it was certainly through no fault of that quiet, punctilious youth, Francois, who seemed born to pass his life behind the grocer's counter, between a jar of oil and a bundle of dried codfish. Although he physically resembled his mother, he inherited from his father a just, if narrow, mind, with an instinctive liking for a methodical life and the safe speculations of a small business. Three months after his arrival, Pierre, pursuing his system of compensation, married him to his young daughter, Marthe. Footnote. Both Francois and Marthe figure largely in The Conquest of Plassans whom he did not know how to dispose of. The two young people fell in love with each other quite suddenly in a few days. A peculiar circumstance had doubtless determined and enhanced their mutual affection. There was a remarkably close resemblance between them, suggesting that of brother and sister. Francois inherited, through Ursule, the face of his grandmother Adelaide. Martyr's case was still more curious, she was an equally exact portrait of Adelaide, although Pierre Rougeon had none of his mother's features distinctly marked. The physical resemblance had, as it were, passed over Pierre to reappear in his daughter. The similarity between husband and wife went, however, no further than their faces. If the worthy son of a steady, matter-of-fact hatter was distinguishable in Francois, Marthe showed the nervousness and mental weakness of her grandmother. Perhaps it was this combination of physical resemblance and moral dissimilarity which threw the young people into each other's arms. From 1840 to 1844, they had three children. Francois remained in his uncle's employ until the latter retired. Pierre had desired to sell him the business, but the young man knew what small chance there was of making a fortune in trade at Plassans, so he declined the offer and repaired to Marseille where he established himself with his little savings. Marcos soon had to abandon all hope of dragging this big, industrious fellow into his campaign against the Rougeon, whereupon, with all the spite of a lazy bones, he regarded him as a cunning miser. He fancied, however, that he had discovered the accomplice he was seeking in Moray's second son, a lad of fifteen years of age. Young Silver had never even been to school at the time when Moray was found hanging among his wife's skirts. His elder brother, not knowing what to do with him, took him also to his uncle's. 
The latter made a wry face on beholding the child. He had no intention of carrying his compensation so far as to feed a useless mouth. Thus Silver, to whom Felicité also took a dislike, was growing up in tears like an unfortunate little outcast when his grandmother Adelaide, during one of the rare visits she paid to Rougeon, took pity on him and expressed the wish to have him with her. Pierre was delighted he let the child go without even suggesting an increase of the paltry allowance that he made Adelaide and which henceforward would have to suffice for two. Adelaide was then nearly seventy-five years of age. Grown old while leading a cloistered existence, she was no longer the lanky, ardent girl who formerly ran to embrace the smuggler Macar. She had stiffened and hardened in her hovel in the Impasse Saint-Mitre, that dismal, silent hole, where she lived entirely alone on potatoes and dry vegetables, and which she did not leave once in the course of a month. On seeing her pass, you might have thought her to be one of those delicately white old nuns with automatic gait, whom the cloister is kept apart from all the concerns of this world. Her pale face, always scrupulously girt with a white cap, looked like that of a dying woman. A vague, calm countenance it was, wearing an air of supreme indifference. Prolonged taciturnity had made her dumb. The darkness of her dwelling and the continual sight of the same objects had dulled her glance and given her eyes the limpidity of spring water. Absolute renunciation, slow physical and moral death, had little by little converted this crazy amorosa into a grave matron. When, as often happened, a blank stare came into her eyes, and she gazed before her without seeing anything, one could detect utter internal void through those deep, bright cavities. Nothing now remained of her former voluptuous ardor but weariness of the flesh and a senile tremor of the hands. She had once loved like a she-wolf, but was now wasted, already sufficiently worn out for the grave. There had been strange workings of her nerves during her long years of chastity. A dissolute life would perhaps have wrecked her less than the slow, hidden ravages of unsatisfied fever which had modified her organism. Sometimes, even now, this moribund, pale old woman, who seemed to have no blood left in her, was seized with nervous fits like electric shocks, which galvanized her, and for an hour brought her atrocious intensity of life. She'd lie on her bed rigid with her eyes open. Then hiccups would come upon her, and she'd writhe and struggle, acquiring the frightful strength of those hysterical madwomen whom one has to tie down in order to prevent them from breaking their heads against the wall. This return to former vigor, these sudden attacks, gave her a terrible shock. When she came to again, she would stagger about with such a scared, stupefied look that the gossips of the Faubourg used to say, She's been drinking, the crazy old thing. Little Silver's childish smile was for her the last pale ray which brought some warmth to her frozen limbs. Weary of solitude and frightened at the thought of dying alone in one of her fits, she had asked to have the child. With the little fellow running about near her, she felt secure against death. Without relinquishing her habits of taciturnity or seeking to render her automatic movements more supple, she conceived inexpressible affection for him. Stiff and speechless, she'd watch him playing for hours together, listening with delight to the intolerable noise with which he filled the old hovel. That tomb had resounded with uproar ever since Silver had been running about it, bestriding broomsticks, knocking up against the doors and shouting and crying. He brought Adelaide back to the world, as it were. She looked after him with the most adorable awkwardness. She, who in her youth had neglected the duties of a mother, now felt the divine pleasures of maternity in washing his face, dressing him, and watching over his sickly life. It was a reawakening of love, a last soothing passion which heaven had granted to this woman, who had been so ravaged by the want of someone to love, the touching agony of a heart that had lived amidst the most acute desires, 
and which was now dying full of love for a child. She was already too far gone to pour forth the babble of good plump grandmothers. She adored the child in secret with the bashfulness of a young girl without knowing how to fondle him. Sometimes she took him on her knees and gazed at him for a long time with her pale eyes. When the little one, frightened by her mute white visage, began to cry, she seemed perplexed by what she had done and quickly put him down upon the floor without even kissing him. Perhaps she recognized in him a faint resemblance to Macaw, the poacher. Sylvia grew up, ever tete-a-tete -tete with Adelaide. With childish cajolery, he used to call her Aunt Dide, a name which ultimately clung to the old woman. The word aunt employed in this way is simply a term of endearment in Provence. The child entertained singular affection, not unmixed with respectful terror for his grandmother. During her nervous fits, when he was quite a little boy, he ran away from her crying, terrified by her disfigured countenance, and he came back very timidly after the attack, ready to run away again as though the old woman were disposed to beat him. Later on, however, when he was twelve years old, he would stop there bravely and watch in order that she might not hurt herself by falling off the bed. He stood for hours holding her tightly in his arms to subdue the rude shocks which distorted her. During intervals of calmness, he would gaze with pity on her convulsed features and withered frame, over which her skirts lay like a shroud. These hidden dramas which recurred every month, this old woman as rigid as a corpse, this child bent over her, silently watching for the return of consciousness, made up amidst the darkness of the hovel a strange picture of mournful horror and broken-hearted tenderness. When Aunt Dide came round, she'd get up with difficulty and set about her work in the hovel without even questioning Silver. She remembered nothing, and the child, from a sort of instinctive prudence, avoided the least allusion to what had taken place. These recurring fits, more than anything else, strengthened Silver's deep attachment for his grandmother. In the same manner as she adored him without any garrulous effusiveness, he felt a secret, almost bashful affection for her. While he was really very grateful to her for having taken him in and brought him up, he could not help regarding her as an extraordinary creature, a prey to some strange malady whom he ought to pity and respect. No doubt there was not sufficient life left in Adelaide. She was too white and too stiff for Silver to throw himself on her neck. Thus they lived together amidst melancholy silence, in the depths of which they felt the tremor of boundless love. This ends Chapter 4, Part 1. Section 9 of The Fortune of the Rougeon, Book 1 of Rougeon Maca Cycle, by Emile Zola, translated by Henry Visitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Mark Leder. Chapter 4, Part 2. The sad, solemn atmosphere which he breathed from childhood gave Silver a strong heart in which gathered every form of enthusiasm. He early became a serious, thoughtful little man, seeking instruction with a kind of stubbornness. He only learnt a little spelling and arithmetic at the school of the Christian brothers, which he was compelled to leave when he was but twelve years old on account of his apprenticeship. He never acquired the first rudiments of knowledge. However, he read all the odd volumes which fell into his hands, and thus provided himself with strange equipment. He had some notions of a multitude of subjects, ill-digested notions, which he could never classify distinctly in his head. When he was quite young, he'd been in the habit of playing in the workshop of a master wheelwright, a worthy man named Vian, who lived at the entrance of the blind alley in front of the Ars Saint-Mitre, where he stored his timber. Silver used to jump up in the wheels of the tilted carts undergoing repair and amuse himself by dragging about the heavy tools which his tiny hands could scarcely lift. 
One of his greatest pleasures, too, was to assist the workmen by holding some piece of wood for them or bringing them the ironwork which they required. When he had grown older, he naturally became apprentice to Vian. The latter had taken a liking to the little fellow, who was always kicking about his heels, and asked Adelaide to let him come, refusing to take anything for his board and lodging. Silver eagerly accepted, already foreseeing the time when he would be able to make his poor Aunt Dide some return for all she had spent upon him. In a short time he became an excellent workman. He cherished, however, much higher ambitions. Having once seen at a coach builder's at Plassans a fine new carriage shining with varnish, he vowed that he would one day build carriages himself. He remembered this carriage as a rare and unique work of art, an ideal towards which his aspiration should tend. The tilted carts at which he worked in Vian's shop, those carts which he had lovingly cherished, now seemed unworthy of his affections. He began to attend the local drawing school, where he formed a connection with a youngster who had left college and who lent him an old treatise on geometry. He plunged into the study without a guide, racking his brains for weeks together in order to grasp the simplest problem in the world. In this matter, he gradually became one of those learned workmen who can hardly sign their name and yet talk about algebra as though it were an intimate friend. Nothing unsettles the mind so much as this desultory kind of education, which reposes on no firm basis. Most frequently, such scraps of knowledge convey an absolutely false idea of the highest truths and render persons of limited intellect insufferably stupid. In Silver's case, however, his scraps of stolen knowledge only augmented his liberal aspirations. He was conscious of horizons which at present remained closed to him. He formed for himself divine conceptions of things beyond his reach and lived on, regarding in a deep, innocent, religious way the noble thoughts and grand conceptions towards which he was raising himself, but which he could not as yet comprehend. He was one of the simple-minded, one whose simplicity was divine, and who had remained on the threshold of a temple, kneeling before the tapers which from a distance he took for stars. The hovel in the Impasse Saint-Mitre consisted, in the first place, of a large room into which the street door opened. The only pieces of furniture in this room, which had a stone floor and served both as a kitchen and a dining room, were some straw-seated chairs, a table on trestles, and an old coffer which Adelaide had converted into a sofa by spreading a piece of woolen stuff over the lid. In the left-hand corner of a large fireplace stood a plaster image of the Holy Virgin, surrounded by artificial flowers. She's the traditional good mother of all old Provençal women, however irreligious they may be. A passage led from the room into a yard situated at the rear of the house. In this yard there was a well. Aunt Dide's bedroom was on the left side of the passage. It was a little apartment containing an iron bedstead and one chair. Sylvia slept in a still smaller room on the right-hand side, just large enough for a trestle bedstead, and he had been obliged to plan a set of shelves, reaching up to the ceiling, to keep by him all those dear odd volumes which he saved his sou to purchase from a neighboring general dealer. When he read at nighttime, he would hang his lamp on a nail at the head of the bed. If his grandmother had an attack, he merely had to leap out at the first gasp to be at her side in a moment. The young man led the life of a child. He passed his existence in this lonely spot. Like his father, he felt a dislike for taverns and Sunday strolling. His mates wounded his delicate susceptibilities by their coarse jokes. He preferred to read, to rack his brain over some simple geometrical problem. Since Aunt Dide had entrusted him with a little household commission, she did not go out at all, but ceased all intercourse, even with her family. The young man sometimes thought of her forlornness. He reflected that the poor old woman lived but a few steps from the children who strove to forget her as though she were dead, and this made him love her all the more, for himself and for the others. 
when he at times entertained a vague idea that Auntie Day might be expiating some former transgressions, he would say to himself, I was born to pardon her. A nature such as Silver's, ardent yet self-restrained, naturally cherished the most exalted Republican ideas. At night, in his little hovel, Silver would again and again read a work of Rousseau's, which he had picked up at the neighboring dealers among a number of old books. The reading of this book kept him awake till daylight. Amidst his dream of universal happiness so dear to the poor, the words liberty, equality, fraternity rang in his ears like those sonorous sacred calls of the bells, at the sound of which the faithful fall upon their knees. When, therefore, he learnt that the Republic had just been proclaimed in France, he fancied that the whole world would enjoy a life of celestial beatitude. His knowledge, though imperfect, made him see farther than other workmen. His aspirations did not stop at daily bread, but his extreme ingenuousness, his complete ignorance of mankind, kept him in the dreamland of theory, a garden of Eden where universal justice reigned. His paradise was for a long time a delightful spot in which he forgot himself. When he came to perceive that things did not go on quite satisfactorily in the best of republics, he was sorely grieved and indulged in another dream, that of compelling men to be happy even by force. Every act which seemed to him prejudicial to the interest of the people roused him to revengeful indignation. Though he was as gentle as a child, he cherished the fiercest political animosity. He would not have killed a fly, and yet he was forever talking of a call to arms. Liberty was his passion, an unreasoning, absolute passion, to which he gave all the feverish ardor of his blood. Blinded by enthusiasm, he was both too ignorant and too learned to be tolerant, and would not allow for men's weaknesses. He required an ideal government of perfect justice and perfect liberty. It was at this period that Antoine Macart thought of setting him against the Rougeon. He fancied that this young enthusiast would work terrible havoc if he were only exasperated to the proper pitch. This calculation was not altogether devoid of shrewdness. Such being Antoine's scheme, he tried to induce Silver to visit him by professing inordinate admiration for the young man's ideas. But he very nearly compromised the whole matter at the outset. He had a way of regarding the triumph of the Republic as a question of personal interest, as an era of happy idleness and endless junketing, which chilled his nephew's purely moral aspirations. However, he perceived that he was on the wrong track and plunged into strange bathos, a string of empty but high-sounding words, which Silver accepted as a satisfactory proof of his civism. Before long, the uncle and the nephew saw each other two or three times a week. During their long discussions in which the fate of the country was flatly settled, Antoine endeavored to persuade the young man that the Rougeon's drawing room was the chief obstacle to the welfare of France. But he again made a false move by calling his mother old jade in Silver's presence. He even repeated to him the early scandals about the poor woman. The young man blushed for shame, but listened without interruption. He had not asked his uncle for this information. He felt heartbroken by such confidences, which wounded his feeling of respectful affection for Aunt Didet. From that time forward, he lavished yet more affection upon his grandmother, greeting her always with pleasant smiles and looks of forgiveness. However, Macar felt that he had acted foolishly and strove to take advantage of Silver's affection for Adelaide by charging the Rougeon with her forlornness and poverty. According to him, he'd always been the best of sons, whereas his brother had behaved disgracefully. Pierre had robbed his mother, and now, when she was penniless, he was ashamed of her. He never ceased descanting on this subject. Silver thereupon became indignant with his uncle Pierre, much to the satisfaction of his uncle Antoine. The scene was much the same every time the young man called. He used to come in the evening while the Macars were at dinner. 
The father would be swallowing some potato stew with a growl, picking out the pieces of bacon and watching the dish when it passed into the hands of Jean and Gervais. You see, Silver, he would say with a sullen rage, which was ill-conceived beneath his air of cynical indifference, more potatoes, always potatoes. We never eat anything else now. Meat is only for rich people. It's getting quite impossible to make both ends meet with children who have the devil's appetite and their own, too. Gervais and Jean bent over their plates, no longer even daring to cut some bread. Silver, who in his dream lived in heaven, did not grasp the situation. In a calm voice, he pronounced these storm-laden words. But you should work, uncle. Ah, yes, sneered Makar, stung to the quick. You want me to work, eh? To let those beggars, the rich folk, continue to prey upon me. I should earn probably twenty sous a day and ruin my constitution. It's worthwhile, isn't it? Everyone earns what he can, the young man replied. Twenty sous are twenty sous, and it all helps in a home. Besides, you're an old soldier. Why don't you seek some employment? Finet would then interpose, with a thoughtlessness of which she soon repented. That's what I'm always telling him, said she. The market inspector wants an assistant. I mentioned my husband to him, and he seems well disposed towards us. But Macart interrupted her with a fulminating glance. Eh, hold your tongue, he growled with suppressed anger. Women never know what they're talking about. Nobody would have me. My opinions are too well known. Every time he was offered employment, he displayed similar irritation. He did not cease, however, to ask for situations, though he always refused such as were found for him, assigning the most extraordinary reasons. When pressed upon the point, he became terrible. If Jean were to take up a newspaper after dinner, he would at once exclaim, You'd better go to bed. You'll be getting up late tomorrow, and that'll be another day lost. To think of that young rascal coming home with eight francs short last week. However, I've requested his master not to give him his money in future. I'll call for it myself. Jean would go to bed to avoid his father's recriminations. He had but little sympathy with Silver. Politics bored him, and he thought his cousin cracked. When only the women remained, if they unfortunately started some whispered converse after clearing the table, McCart would cry, Now, you idlers, is there nothing that requires mending? We're all in rags. Look here, Chavez, I was at your mistress's today, and I learned some fine things. You're a good-for-nothing, a gadabout. Gervaise, now a grown girl of more than twenty, colored up at thus being scolded in the presence of Silver, who himself felt uncomfortable. One evening, having come rather late when his uncle was not at home, he'd found the mother and daughter intoxicated before an empty bottle. From that time, he could never see his cousin without recalling the disgraceful spectacle she had presented, with the maudlin grin and large red patches on her poor, pale, puny face. He was not less shocked by the nasty stories that circulated with regard to her. He sometimes looked at her stealthily, with the timid surprise of a schoolboy in the presence of a disreputable character. When the two women had taken up their needles and were ruining their eyesight in order to mend his old shirts, Macart, taking the best seat, would throw himself back with an air of delicious comfort and sip and smoke like a man who relishes his laziness. This was the time when the old rogue generally railed against the wealthy for living on the sweat of the poor man's brow. He was superbly indignant with the gentlemen of a new town, who lived so idly and compelled the poor to keep them in luxury. The fragments of communistic notions which he culled from the newspapers in the morning became grotesque and monstrous on falling from his lips. He would talk of a time near at hand when no one would be obliged to work. He always, however, kept his fiercest animosity for the Rougeon. He never could digest the potatoes he'd eaten. I saw that vile creature, Felicité, buying a chicken in the market this morning. He would say, those robbers of inheritance must eat chicken, forsooth. Auntie Day, interposed Silver, 
says that Uncle Pierre was very kind to you when you left the army. Didn't he spend a large sum of money in lodging and clothing you? A large sum of money, roared McCart in exasperation. Your grandmother is mad. It was those thieves who spread those reports themselves, so as to close my mouth. I never had anything. Finet again foolishly interfered, reminding him that he'd received two hundred francs beside a suit of clothes and a year's rent. Antoine thereupon shouted to her to hold her tongue and continued with increasing fury. Two hundred francs! A fine thing! I want my due! Ten thousand francs! Ah, yes, talk of the hole they shoved me into like a dog, and the old frock coat which Pierre gave me because he was ashamed to wear it any longer himself. It was so dirty and ragged. He was not speaking the truth, but seeing the rage that he was in, nobody ventured to protest any further. Then, turning towards Silver, it's very stupid of you to defend them, he added. They robbed your mother, who, good woman, would be alive now if she had had the means of taking care of herself. Oh, you're not just uncle, the young man said. My mother did not die for want of attention, and I'm certain my father would never have accepted a sou from his wife's family. Pooh, don't talk to me. Your father would have taken the money just like anybody else. We were disgracefully plundered, and it's high time we had our rights. Then Macart, for the hundredth time, began to recount the story of the 50,000 francs. His nephew, who knew it by heart, and all the variations with which he embellished it, listened to him rather impatiently. If you were a man, Antoine would say in conclusion, you would come some day with me, and we would kick up a nice row at the Rougeon. We would not leave without having some money given us. Silver, however, grew serious and frankly replied, If those wretches robbed us, so much the worse for them. I don't want their money. You see, uncle, it's not for us to fall on our relatives. If they've done wrong, well, one of these days they'll be severely punished for it. Ah, what a big simpleton you are, the uncle cried. When we have the upper hand, you'll see whether I shan't settle my own little affairs myself. God cares a lot about us indeed. What a foul family ours is. Even if I were starving to death, not one of those scoundrels would throw me a dry crust. Whenever Macart touched upon this subject, he proved inexhaustible. He bared all his bleeding wounds of envy and covetousness. He grew mad with rage when he came to think that he was the only unlucky one in the family and was forced to eat potatoes while the others had meat to their heart's content. He would pass all his relations in review, even his grandnephews, and find some grievance and reason for threatening every one of them. Yes, yes, he repeated bitterly, they'd leave me to die like a dog. Gervaise, without raising her head or ceasing to ply her needle, would sometimes say timidly, Still, father, Cousin Pascal was very kind to us last year when you were ill. He attended you without charging the sou, continued Finet, coming to her daughter's aid, and he often slipped a five-franc piece into my hand to make you some broth. He, he'd have killed me if I hadn't had a strong constitution, McCart retorted. Hold your tongues, you fools. You'd let yourselves be twisted about like children. They'd all like to see me dead. When I'm ill again, I beg you not to go and fetch my nephew, for I didn't feel at all comfortable in his hands. He's only a two-penny, half-penny doctor, and hasn't got a decent patient in all his practice. When once McCart was fully launched, he could not stop. It's like that little viper Aristide, he would say, a false brother, a traitor. Are you taken in by his articles in the Independent, Silver? You'd be a fine fool if you were. They're not even written in good French. I've always maintained that this contraband Republican is in league with his worthy father to humbug us. You'll see how he'll turn his coat. And his brother, the illustrious Eugène, that big blockhead of whom the Rougeon makes such a fuss. Why, they've got the impudence to assert that he occupies a good position in Paris. I know something about his position. He's employed at the Rue de Jerusalem. He's a police spy. 
Who told you so? You know nothing about it, interrupted Silver, whose upright spirit at last felt hurt by his uncle's lying accusations. Ah, I know nothing about it. Do you think so? I'll tell you he's a police spy. You'll be shorn like a lamb one of these days with your benevolence. You're not manly enough. I don't want to say anything against your brother Francois, but if I were in your place, I shouldn't like the scurvy manner in which he treats you. He earns a heap of money at Marseille, and yet he never sends you a paltry twenty-franc piece for pocket money. If ever you become poor, I shouldn't advise you to look to him for anything. I've no need of anybody, the young man replied in a proud and slightly injured tone of voice. My own work suffices for Aunt Dide and myself. You are cruel, uncle. I only say what's true, that's all. I should like to open your eyes. Our family is a disreputable lot. It's sad, but true. Even that little Maxime, Aristide's son, that little nine-year-old brat, pokes his tongue out at me when he meets me. That child will some day beat his own mother, and a good job, too. Say what you like, all those folks don't deserve their luck. But it's always like this in families. The good ones suffer while the bad ones make their fortunes. All this dirty linen, which McCart washed with such complacency before his nephew, profoundly disgusted the young man. He would have liked to soar back into his dream. As soon as he began to show unmistakable signs of impatience, Antoine would employ strong expedients to exasperate him against their relatives. Defend them, defend them, he would say, appearing to calm down. I, for my part, have arranged to have nothing more to do with them. I only mention the matter out of pity for my poor mother, whom all that gang treat in a most revolting manner. They are wretches, Sylvia murmured. Oh, you don't know. You don't understand. These Rougeons pour all sorts of insults and abuse on the good woman. Aristide has forbidden his son even to recognize her. Felicite talks of having her placed in a lunatic asylum. The young man, as white as a sheet, abruptly interrupted his uncle. Enough, he cried. I don't want to know any more about it. There will have to be an end to all this. I'll hold my tongue since it annoys you the old rascal replied, feigning a good-natured manner. Still, there are some things that you ought not to be ignorant of unless you want to play the part of a fool. Macart, while exerting himself to set Sylvia against the Rougeon, experienced the keenest pleasure on drawing tears of anguish from the young man's eyes. He detested him, perhaps, more than he did the others, and this because he was an excellent workman and never drank. He brought all his instincts of refined cruelty into play in order to invent atrocious falsehoods which should sting the poor lad to the heart. Then he reveled in his pallor, his trembling hands, and his heart-rending looks, with the delight of some evil spirit who measures his stabs and finds that he has struck his victim in the right place. When he thought that he had wounded and exasperated Silver sufficiently, he would at last touch upon politics. I've been assured, he would say, lowering his voice, that the Rougeon are preparing some treachery. Treachery? Silver asked, becoming attentive. Yes, one of these nights they're going to seize all the good citizens of the town and throw them into prison. The young man was at first disposed to doubt it, but his uncle gave precise details. He spoke of lists that had been drawn up. He mentioned the persons whose names were on these lists. He indicated in what manner, at what hour, and under what circumstances the plot would be carried into effect. Silver gradually allowed himself to be taken in by this old woman's tale, and was soon raving against the enemies of the Republic. "'It's they we shall have to reduce to impotence if they persist in betraying the country,' he cried. "'And what do they intend to do with the citizens whom they arrest?' What do they intend to do with them? Why, they will shoot them in the lowest dungeons of the prison, of course, replied Macart with a hoarse laugh. And as the young man, stupefied with horror, looked at him without knowing what to say, This will not be the first lot to be assassinated there, he continued. You need only go and prowl about the Palais de Justice of an evening to hear the shots and groans. Oh, the wretches, Silvera murmured. 
Thereupon, uncle and nephew launched out into high politics. Finet and Gervais, on finding them hotly debating things, quietly went to bed without attracting their attention. Then the two men remained together till midnight, commenting on the news from Paris and discussing the approaching and inevitable struggle. Macar bitterly denounced the men of his own party. Sauveur dreamed his dream of ideal liberty aloud, and for himself only. Strange conversations these were, during which the uncle poured out many a little nip for himself, and from which the nephew emerged quite intoxicated with enthusiasm. Antoine, however, never succeeded in obtaining from the young Republican any perfidious suggestion or play of warfare against the Rougeon. In vain he tried to goad him on. He seldom heard him suggest aught but an appeal to eternal justice, which sooner or later would punish the evildoers. The ingenuous youth did indeed speak warmly of taking up arms and massacring the enemies of the Republic. But as soon as his enemies strayed out of his dreams or became personified in his uncle Pierre or any other person of his acquaintance, he relied upon heaven to spare him the horror of shedding blood. It is very probable that he would have ceased visiting Makar, whose jealous fury made him so uncomfortable, if he had not tasted the pleasure of being able to speak freely of his dear republic there. In the end, however, his uncle exercised decisive influence over his destiny. He irritated his nerves by his everlasting diatribes and succeeded in making him eager for an armed struggle, the conquest of universal happiness by violence. When Sylvia reached his sixteenth year, Ricard had him admitted into the secret society of the Montagnard, a powerful association whose influence extended throughout southern France. From that moment, the young Republican gazed with longing eyes at the smuggler's carbine, which Adelaide had hung over her chimney piece. One night, while his grandmother was asleep, he cleaned and put it in proper condition. Then he replaced it on its nail and waited, indulging in brilliant reveries, fancying gigantic epics, Homeric struggles and knightly tournaments, whence the defenders of liberty would emerge victorious and acclaimed by the whole world. Machart, meanwhile, was not discouraged. He said to himself that he would be able to strangle the Rougeon alone if he could ever get them into a corner. His envious rage and slothful greed were increased by certain successive accidents which compelled him to resume work. In the early part of 1850, Finet died, almost suddenly, from inflammation of the lungs, which he'd caught by going one evening to wash the family linen in the Viorn and carrying it home, wet on her back. She returned soaked with water and perspiration, bowed down by her load, which was terribly heavy, and she never recovered. Her death filled Macart with consternation. His most reliable source of income was gone. When, a few days later, he sold the cauldron in which his wife had boiled her chestnuts and the wooden horse which she used in reseating old chairs, he foully accused the divinity of having robbed him of that strong, strapping woman of whom he had often felt ashamed, but whose real worth he now appreciated. He now also fell upon the children's earnings with greater avidity than ever. But a month later, Gervaise, tired of his continual exactions, ran away with her two children and Lantier, whose mother was dead. The lovers took refuge in Paris. Antoine, overwhelmed, vented his rage against his daughter by expressing the hope that she might die in hospital like most of her kind. This abuse did not, however, improve the situation, which was decidedly becoming bad. Jean soon followed his sister's example. He waited for payday to come round and then contrived to receive the money himself. As he was leaving, he told one of his friends, who repeated it to Antoine that he would no longer keep his lazy father, and that if the latter should take it into his head to have him brought back by the gendarme, he would touch neither saw nor plane. On the morrow, when Antoine, having vainly sought him, found himself alone and penniless in the house where for twenty years he had been comfortably kept, he flew into the most frantic rage, kicked the furniture about, and yelled the vilest imprecations. Then he sat down, exhausted, 
and began to drag himself about and moan like a convalescent. The fear of having to earn his bread made him positively ill. When Silver came to see him, he complained with tears of his children's ingratitude. Had he not always been a good father to them? Jean and Gervais were monsters who'd made him an evil return for all he'd done for them. Now they abandoned him because he was old and they could not get anything more out of him. But, uncle, said Silver, you are not yet too old to work. Ricard, coughing and stooping, shook his head mournfully, as if to say that he could not bear the least fatigue for any length of time. Just as his nephew was about to withdraw, he borrowed ten francs of him. Then for a month he lived by taking his children's old clothes one by one to a second-hand dealer's, and in the same way, little by little, he sold all the small articles in the house. Soon nothing remained but a table, a chair, his bed, and the clothes on his back. He ended by exchanging the walnut wood bedstead for a plain strap one. When he had exhausted all his resources, he cried with rage, and with the fierce pallor of a man who was resigned to suicide, he went to look for the bundle of osier that he'd forgotten in some corner for a quarter of a century past. As he took it up, he seemed to be lifting a mountain. However, he again began to plate baskets and hampers while denouncing the human race for their neglect. It was particularly at this time that he talked of dividing and sharing the riches of the wealthy. He showed himself terrible. His speeches kept up a constant conflagration in the tavern, where his furious looks secured him unlimited credit. Moreover, he only worked when he'd been unable to get a five-franc piece out of Silver or a comrade. He was no longer Monsieur Macaw, the clean-shaven workman who wore his Sunday clothes every day and played the gentleman. He again became the big slovenly devil who had once speculated on his rags. Felicité did not dare to go to market now that he was so often coming there to sell his baskets. He once had a violent quarrel with her there. His hatred against the Rougeon grew with his wretchedness. He swore with horrible threats that he would wreak justice himself since the rich were leagued together to compel him to toil. In this state of mind, he welcomed the coup d'etat with the ardent, obstreperous delight of a hound scenting the quarry. As the few honest liberals in the town had failed to arrive at an understanding amongst themselves, and therefore kept apart, he became naturally one of the most prominent agents of the insurrection. The working classes, notwithstanding the unfavorable opinion which they at last entertained of this lazy fellow, would, when the time arrived, have to accept him as a rallying flag. On the first few days, however, the town remained quiet, and McCart thought that his plans were frustrated. It was not until the news arrived of the rising of the rural districts that he recovered hope. For his own part, he would not have left Plassan for all the world. Accordingly, he invented some pretext for not following those workmen who, on the Sunday morning, set off to join the insurrectionary band of La Palue and saint martin de vaux on the evening of the same day, he was sitting in some disreputable tavern of the old quarter with a few friends, when a comrade came to inform him that the insurgents were only a few miles from Plassans. This news had just been brought by an express, who had succeeded in making his way into the town and had been charged to get the gates opened for the column. There was an outburst of triumph. Macart especially appeared to be delirious with enthusiasm, the unforeseen arrival of the insurgent seemed to him a delicate attention of providence for his own particular benefit. His hands trembled at the idea that he would soon hold the Rougeon by the throat. He hastily quitted the tavern with his friends. All the Republicans who had not yet left the town were soon assembled on the Cour Sauvaire. It was this band that Rougeon had perceived as he was hastening to conceal himself in his mother's house. When the band had reached the top of the Rue de la Bain, Macart, who had stationed himself at the rear, detained four of his companions, big fellows who were not overburdened with brains and whom he swayed by his tavern bluster. He easily persuaded them that the enemies of the Republic must be arrested immediately if they wished to prevent the greatest calamities. 
the truth was that he feared Pierre might escape him in the midst of the confusion which the entry of the insurgents would produce. However, the four big fellows followed him with exemplary docility and knocked violently at the door of the Rougeon's abode. In this critical situation, Felicité displayed admirable courage. She went down and opened the street door herself. "'We want to go upstairs into your rooms,' Makar said to her brutally. "'Very well, gentlemen. Walk up,' she replied with ironical politeness, pretending that she did not recognize her brother-in-law. Once upstairs, Makar ordered her to fetch her husband. "'My husband is not here,' she said with perfect calmness. "'He's traveling on business. "'He took the diligence for Marseille at six o'clock this evening.' Antoine, at this declaration, which Felicité uttered in a clear voice, made a gesture of rage. He rushed through the drawing room and then into the bedroom, turned the bed up, looked behind the curtains and under the furniture. The four big fellows assisted him. They searched the place for a quarter of an hour. Felicité, meantime, quietly seated herself on the drawing room sofa and began to fasten the strings of her petticoats, like a person who'd been surprised in her sleep and had not had time to dress properly. "'It's true, then. He's run away, the coward!' McCart muttered on returning to the drawing-room. Nevertheless, he continued to look about him with a suspicious air. He felt a presentiment that Pierre could not have given up the game at the decisive moment. At last he approached Felicité, who was yawning. "'Show us the place where your husband is hidden,' he said to her, "'and I promise no harm shall be done to him.' "'I've told you the truth,' she replied impatiently. "'I can't deliver my husband to you, as he's not here. "'You've searched everywhere, haven't you? "'Then leave me alone now.' "'McCart, exasperated by her composure, "'was just going to strike her "'when the rumbling noise arose from the street. "'It was the column of insurgents entering the Rue de la Bonne. He then had to leave the yellow drawing room after shaking his fist at his sister-in-law, calling her an old jade and threatening that he would soon return. At the foot of a staircase, he took one of the men who accompanied him, a navvy named Cassut, the most wooden-headed of the four, and ordered him to sit on the first step and remain there. "'You must come and inform me,' he said to him, "'if you see the scoundrel from upstairs return.' The man sat down heavily. When Macart reached the pavement, he raised his eyes and observed Felicité leaning out of the window of the yellow drawing room, watching the march past of the insurgents as if it was nothing but a regiment passing through the town to the strains of its band. This last sign of perfect composure irritated him to such a degree that he was almost tempted to go up again and throw the old woman into the street. However, he followed the column, muttering in a hoarse voice, Yes, yes, look at us passing. We'll see whether you'll station yourself at your balcony tomorrow. It was nearly eleven o'clock at night when the insurgents entered the town by the Porte de Rome. The workmen remaining in Plassant had opened the gates for them, in spite of the wailings of the keeper, from whom they could only wrest the keys by force. This man, very jealous of his office, stood dumbfounded in the presence of a surging crowd. To think of it, he who never allowed more than one person to pass in at a time, and then only after a prolonged examination of his face. And then he murmured that he was dishonored. The men of Plassans were still marching at the head of the column by way of guiding the others. Miette, who was in the front rank with Silver on her left, held up her banner more proudly than ever, now that she could divine behind the closed blinds the scared looks of well-to-do bourgeois startled out of their sleep. The insurgents passed along the Rue de Rome and the Rue de la Ban slowly and warily. At every crossway, although they well knew the quiet disposition of the inhabitants, they feared they might be received with bullets. The town seemed lifeless, however. There was scarcely a stifled exclamation to be heard at the windows. Only five or six shutters opened. Some old householder then appeared in his nightshirt, candle in hand, and leant out to obtain a better view but as soon as he distinguished a tall red girl who appeared to be drawing that crowd of black demons behind her, he hastily closed his window again, terrified by such a diabolical apparition. The silence of the slumbering town reassured the insurgents, 
who ventured to make their way through the lanes of the old quarter, and thus reached the marketplace in the Place de l'Hôtel de Ville, which was connected by a short but broad street. These open spaces, planted with slender trees, were brilliantly illumined by the moon. Against the clear sky, the recently restored town hall appeared like a large patch of crude whiteness, the fine black lines of the wrought iron arabesques of the first floor balcony showing in bold relief. Several persons could be plainly distinguished standing on this balcony. The mayor, Commander Sicardo, three or four municipal councillors, and other functionaries. The doors below were closed. The 3,000 Republicans, who covered both open spaces, halted with upraised heads, ready to force the doors with a single push. The arrival of the insurrectionary column at such an hour took the authorities by surprise. Before repairing to the mayor's, Commander Sicardo had taken time to don his uniform. He then had to run and rouse the mayor. When the keeper of the Porte de Rome, who had been left free by the insurgents, came to announce that the villains were already in the town, the commander had so far only managed to assemble a score of the National Guards. The gendarmes, though their barracks were close by, could not even be warned. It was necessary to shut the town hall doors in all haste in order to deliberate. Five minutes later, a low, continuous rumbling announced the approach of the column. Monsieur Gassonnet, out of hatred to the Republic, would have greatly liked to offer resistance, but he was of a prudent nature and comprehended the futility of a struggle on finding only a few pale men who were scarcely awake around him. So the deliberations did not last long. Sicardo alone was obstinate. He wanted to fight, asserting that twenty men would suffice to bring these three thousand villains to reason. At this, Monsieur Gassonnet shrugged his shoulders and declared that the only step to take was to make an honorable capitulation. As the uproar of the mob increased, he went out on the balcony, followed by all the persons present. Silence was gradually obtained. Below, among the black, quivering mass of insurgents, the guns and scythes glittered in the moonlight. "'Who are you, and what do you want?' cried the mayor in a loud voice. Thereupon, a man in a greatcoat, a landowner of La Palou, stepped forward. "'Open the doors,' he said, without replying to Monsieur Gassonnet's question. "'Avoid a fratricidal conflict.' "'I call upon you to withdraw,' the mayor continued. I protest in the name of the law. These words provoked deafening shouts from the crowd. When the tumult had somewhat abated, vehement calls ascended to the balcony. Voices shouted, It is in the name of the law that we've come here. Your duty as a functionary is to secure respect for the fundamental law of the land, the Constitution, which has just been outrageously violated. Long live the Constitution! Long live the Republic! Then, as Monsieur Garcinet endeavored to make himself heard and continued to invoke his official dignity, the landowner of La Palou, who was standing under the balcony, interrupted him with great vehemence. You are now nothing but the functionary of a fallen functionary. We've come to dismiss you from your office. Hitherto, Commander Sicardo had been ragefully biting his mustache and muttering insulting words. The sight of the cudgels and scythes exasperated him, and he made desperate efforts to restrain himself from treating these twopenny, halfpenny soldiers, who had not even a gun apiece, as they deserved. But when he heard a gentleman, in a mere greatcoat, speak of deposing a mayor girded with his scarf, he could no longer contain himself and shouted, You pack of rascals! If I only had four men and a corporal, I'd come down and pull your ears for you and make you behave yourselves. Less than this was needed to raise a serious disturbance. A long shout rose from the mob as it made a rush for the doors. Monsieur Gassonnet, in consternation, hastily quitted the balcony, entreating Sicardot to be reasonable unless he wished to have them massacred. But in two minutes the doors gave way, the people invaded the building and disarmed the National Guards. The mayor and the other functionaries present were arrested. Sicardot, who had declined to surrender his sword, had to be protected from the fury of some insurgents by the chief of the contingent from Les Toulettes, a man of great self-possession. 
When the town hall was in the hands of the Republicans, they led their prisoners to a small cafe in the marketplace and there kept them closely watched. The insurrectionary army would have avoided marching through Plessant if its leaders had not decided that a little food and a few hours rest were absolutely necessary for the men. Instead of pushing forward direct to the chief town of a department, the column, owing to the inexcusable weakness and the inexperience of the improvised general who commanded it, was now diverging to the left, making a detour which was destined, ultimately, to lead to destruction. It was bound for the heights of Saint-Rour, still about ten leagues distant, and it was in view of this long march that it had been decided to pass through Plassans, notwithstanding the lateness of the hour. It was now half-past eleven. When M. Gassanet learnt that the band was in quest of provisions, he offered his services to procure them. This functionary formed, under very difficult circumstances, a proper estimate of the situation. Those 3,000 starving men would have to be satisfied. It would never do for Plasson on waking up to find them still squatting on the pavements. If they withdrew before daybreak, they would simply have passed through the slumbering town like an evil dream, like one of those nightmares which depart with the arrival of dawn. And so, although he remained a prisoner, M. Garçonneau, followed by two guards, went about knocking at the baker's doors and had all the provisions that he could find distributed among the insurgents. Towards one o'clock, the 3,000 men began to eat, squatting on the ground with their weapons between their legs. The marketplace and the neighborhood of the town hall were turned into vast open-air refectories. In spite of the bitter cold, humorous sallies were exchanged among the swarming multitude, the smallest groups of which showed forth in the brilliant moonlight. The poor, famished fellows eagerly devoured their portions while breathing on their fingers to warm them and from the depths of adjoining streets, where vague black forms sat on the white thresholds of the houses, there came sudden bursts of laughter. At the windows emboldened, inquisitive women, with silk handkerchiefs tied round their heads, watched the repast of those terrible insurgents, those bloodsuckers who went in turn to the market pump to drink a little water in the hollows of their hands. While the town hall was being invaded, the gendarmes' barracks, situated a few steps away in the Rue Canquin, which leads to the market, had also fallen into the hands of the mob. The gendarmes were surprised in their beds and disarmed in a few minutes. The impetus of the crowd had carried Miette and Silvère along in this direction. The girl, who still clasped her flagstaff to her breast, was pushed against the wall of the barracks, while the young man, carried away by the human wave, penetrated into the interior and helped his comrades to wrest from the gendarme the carbines which they had hastily caught up. Silver, waxing ferocious, intoxicated by the onslaught, attacked a big devil of a gendarme named Rangard, with whom for a few moments he struggled. At last, by a sudden jerk, he succeeded in wresting his carbine from him. But the barrel struck Rangard a violent blow in the face, which put his right eye out. Blood flowed, and some of its splashing Silver's hands quickly brought him to his senses. He looked at his hands, dropped the carbine, and ran out in a state of frenzy, shaking his fingers. "'You are wounded!' cried Miette. "'No, no,' he replied in a stifled voice. "'I just killed a gendarme.' "'Is he really dead?' asked Miette. "'I don't know,' replied Silver. "'His face was all covered with blood. "'Come, quickly!' Then he hurried the girl away. On reaching the market, he made her sit down on a stone bench and told her to wait there for him. He was still looking at his hands, muttering something at the same time. Miette at last understood from his disquieted words that he wished to go and kiss his grandmother before leaving. Well, go, she said. Don't trouble yourself about me. Wash your hands. But he went quickly away keeping his fingers apart without thinking of washing them at the pump which he passed. Since he had felt Rangad's warm blood on his skin, he had been possessed by one idea, that of running to Antides and dipping his hands in the well trough at the back of a little yard. There only, he thought, would he be able to wash off the stain of that blood. Moreover, all his calm, gentle childhood seemed to return to him, 
He felt an irresistible longing to take refuge in his grandmother's skirts, if only for a minute. He arrived quite out of breath. Auntie Day had not gone to bed, a circumstance which at any other time would have greatly surprised Silvère. But on entering, he did not even see his uncle Rougeon, who was seated in a corner on the old chest. He did not wait for the poor old woman's questions. Grandmother, he said quickly, you must forgive me. I'm going to leave with the others. You see, I've got blood on me. I believe I've killed a gendarme. You've killed a gendarme? Aunt Didet repeated in a strange voice. Her eyes gleamed brightly as she fixed them on the red stains, and suddenly she turned towards the chimney piece. You've taken the gun, she said. Where's the gun? Silvère, who'd left the weapon with Miette, swore to her that it was quite safe. And for the very first time, Adelaide made an allusion to the smuggler Macar in her grandson's presence. You'll bring the gun back? You promise me, she said with singular energy. It's all I have left of him. You've killed the gendarme. Ah, it was the gendarme who killed him. She continued gazing fixedly at Silvère with an air of cruel satisfaction and apparently without thought of detaining him. She never asked him for any explanation nor wept like those good grandmothers who always imagine, at sight of the least scratch, that their grandchildren are dying. All her nature was concentrated in one unique thought, to which she at last gave expression with ardent curiosity. Did you kill the gendarme with the gun? Either Sylvia did not quite catch what she said, or else he misunderstood her. Yes, he replied. I'm going to wash my hands. It was only on returning from the well that he perceived his uncle. Pierre had turned pale on hearing the young man's words. Felicité was indeed right. His family took a pleasure in compromising him. One of his nephews had now killed a gendarme. He would never get the post of receiver of taxes if he did not prevent this foolish madman from rejoining the insurgents. So he planted himself in front of a door, determined to prevent Silver from going out. Listen, he said to the young fellow, who was greatly surprised to find him there. I am the head of the family, and I forbid you to leave this house. You're risking both your honor and ours. Tomorrow I'll try to get you across the frontier. But Silver shrugged his shoulders. Let me pass, he calmly replied. I'm not a police spy. I shall not reveal your hiding place. Never fear. And as Rougeon continued to speak of the family dignity and the authority with which his seniority invested him. Do I belong to your family, the young man continued? You have always disowned me. Today fear has driven you here because you feel that the day of judgment has arrived. Come, make way. I don't hide myself. I have a duty to perform. Rougeon did not stir. But Aunt Day, who had listened with a sort of delight to Silvère's vehement language, laid her withered hand on her son's arm. Get out of the way, Pierre, she said. The lad must go. The young man gave his uncle a slight shove and dashed outside. Then Rougeon, having carefully shut the door again, said to his mother in an angry, threatening tone, If any mischief happens to him, it'll be your fault. You're an old madwoman. You don't know what you've just done. Adelaide, however, did not appear to hear him. She went and threw some vine branches on the fire which was going out and murmured with a vague smile, I'm used to it. He would remain away for months together and then come back to me in much better health. She was no doubt speaking of Macar. In the meantime... Silvère hastily regained the marketplace. As he approached the spot where he'd left Miette, he heard a loud uproar of voices and saw a crowd which made him quicken his steps. A cruel scene had just occurred. Some inquisitive people were walking among the insurgents, of the latter quietly partook of their meal. Among these onlookers was Justin Rebuffat, the son of the farmer of the Jasmefren, a youth of twenty years old, a sickly, squint-eyed creature who harbored implacable hatred against his cousin Miette. At home he grudged her the bread she ate 
and treated her like a beggar picked up from the gutter out of charity. It is probable that the young girl had rejected his advances. Lank and pale, with ill-proportioned limbs and face all awry, he revenged himself upon her for his own ugliness and the contempt which the handsome, vigorous girl must have evinced for him. He ardently longed to induce his father to send her about her business, and for this reason he was always spying upon her. For some time past he had become aware of the meetings with Silver and had only awaited a decisive opportunity to reveal everything to his father, Rebufa. On the evening in question, having seen her leave home at about eight o'clock, Justin's hatred had overpowered him, and he had been unable to keep silent any longer. Rebufa, on hearing his story, fell into a terrible rage and declared that he'd kick the gadabout out of his house should she have the audacity to return. Justin then went to bed, relishing beforehand the fine scene which would take place on the morrow. Then, however, a burning desire came upon him for some immediate foretaste of his revenge. So he dressed himself again and went out. Perhaps he might meet Miette. In that case, he was resolved to treat her insolently. This is how he came to witness the arrival of the insurgents, whom he followed to the town hall with a vague presentiment that he would find the lovers there. And indeed, he at last caught sight of his cousin on the seat where she was waiting for Silver. Seeing her wrapped in her long pelisse with the red flag at her side, resting against the market pillar, he began to sneer and deride her in foul language. The girl, thunderstruck at seeing him, was unable to speak. She wept beneath his abuse, and whilst she was overcome by sobbing, bowing her head and hiding her face, Justin called her a convict's daughter and shouted that old Rebuffant would give her a good thrashing should she ever dare to return to Jasmefran. For a quarter of an hour he thus kept her smarting and trembling. Some people had gathered round and grinned stupidly at the painful scene. At last a few insurgents interfered and threatened the young man with exemplary chastisement if he did not leave Miette alone. But Justin, although he retreated, declared that he was not afraid of them. It was just at this moment that Silver came up. Young Rebuffat, on catching sight of him, made a sudden bound as if to take flight, for he was afraid of him, knowing that he was much stronger than himself. He could not, however, resist the temptation to cast a parting insult on the girl in her lover's presence. Ah, I knew very well, he cried, that the wheelwright could not be far off. You left us to run after that crack-brained fellow, eh? You wretched girl, when's the baptism to be? Then he retreated a few steps further on seeing Silver clench his fists. And mind, he continued with a vile sneer, don't come to our house again. My father will kick you out if you do. Do you hear? But he ran away howling with bruised visage, for Silver had bounded upon him and dealt him a blow full in the face. The young man did not pursue him. When he returned to Miette, he found her standing up, feverishly wiping her tears away with the palm of her hand. And as he gazed at her tenderly in order to console her, she made a sudden energetic gesture. No, she said, I'm not going to cry any more, you'll see. I'm very glad of it. I don't feel any regret now for having left home. I am free. She took up the flag and led Silver back into the midst of the insurgents. It was now nearly two o'clock in the morning. The cold was becoming so intense that the Republicans had risen to their feet and were marching to and fro in order to warm themselves while they finished their bread. At last their leaders gave orders for departure. The column formed again. The prisoners were placed in the middle of it. Besides Monsieur Gassonet and Commander Sicardot, the insurgents had arrested Monsieur Pierrot, the receiver of taxes, and several other functionaries, all of whom they led away. At this moment, Aristide was observed walking about among the groups. In presence of this formidable rising, the dear fellow had thought it imprudent not to remain on friendly terms with the Republicans. But as, on the other hand, he did not desire to compromise himself too much, he'd come to bid them farewell with his arm in a sling, complaining bitterly of the accursed injury which prevented him from carrying a weapon. As he walked through the crowd, he came across his brother Pascal, provided 
with a case of surgical instruments and a little portable medicine chest. The doctor informed him in his quiet way that he intended to follow the insurgents. At this, Aristide inwardly pronounced him a great fool. At last he himself slunk away, fearing lest the others should entrust the care of a town to him, a post which he deemed exceptionally perilous. The insurgents could not think of keeping Plesson in their power. The town was animated by so reactionary a spirit that it seemed impossible even to establish a democratic municipal commission there, as had already been done in other places. So they would simply have gone off without taking any further steps if Macar, prompted and emboldened by his own private animosities, had not offered to hold Plasson in awe, on condition that they left him twenty determined men. These men were given him, and at their head he marched off triumphantly to take possession of a town hall. Meantime, the column of insurgents was wending its way along the Cour Sauveur and making its exit by the Grand Porte, leaving the streets, which it had traversed like a tempest, silent and deserted in its rear. The high road, whitened by the moonshine, stretched far into the distance. Miette had refused the support of Silver's arm. She marched on bravely, steady and upright, holding the red flag aloft with both hands, without complaining of the cold which was turning her fingers blue. This ends Chapter 4, Part 2.